one of the things that I'll talk a little bit about, uh, especially our last session, uh, will be uh, the traditional ritual means of coping with uh, uh, destructiveness and protecting oneself against destructiveness. That is, pre-modern means. Traditional societies understood far more about this than modern culture. Modern culture has, has managed to make itself so blind to evil that it, of all human history, modern culture is the most vulnerable to evil because it stripped itself of the tools with which to talk about it. And so uh, we are left with our pitiful little efforts uh, to talk about uh, the human destructiveness through psychopathology. We, we have these nice little case books and psychiatric nosologies. We can throw out a little term here and there. But, uh, but being able to talk with any power about evil is not a modern phenomenon. Witness, for example, how, how difficult uh, we have found it uh, to deal with the Holocaust. And witness the attempts that constantly arise to split off our consciousness about the Holocaust, kind of deflect it, have us not look at it. Witness our attempts, on the one hand, to force Germans to carry our collective shadow, on the one hand, and to absolve them of responsibility on the other. Uh, it's a very interesting kind of a double movement that you see, uh, ways to avoid the uh, human reality of the Holocaust. And by trivializing it, uh, also trivialize uh, the other Holocausts that are occurring all around us. Uh, a very interesting thing that is happening now in, in our world is an increasing incapacity of human beings to feel outrage at anything. It's a very interesting phenomenon. Just the sheer emotional capacity to feel outrage is lessening rapidly. And we want to reflect upon that type of thing. But in, a, in, in, other, in uh, any case, uh, I want to speak about this predominantly in this context, uh, 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 in, in the context of a psychology of the archetypal dimensions of human existence. And I want us to focus from a Jungian point of view, uh, particularly on an explication of the archetypal shadow. And I would like to make a clear distinction. Uh, we will do this the third week when I really get into the elaborating the Jungian concepts on this. Make a very clear distinction between personal shadow and archetypal shadow. Because they are not the same thing. It is critically important that it be seen that they are not the same thing. And, uh, and we have to get clearer, much, much clearer, about the, uh, the complexity of the Jungian concept of the archetypal self. A little understanding of Jung will lead you to believe that the archetypal self is a good thing. In reality, it is a very ambivalent thing. And uh, it, it contains, you know, we hear Jungians very often talk about how the archetypal self is the archetype of order. Well, what I would like to clarify for you is that that's totally incorrect. <laughs> it is indeed, in one of its expressions, the archetype of order. It is also the archetype of chaos. And uh, and it is very important for us to see that, uh, and we'll be looking at ION, the volume in which Jung diagrams the self, in which Christ and Satan are seen as clear expressions of the archetypal self. They have radically different uh, expressions in the psyche. They are both archetypal expressions of the self. They are both trying to incarnate and, and influence the ego. And the, the, uh, the, there, there are some similarities about what happens when an individual is inflated through contact with the Christ dimension 
of the archetypal self uh, uh, to the kind of phenomena you get when an individual is inflated by the satanic aspects of the archetypal self. But uh, they are just those similarities do not mean in any way that these things are are the same. And it's very important that we have this kind of uh, understanding about the complexity of the, the ambivalence of the archetypal self. Because if you do not have that, then you will get the idea that everything that comes to you in dreams and active imaginations is friendly. And uh, that is not the case. Uh, there are uh, aspects of the archetypal realm which are hell-bent for your destruction. And, uh, and it is very important to uh, get some sense of that in the way it operates psychodynamically. Now, it's very interesting that it was not Jung at all that emphasized this dimension first. It was actually Sigmund Freud and his concept of Thanatos, the death instinct. Uh, and in these four sessions, I'll start out tonight. I'm going to stay at the archetypal level as expressed in, uh, in uh, uh, myth and religion. Next week, I will talk about the inner enemy and Freudian psychoanalysis. I will focus specifically and particularly upon the, the way in which Freud's conflict theories really are reflections of this uh, uh, kind of point of view. And I'll focus on uh, the uh, death instinct, and then in terms of later object relations theory, I'll talk a little bit about the conceptions of the anti-libidinal ego in object relations theory. Translated out in ordinary language, that just means the anti-life ego. And uh, so uh, we will be looking at something that Freuds have been uh, very frank about uh, until they have tried to clean everything up uh, with some recent developments and not acknowledge as many of these destructive. Well, you know, contemporary Freudians are almost as nice as Jungians. <laughs> you know. But in the classical Freudian tradition, they were more honest about human destructiveness. And I want us to look at those classical traditions. <clears throat> In the third week, I will focus more on, on Jungian uh, conceptions, and I will elucidate this uh, personal shadow and archetypal shadow, and we'll go into this uh, self-psychology. And then the final session on April 26th, we will think together on, on uh, resources uh, for coping with this uh, inner enemy uh, that uh, human beings have used throughout the centuries. And which, in a postmodern world, we need to reappropriate, in my view. Uh, this is an era which is very exciting for a reappropriation of ritual process. Uh, one of the marks of a dawning postmodern world will be a re uh, 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 discovery of the power and necessity of ritual for human life to be relatively sane. Uh, one of the marks of modernity and modern culture was the uh, assumption that humans can do without ritual process. They, they don't need it. It's superstition. You know, it was one of our Protestant fantasies that we, we had. We've got to get rid of this ritual stuff. It's all superstition. And so <clears throat> we get rid of ritual process, and then we are condemned to obsessive-compulsive ritualizations. And you, you ritualize whether you like it or not. The question is, will you ritualize consciously, uh, knowing what you're doing, or will you be forced to ritualize by your unconscious when your unconscious is trying to get you to be aware that you need more than simply uh, goodwill? We will talk about some of the uh, uses of symbols, uh, that has been made, the use of talismans that have been made throughout history. I'll talk a little bit about Jung's understanding of this type of thing. And I will talk a little bit about the, uh, the relationship between spirituality and spiritual disciplines and the necessity uh, for spirituality. You know, it's been widely known that, that Jung believed that... Uh, contrary to Freud's view, that uh, that if you did not have a 
uh, spiritual practice of some kind that you would likely be condemned to uh, psychopathology for the rest of your life. And uh, I think we will see very clearly why uh, Jungians tend to be very aware of the importance of spiritual practice uh, in the individuation process. And it's not just some nice little add-on that somehow there is something going on in the psyche and in human experience that requires some sense of a trans-egoic force for good, the capacity to access some transpersonal, trans-egoic force for good in order to survive, not to thrive. So that's the plan in those four sessions. That's what I intend to do. <clears throat> And let's see, how many do we have? Do you know how many people are here? Well, I will pass these out, and uh, we can get we can get some more if there's if there's not enough. Just take one of these and pass it. This is a book that uh, uh, we may have to get some more copies of this. Uh, we'll see how many we lack. If you if you don't get one, try to look on with someone. This is just the uh, title page and the. Uh, table of contents of a book that if you're really interested in this topic that I think would be worth your plotting your way through over a period of time longer than we've got in this course. But I wanted you to get a little sense, just by looking at this, at the way in which understandings of uh, radical evil have been a part of human cultures throughout human history cross-culturally. In other words, it's just because the Roman Catholics still on Easter Sunday have people reaffirm that they do that they uh, reject <laughs> Satan and all his works that the concept or understanding of Satan in human uh, religious traditions is not just a Christian fantasy human beings throughout history have had an experience of what is known in this book the old enemy by Neil Forsyth, Satan and the Combat Myth, uh, of, of the sense of an archetypal combat that somehow underlying phenomenal reality, there is some kind of spiritual warfare that is going on that we Jungians would call an archetypal warfare. See? that there is an archetypal conflict at some level underlying the phenomenal world. Now, if you'll just look through this, how many of you do not did not get this? Okay, there's we'll try to get some more copies made at the break. But if you just look through this, this is basically ancient Near East here. Uh, you will see the the various traditions, the pre the pre -Judi Judaism traditions uh, the uh, the images of evil in the uh, in the Old Testament, uh, the Gnostic traditions, uh, the uh, role of apocalyptic thought. If you've never studied apocalyptic thought, this is the stuff that's behind apocalyptic thinking. As we approach 2000, you're going to have this burgeoning of apocalyptic thinking again, just like existed right prior to the turning of the first millennium. We're already getting a lot of, and there'll be a lot more of this. But uh, if you just look at this, uh, you you see the enormity of the materials that exist on this topic, and this is just ancient Near East. Uh, you know, there's uh, Wendy uh, O'Flaherty's book on uh, concepts of evil in uh, in Hindu mythology. Uh, and uh, you can look at uh, Paul Ricoeur's book on uh, on symbolisms of evil, uh, and the the sheer magnitude of the of the literature on the human experience of evil is just astounding. I mean, you wouldn't know it by living in the modern world. You wouldn't uh, have a sense of how preoccupied human beings have been with this, but they've been enormously preoccupied with it. Another reference, which. Uh, I didn't get on the recommended books for them to get for you, but which is an important book for you to look at, is a book with the title The Anthropology of Evil, which is a, uh, I'll have to get that editor's, it's an edited book, I'll have to get the editor's name for you before next week, but but it is a, it is a conference that was held 
uh, the proceedings of a conference that was held, a cross-cultural conference on, on evil, symbolism of evil and the human experience of evil, was held some years ago. And uh, it is a more elaboration of the way in which this sense of the almost the divine adversary has been a ubiquitous experience uh, in uh, human experience, in uh, human culture. And uh, I would like to lift up a few of those uh, for you. I mean, I want you to, during during your time in this course, it would be good if you could do some uh, reading of Jeffrey Burton Russell's books. I, they do have those out here, uh, Satan, the Devil, Lucifer, and Mephistopheles. And I understand he has a new synopsis volume just called The Prince of Darkness, which... Uh, which is uh, sort of a, a summary of uh, his work. Jeffrey Burton Russell is an outstanding uh, historian who has written a history of this imagery, which we've listed in the uh, in the text. And I, I think it would be useful for you to read some of his work. You can also look at that little book that was done out of the conference in Texas called Facing Evil. And there's a television, public television uh, program that was based on that conference. And you might get this book that uh, Hillman and some others did called Facing Apocalypse, which is uh, related to the same archetypal material. In, uh, in my travels throughout uh, Asia, I was fascinated to run in, for example, in Indonesia, to the prominence of the, the Hindu epic, the Ramayana, in Indonesia. Uh, and in the uh, Ramayana, it is really the story of the conflict between Rama, an incarnation of God, the divine hero king, and Rahwana, who is the great king of the demons. And uh, this, this story is so alive, I can't tell you how alive this thing is in Indonesia. There, uh, when you go out at night, and you go to the city squares, they will be dancing this Ramayana. And they will be playing the uh, their uh, traditional music, and they'll be, dance they'll be dancing this epic, and it's so alive for them, and the people are so involved in this story. I mean, it's like this story is so alive for them, this story, this divine combat between Rahwana, who steals the love of the great true king, and Rama, who's trying to rescue his love from the evil one. And this thing everywhere, every temple wall, you know, every public gathering, uh, this is alive in a way that we Westerners, there's no way that we could get any sense for how this, could, this myth is so living for these people. But even today, in, in uh, modern industrializing Indonesia, this thing lives, and it is present in their minds on a daily basis. Our own tradition uh, is one in which we see this most, this most clearly in what we call dualism. Uh, and it really comes from Persian religion, the influence of Persian religion on, uh, on our culture. Now, we don't know much about Zoroastrianism. We've heard of Thus Spake Zarathustra. But we don't know much about Zoroastrianism. It's not a popular religion to study. When you say Hinduism and Buddhism and so forth, but you don't really study Zoroastrianism here much. Uh, but it, but Zoroastrianism is an enormously powerful influence on the history of uh, certain forms of rabbinic Judaism, particularly the uh, Pharisees uh, of New Testament times, and on early Christianity and on Manichaeism. Have you heard of Manichaeism? You know, the idea that the world of matter is evil and that the world of spirit is good. You've got this con constant conflict between body and soul, etc., etc. But Zoroastrianism is very important for us to look at just to get a sense for the combat myth. And I'm going to elaborate the way this works archetypally in a minute, but I just want to stay with a few of these specific myths. In the combat myth in, Z myth in Zoroastrianism, you have the good god, Ahura Mazda, and you have the evil god, Ahiraman. And they are forever fighting for the world. Now, this is a myth. This is a mythic structure that antedates Christianity. 
Uh, you can look at the books by R. H. Zaner, Z. A. E. H. N. E. R. For a, for a discussion of Zoroastrianism. Uh, his book on Zervon. In the Zoroastrian tradition, they've got this question, and it's a question that comes up in Jungian thought. Now, at at root, are Ahura Mazda and Ahiraman the same being? Are are they the same down at somehow in the mis mysterious root? Or are they really eternally different? Is this just an apparent conflict united in mystery? Or are they really two different and eternally antagonistic principles? And this has been a this was a struggle fought out throughout and still to this day you've got some people in Zoroastrian circles in India that hold the one, others that hold the other. Uh, this is the eternal theodicy question. You know, is evil something which is authored by God? Uh, or, in other words, does the Jungian say, does God have a shadow side? Is there a shadow side of God? You know, the book, The Answer to Job, that Jung did. Uh, this is the historical background for that kind of question. And it's an archetypal issue. See, I mean, uh, and it has been, it has been fought out continually. In other words, time, then, in this kind of tradition, Time begins to be a plane of conflict. All of time is conflict between these two beings. And humans are struggling between the influences of these two beings. In Christianity, this comes down and you get this, this conflict between Christ on the one hand and Satan on the other. Remember we said there is Rama, the Lord Rama, and there's Rahwana. And as you do your cross-cultural studies, you will be able to just add the list. Now that's historically interesting. And it's said that human beings have had this uh, kind of uh, representation uh, throughout so many centuries. But I want you to make a note of this and hold on to this, and then I want to outline what I believe to be the fundamental archetypal structure of the self with regard to uh, where this this archetype of combat fits in. And uh, and then we will we will talk more about uh, the way in which humans historically have projected this archetypal enemy. See, this is not this is not a human enemy. Be clear about this. It's very important you understand. This is not a human enemy. This is a divine enemy. And the real enemy of this being is another divine being. Now, you might want to think. See, where if you think about the human ego. The human ego is not here. The human ego is is, is here or here. See. Uh, now, let me let me just outline for you. You know, Jungians love to put simple things in hard language. So, uh, I'm going to tell you briefly about the four couples of the conjunctio, which means simply there are four kinds of expressions of archetypal space and time in the human archetypal self. And they go like this. There's the king and the queen. There is the warrior couple. Remember, in the archetype of the self, in the Mysterium Conjunctionis, the Hieros Gamas, the divine marriage, uh, the Jungian thought is, represent, is represented in a couple, a divine couple. Not a male or female, but both. Okay. Then there is the magician couple. And then there's the lover couple. In other words, within the archetypal self, you have all of these potentials united. However, in human personalities and in human culture, you do not see them so united. You see them split a lot. You see them split up a lot. But let me show you about the different kinds of spaces. Each of these, there's a space that opens up between them. 
So in other words, there are four kinds of space. <clears throat> now, you, you know about kings and queens. It's very interesting. In patriarchy, we know a lot more about kings than we know about queens. But, it, but in the archetypal self, queen is just as fully developed as the king. It's just in patriarchy, the queen is not as developed in terms of cultural forms. The warrior couple, you see this very clearly. Uh, uh, you know, I mean, we see a lot of uh, images of the male warrior, but uh, you see it in popular culture. Uh, have you seen the movie Red Sonia with Arnold and Brigitte? Arnold Schwarzenegger and Brigitte Nielsen in a B-grade movie, which is uh, probably lousy cinema, but it's wonderful archetypal psychology. <laughs> because in that movie, you get to see the warrior couple taking on the forces of evil. See? And uh, they're quite a handsome couple. Then you have the magician couple. This is what the occultists call the priest and the priestess. See? Of course, in patriarchy, we just have priests. Right? But in occult traditions, and in many cultures, you have clear priest-priestess, and you have cooperation between priest and priestess. And uh, it is a reflection, and I'll tell you in a minute about what these, what these things do. And then the lover couples, we know more about that. This is the Garden of Eden before the fall, Adam and Eve before the fall. What are the four spaces that open up between these? Well, this is cosmos. This is world. It is the, the purpose of the king and queen is to open up a space which is world, is cosmos rather than what? Chaos. than chaos. It is cosmos rather than chaos. So think of the family. The archetypal configuration which is to create a family is king and queen. And between them opens up realm. A space that is not chaos, not dysfunctional. Dysfunctional family is a contradiction in terms. See? See? Family is realm. Okay, cosmos. Now, where is chaos? I'm going to diagram kingdom for you in a minute. But where is chaos in this? Archetypally. It's not in here, right? It's around it. So it's always on the outside. Up here, down here, out here. Cosmos is like a sphere. And right in the center of the sphere of cosmos. And archetypally, what would you find? Think of medieval imagery or think of ancient Chinese imagery. What is right at the center of the sphere of cosmos, of world, of just order, of right order? What is at the center? Chaos. Not at the center. Hmm. Chaos is all around. But what is at the center in an, imp in an empire? The throne. The thrones, the throne is at the center. And I'll do this in a mandala in a minute. Mandalas, at the center of mandalas, is always a throne, archetypally. At the center of the city, if you look at ancient cities, the cities are our cosmos, and at the center is the most sacred spot. And the medieval symbolism, what is right at the center? And the medieval images, images, hmm? well, it's the cross. Because the cross is the throne. See? Get it? The cross is the throne. And the idea of crucifixion is deeply related to the essence of the archetype of kingship. And you gotta get, you can't understand the crucifixion if you don't understand kingship. There's no way to get any sense of the meaning of all that. Okay. But the point of it is, in terms of the, of, of the psychology of Satan, Satan is always associated with what? Chaos. See, it is always as opposed to cosmos. Satan is the agent of chaos. The true God is really 
the true king or the true queen, and they are the agent of right, just order and world making. Study Iliadi. What did he say was his most important book? Cosmos and History, in which he laid out this whole thing about the, the, the role of myth and ritual. What is the role of myth and ritual? It is to help people create cosmos against chaos. And all Iliadi's whole system, Mercha Iliadi, is a system, and y'all all ought to study. Y'all, if you want to really get a sense for the for the wider significance of Jungian thought, you need to study Iliadi's history and phenomenology of religion, his comparative religion, his book, for example, uh, Patterns in Comparative Religion. But anyway, okay. Now, the space that opens up between the male and the female warrior is the plane of battle. This is Armageddon. But remember, the warrior couple are in service of the king and queen. And the warrior couples, the task of the warrior couple is to make war against chaos, to make war against the forces of death and the forces of chaos. That's what the warrior couple is doing. That's very interesting in relationships, what happens to this. You know, particularly middle class and upper middle class professional marriages, they're both very much into the warrior, you know. And a lot of the time they put their energy into making war on the chaos in the world and before in our lives. But it's very interesting with warrior couples. You know, if it moves, a warrior's going to fight it. And so their their guns, sometimes they forget and they turn to face each other and they fire upon each other rather than the enemy. And this is one of the primary dynamics in marital dysfunction. Uh, when you get a couple that is locked into this particular archetypal configuration, they're trying to live their entire marriage either out of this one or this one or both. Then they get into therapy, and they're going to develop this configuration. <laughs> These, this archetype, this archetypal system, and this archetypal system are all extroverted. This, the magician, the magician couple are the archetypes of introverting, of inner understanding, inner work, as Robert Johnson would say. And when this is constellated, transformative space is, is. Uh, created. This is your sanctuary, your temple. In psychoanalysis, this is the transference as a vessel or container. This is what Winnicottian therapists call the holding environment. <laughs> See? This is the space of, of, uh, of uh, initiation. <clears throat> of healing. This is healing ritual. But whatever it is, it is the space in which important transformations occur uh, of uh, disease structures into healthy structures, lead into gold and alchemy. This is the alchemical space, of course. Uh, this is really the ruling archetype of psychotherapy. So here we have cosmos is the space the, space, the, the Armageddon, the plane of conflict, the transformative space, and this is the garden of delight and sorrow. So this is Eden, and this is Gethsemane. See? In other words, when the lover is constellated, you start to feel. And the problem with feeling is that when you're capable of feeling joy, you're also going to feel the sorrow, inevitably. This is why the word passion is such an important word, because it is a word that captures the emotional tone of this space, See? both in its sense as crucifixion, and grieving, and joy. Now, now think about what happens in the Garden of Eden here. We've got this bliss, we've got this love, 
life, creativity, all these wonderful things. And the agent of chaos gets in. Right? Think about the myth. The agent of chaos gets in. And the garden is, for all practical purposes, for their experience, dissolved. Think about the kind of space in therapy. The whole idea of creating a holding environment in therapy in which a person will feel secure is so that they have some primary experience of a place where there is not chaos. And so the purpose of a, of a positive transference in therapy is to give a person an experience of a place which is safe from the chaotic. See? And this goes on and on. But you see, look, just look at the way in which cosmos order, right order, and chaos figures archetypally in the way in which this type of thing operates. Now, in terms of this combat myth that we see, it is really the top two archetypal aspects of the self which get most constellated. But an interesting thing happens. Let me, let me do the uh, kingdom a bit first. What time is it? Okay, I need to put this up and then we'll take a break. Now remember, ancient world images were often mandalas. The throne at the center, chaos impinging around. Remember, for the pre-modern person, the world was what they had been able to consecrate and protect against the forces of chaos. That was what world was. If you came from out here, you are not part of the world. So if you were of another tribe, you were not of world. That made you a demon, right? Because by definition, if you are not of the tribe, the group, you were an agent of chaos. And you can see how this would be in the pre-modern world. Because every myth is imperialistic. And every tribe would have a myth which defined world and human. And if you came from another myth, then by definition you had to be demonic because you were not of the world. And so your myth would threaten this myth, and, and hence the history of religious warfare. You see how that works with religious warfare? Now that's what we're going to get to in terms of understanding the archetypal enemy. Because the human psyche is wired to be a little paranoid. That is to say, we all set up our little cosmos the best we can. Some of us are a little better at it than others, but all of us have a little borderline sector in here somewhere. And so our all of us have a, a cosmos which is a little shaky. See? So we're always wondering when the vandals are going to arrive out there on the edge. And of course, since we know that they're going to arrive, we have the warrior knight aspect of the self prepared, and its job is to fight the, in the other enemy, the one who is the agent of the other king of chaos, the underworld king. There is this uh, scene in the movie Patton which dramatizes this. If you don't know about archetypes, you wouldn't see this as an archetypal conflict, but the scene on the desert where the two tanked commands are encountering each other in this great decisive battle in northern Africa uh, in which Patton is looking out toward Rommel's tanks. So you have replayed there and the movie makes it very clear that in Patton's mind this is the archetypal battle. This is the, the battle between the forces of light and the forces of darkness. So, I mean, you see it played out right there. 
on, on this battle, the way it works in human experience, we have the plane. But what instead of uh, what instead of seeing that we've got a warrior couple here and a warrior couple here, what we get in in most traditions is an image of the uh, the champion uh, of light on this side and the champion of darkness on this side. And thus this becomes Armageddon. And so chaos is lined up over here and order is lined up over here. Now when this thing gets constellated, and it gets constellated in all of us, when it gets constellated, you can see what is necessary. What is necessary in this in this archetype? You have to have an enemy. See, now this is important to get because you've got to get clear that the uh, that, that warfare is is something that is grounded in the hard hard wiring, the archetypal wiring of the human psyche. That this automatic tendency to define an enemy without any reference whether they're really necessarily an enemy or not. When this thing is constellated, you will find an enemy. This is the fundamental archetypal ground of paranoia and personality. And when a person regresses and they are of a certain personality type, uh, they start becoming paranoid, and you can just see how the paranoid personality of your psychotherapist notice this in your paranoid patients. The entire world that they live in becomes this space. They are vigilant. Well, if you're in this space, you better be vigilant because you know that there is an archetypal enemy out to get you. Okay. The paranoid personality experiences this with every pore. They can tell somebody is lurking. Is there to get them? Okay. So right here is the fundamental archetypal struggle that exists in the hardwiring of every human psyche, and this is the fundamental archetypal basis for uh, the history of religion, religious expressions on this. You can see the archetypal basis for human warfare, and you've got to ask what this is about. What is this doing in the psyche? Okay. What is this for? Now, in human history, you know what has happened. Human beings constantly are defining other humans as the archetypal enemy. Now, when you do this, let me ask you a question. Can you see these people as humans? No. It's impossible to see them as humans. When, as General MacArthur said, when the war toxin sounds, there is a transformation that occurs in the psyche. And once that transformation in the psyche occurs, it is impossible to see the enemy as human. There is some, there's a radical shift in the perceptual capacities of the human being. You don't get a sense for, for this. There's no way to understand human history and the, and the ubiquity of warfare. Uh, this means intertribal warfare, international warfare. This is the archetype underlying the arms race right now. This is the archetype that is constellated in Nicaragua. And you've got the good Sandinistas over here looking at the Contras, and you've got the Contras over here looking at the Sandinistas. See? And right here in Chicago, you've got all these good supporters of the Sandinistas that are looking at the supporters of the Contras, and vice versa. And they're all morally superior to those horrible agents of chaos over there. The Republicans on the one side and the Democrats on the other side. You notice this? Do you get this? The Republicans on the one side and the Democrats on the other side. And in Chicago, it's the blacks on the one side and the whites on the other side. But notice, it's all on the same side. It's not the other side at all. But you see, this is the way the human psyche operates. And here's the hard, bad news for tonight. It operates this way compulsively. 
this ain't voluntary. That's bad news. So I want you to be thinking, let's take about 10 minutes, I want you to be thinking about what this is about. I mean, what is this? This could, is this, uh, you know, uh, natural selection get us to, get us to this? Well, if it, if it did, it's going to cure itself pretty soon. <laughs> let's take 10 minutes and come back. I meant to bring a Rahuana mask that, uh, that I brought back from Indonesia. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen a mask of Rahuana, but, uh, it's, it, it is just a, a wonderful, uh, ex, uh, treatment of the face of the archdemon. It's, uh, it is bright red and contorted with big teeth, you know, and, uh, uh, one of the interesting things, let me just talk a little bit about uh, some of the things you get. Let me talk a little bit about the, uh, in human religious traditions, the marks of this archetypal enemy. Uh, remember the way we're going to work. We're going to work from the religious and mythic uh, down into the psychological level and back. Yeah. Now, I write a lot of criticisms of uh, Scott Peck's book, People of the Lie, but I think one of the things that it's useful in doing is picking up on the marks of evil as understood in the Christian myth. And the interesting thing is that the marks of evil are uh, shared very widely in human culture. We've all seen, I mean, we've seen already the primary role of chaos. But let's get clear about what all chaos does. Chaos and death are equivalents. So uh, in human mythology, the forces of chaos are the forces of death. So the tree of life is at the center of the cosmos. But as you get out toward the edge, you get out where death appears. You can see that in the myth of Eden. Death appears at the edge. You go out, go out, you got death. What, in, in Christian, in the Christian myth, what are some other things that are associated with Satan? Let's talk about traits. And then let's use a little pop culture. You can get it, we work a little bit with pop culture. And we can use a little bit of stuff from fairy tales here because if we had time, we'd go a lot in tonight into Fon Franz's uh, uh, Shadow and Evil and Fairy Tales. But uh, what are some of the marks of evil uh, that are attributed to Satan? Just uh, fundamental ones that you know. Deceptiveness is key. Satan is seen as the prince of liars. Uh, what else? It's not just liar, though. Misrepresentation. That is, self, the, the, the deceitful self-representation. In other words, not just words. I mean, there's the tradition that Satan will pre present himself as an angel of light. I thought it was very interestingly done in the last temptation of Christ. Yeah. The representation of, of the angel of evil in the form of the innocent little girl. That is very consistent. That movie is very consistent. In fact, the treatment of evil in that movie is very consistent with the history of mythology. And it's very interesting in that movie in which Jesus is Jesus and John the Baptist, the two sages, the two holy men, are, are, are presented as people who are aware of the presence and real, radical reality of radical evil when other people are not. And remember that line where uh, where John says to Jesus, uh, "When you go out there, remember you're not you're not going to be alone." Okay. And see, the image of the desert is an image of the land away from the center. It's what we would call today the the, the space on the margin, marginality, liminality. Whenever you get into liminal space near the boundaries, that's where the underworld appears. 
all this stuff about the dream and the underworld that we've heard in, in Jungian thought in recent years. When you get on the margins, that's where the underworld appears. Out away from the center. See. Okay. So, uh, in, in that movie, you see, uh, Satan presenting himself in all different forms, all sorts of forms. So, so Satan is a shapeshifter. And it's very important to get that because you cannot depend upon appearance to know whether a thing is evil or not. And another point, another thing that is presented there that it will use, and this is presented in any films which treat the theme of evil and more lately. I'll talk about some of the films in a minute. But the theme is ubiquitous that it will shamelessly use that which is most precious to you to get to you. Uh, you see that clearly in the movie The Exorcist in which the the demon uses the voice of the priest mother to uh, torment him. What else? Temptation. What? Temptation. Temptation. Now, that is a word which we never hear and we don't use even in theological seminaries today. You can get your Master of Divinity degree and never hear the word temptation once. <laughs> a lot of them had to look up that word when they when they saw the title of that movie. What, what's this? Last Temptation of Christ. What's that? <laughs> yeah. Both times. Yeah, that's right. Well, what's that? So anyway, temptation is absolutely right. Now, now, Unless you have some idea about the fundamental dynamics of human evil, it's hard to understand anything about temptation. Because what was the temptation in the myth of Lucifer? And what it, what was the temptation in the myth? What was the, what was the problem? What is it that's seductive, in other words? It's power, greatness. You know, humans have this the Adler said that humans had this 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 quest for significance, for power. Uh, we might just say for greatness. Nobody wants to be ordinary. Everybody wants to be special. So the temptation is the temptation almost always of specialness, greatness. And the dynamics of envy are very important here because the dynamics of evil are almost always the dynamics of envy. See? They interlock at the core down here. You cannot separate envy and evil. <laughs> and in traditional cultures, there's this very interesting thing, cross-culturally, concept of the evil eye. What is the evil eye? Simple definition. What is the e evil eye among human cultures? It is, it is, it is envy, surely. It's something bad happens. Yeah, that's right. And there is this sense, you see, in human culture, and this one of his little book, Anthropology of Evil, talks about this, this group of people in Macedonia, contemporary Macedonia, they kind of primitive tribe in Macedonia and Greece. But in these remote villages, this thing is really, I mean, it is in place. I mean, it is as in place as it has ever been. And the thing about it is, if you, if you have a child, you are worried, 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 sick about protecting this child from the evil eye in the village. See? Evil eye is a wish to destroy or annihilate. I think that's right. And it, it, remember, this is not a concept. This is something people experience. Now think about at work. <laughs> oh, you yeah. see, think, think, think about at work. I mean, we all know about this. It's just that we don't associate with the archetypal historical mythology of evil. But, but, but what you experience in terms of the envy and hate of your colleagues, particularly when you do well, see, as long as you do badly. As, as, long, as long as you're ordinary, as long as you do not shine, you're safer. 
the if the moment you become creative, the moment you become productive, the moment you open your mouth and what comes out is not dribble. <laughs> but when something a pearl comes out of your mouth, they hate you. It's wonderful in graduate school, you know. Do any of you graduate students? Yeah. Your fellow students hate you when you make those intelligent comments. They love you when you put your foot in your mouth, you know. And of course, this doesn't affect faculties, right? <laughs> but uh, but envy and the evil eye are related to when something shines, the guns go. There's this automatic radar goes. The guns train this way and start attacking. Mirror, mirror on the wall. Okay. Now, so we could go, you can just elaborate that. There's so much with that. Uh, and it has to do with the sense of the evil, evil consciousness as humans have experienced it. It always thinks, uh, that, uh, those good things it has no access to, or it should completely have all of it. It is, you know, voracious, like the Rolling Stones song, it can't get no satisfaction, so it wants to spoil yours. See? What else are traditional insights about the way evil functions, either in fairy tales or in Christianity or in popular culture? Intelligent. It's brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. You're absolutely right. It's never stupid. <laughs> It's an interesting thing about it. It always knows the little places that you forgot to lock up. See? It always knows where your vanity is. It always knows where your, it put it in self-psychology terms, it always knows where the weaknesses in your self-structure are. It always knows the brand of bourbon that I like best. See? So I'm trying to cut down. Or it always, it always, for a cocaine addict that's trying to, to stay straight, it always chooses the, the most handsome, beautiful person to offer to give them some, you know. You know, it's never an ugly, burned out dope head that offers you something. <laughs> All right. What else? Just work, cast your net widely from your experiences in popular culture, folklore. What else can you say about the human experience of this? Think about some movies treating this. Uh, never, never kind of mainstream. I always come to be different from the group. See, it, it's experience. It, yeah, it experiences like in the thing. The thing trots in from outside the camp in the form of a dog. But pretty soon, it infiltrates the structures and is part of the establishment. It comes from the outside. Uh, it, it always feels itself to be the rebel. And it always feels itself, this is the interesting thing about this thing, the evil consciousness always feels itself not to be evil. Never feels itself really to be evil. One of the fascinating studies of this, if you want to elaborate, you, you study Hitler. And you realize that he felt himself to be the savior of civilization. Mm -hmm. Honest to God. Before God, he felt himself to be the savior of civilization. <laughs> He modeled the SS on the Jesuits. The SS was a military soldiers of God. Yes. Um, I'm not sure I can articulate this any more fully, but it, it seems to inevitably be portrayed as being incomplete. <laughs> yes, always feeling empty. There's always a feeling of emptiness. And needing what you have. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
all those traditional uh, Christian sins, you know, they all revolve around this issue of emptiness and trying to fill it somewhat. You know. Inadequate. I don't have enough. I need more. Yeah. Merciless. Sadistic and merciless. And and there's an important thing to see in it, the enjoyment of destruction. The the enjoyment of of the what some people say it's necrophilia. It's the love of death. Now, in its purest forms, uh, you can see its claim to godhood most clearly, because in the uh, most virile of social sociopaths, there is absolutely no sense of any rule which I can transgress. I make the rules. I break the rules. You see, now notice the rule-breaking aspect of the chaotic thing, because order, right order in human history, always is something which, uh, which is embodied in the true king and which the true king is subject to. The true king is an expression of Dharma, or Tao, or Torah. See? And so the, the, the pure sociopath has sense only that I am the rule maker. See? I am the rule maker. The rules are what they what I say they are. They're there for me to break. And so there is a God claim. It's a very clear God claim um, on the part of uh, a really radical sociopath. What else? The iPhone affects the generation from one channel to another. The original source gets lost. And more generally even than that, I think that's a good point, but it is extremely contagious. This is one of the apprehensions that human beings have throughout every culture have, have been aware of, that, that principles of contagion operate. That you cannot be in the presence of evil consciousness without being affected by it. Absolutely no one can be in the presence of it without being affected by it, infected by it. And it is a disease model. The further back you go, the clearer that it is a disease model. It is only with the encroachments and layering of civilization and rationality and so forth that you begin to get away from that model of evil. By the time you get to concepts of guilt, I did it. That is, there are very few people who are capable of experiencing guilt, real guilt. What most people call guilt is shame. See? You know, I'm sorry I got caught. <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, it's very interesting. When I get in, when I get in talking about Freud next week, I'm talking about superego. It's very interesting the way in which, uh, the way in which the, uh, grandiosity in the person uses the sense of guilt to destroy them. See? I mean, it's a, it's, you know, the, 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 uh, sort of what you might call the demonic side of guilt. Feeling. But what else? Now, one other thing. Uh, there's, see some movies. See uh, Looking for Mr. Goodbar. Mm -hmm. See uh, uh, Amadeus. Uh, see uh, Dangerous Liaisons. <coughs> um, it's plotting, but that goes along with the intelligence. It's what? and scheming as yeah, yeah. That's right. That's right. That's right. Uh, but the contagious thing, you got to really get a sense for the way in which uh, the way in which this thing spreads. And uh, and the other thing is that you always think it's going to come from somewhere that it, it doesn't. 
And one of the things that horror movies are forever picking up on in terms of the archetypal dy dynamics of evil, you watch horror movies, you see that, that these filmmakers don't, you know, they're not Jungians, most of them. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't. But it's funny how well they've got this archetypal dynamics of this down because, I mean, it's just there in the psyche, so they get it. You know, you're forever seeing you know that the person knows that there's something out there, you know, and so they run and they fasten the windows and they fasten the doors and everything. And then the camera pans, you know. <laughs> pans on the window that I didn't lock. <laughs> and of course, that's the window <laughs> that it tries to get into. See? Or we notice the chain is off of the dead boat. And the door is slightly ajar. Right? In other words, one of the things that you notice, and all that, I mean, you notice it's already in before you notice, it's already inside before you think to check that door. Like the movie, The Thing, I really want you to try to get it before next week. Check it out. It's an old movie. I don't mean the Jim Arness version. I mean the uh, the remake. Uh, it's all. It's a. It's a few years old. Yeah, it's on video. Uh, but uh, who's the guy played in Escape from New York? Goldie Yeah. It's not Kurt Russell. It's a Kurt Russell flick. So look at that because it's got so much wonderful treatment of the archetypal dimensions of evil in that. Because this thing comes into the camp, it has come from the outer realm, it has been frozen, humans with science have decided they're going to study it, right? We scientists are going to study this, so we bring it into the camp. <laughs> Notice that this is a recurrent theme. You bring it you bring it in and you sit there, you got your white coat on after all. So white coat's gonna protect you. And so you, you thaw it out, right? <laughs> now I want you to think be thinking about this in terms of archetypal psychology. You say, what is this thawing it out business? See? And what is the frozenness of it in the first place? And uh, how do human psyches freeze this thing? And where was the place from which that spaceship came? See, you check out the same thing in Aliens 1 and Aliens 2. The whole, the whole, the whole thing. Yeah, well, I mean, in terms of this stuff, there's, you don't need any other movies. Right. Uh, in terms of getting at the archetypal dimensions of this thing. What's the nature of the contagion? I mean, the thing about it is, is in terms of psychological understanding of it, what you got to get a sense for is is when they talk about contagion in primitive culture, what they're observing is that, that when this thing is present in the tribe, the person they knew is gone. They talk about it as soul loss. And when these primitives say, well, now the alligator got my aunt, they don't always mean that the alligator down at the creek ate the aunt. What they mean is that the woman that is in the house that used to be my aunt is a demon. This is a demon. This is not my auntie. And uh, if any of you are in the middle of any marital problems, you have probably wondered, who is this person? <laughs> <laughs> this is not that person. Uh, and this is a thing, this is this is related, see, because when you and and see the thing you gotta get clear about is that if you are not careful, you can constellate in your relationships this archetypal shadow. In fact, if you want to know, there are a lot of people that know how to make this in people. It's very easy to, to, to generate people who are vulnerable to the archetypal shadow. And all, you just have to abuse them. And when you abuse humans, they become very vulnerable to invasion by this thing. 
And we'll, we'll talk. Hmm? And birth trauma being a uh, fertile ground for evil? Well, well, you don't have to use any kind of metaphysical concept of this at all. You can just say, now look at what happens to people who've been sexually abused in childhood. Look how hard it is for them to get chaos out of their lives. Look how they tend to have a terrible struggle forever and ever and ever and ever and ever getting, finding the center and getting this chaos stopped. See? Well, you see, what you got, we got to do is to think archetypally about this. See, if you, if you just have an ego psychology point of view, well, you say, well, you know, they have a weak ego. <laughs> and you know, uh, if they haven't had a good enough therapist yet, and they do, we'll get a we'll get a strong ego. E.T. phone home. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but at the archetypal level, see, if you have any sense of the way in which this this chaotic stuff operates on the archetypal level. Once you get exposed to a lot of chaos, if you don't have somebody around that knows how to invoke cosmos and do some sort of ritual cleansing of the presence of these toxins, then uh, it's very difficult. See, it's very interesting. You get all these uh, secular therapists who have no sense of any kind of archetypal realities at all trying to go up against you know, this kind of incredibly powerful chaotic element that get constellated in the psyche. But we'll get into that a lot more as we go. What's the relationship between grandiosity and say? Well, I I think that if you wanted to have a short summary definition of uh, the dynamics of human evil, you would just say that it is the result of infantile grandiosity. And you can see that, I'll talk a lot about that next week and the following week. You can see it in every psychoanalytic tradition that they agree on that. They don't say it that way, but if you get deeply into what they're talking about as the root of psychopathology, you will see that there is a, uh, a childish claim to godhood. The Freudians have various ways of talking about that. The Adlerians make it very clear. The Jungians uh, are talking about inflation or pride. Jesus, the Cohutians make it very clear. It's a grandiose self-organization that's at the root of so much dysfunction and fragmentation. So uh, uh, I might add, though, uh, uh, and I appreciate you raising that, Foster, because uh, because it is something that is shared by the mythical traditions. Evil leads you to make crazy, grandiose claims for yourself and to try to live as if reality didn't exist. The consensual world, the communal world. See, it's very interesting. One of the other things, what about what? How is evil portrayed? It gets you when you're alone. It's very hard to get to catch evil when you're when you're in your group. Not impossible, but if you notice the 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 fictional treatments in horror stories, notice it's when the guy and the thing. He goes back to check out the dogs, and there's nobody around. He's just going back in there to check things out. And you know that place in all the horror movies in which you've got the hero and the heroine, and they're going down through to the tunnel. And he turns and he says to her, wait here. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? And we all say, oh, God, no. Oh, no, don't wait there. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's in all of them, you know. Wait, wait here, you know. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go check this out. I'm gonna go down this corridor, and you keep wondering where the the guy, where the guy's understanding that you know your partner is always to cover your back. And you notice every time in these stories, whenever you forget to have your back covered, 
that's when it gets you. I mean, that is that is an insight that is always see. And people say you can't see your own, you can't see your back. You have to have another person to watch your back. And that is the that is a thing that is present throughout. It takes the community to do an exorcism. You can't have a private exorcism. See. And uh, this is true everywhere. It's very interesting. Why is that? Well, because, you know, if you're really making stupid, grandiose claims for yourself, and you have some people around while you're doing it, they're going to laugh at you. <laughs> right? Now, if you're by yourself, you know, you can really get into thinking you're God, you know, or even maybe Satan. But uh, if you are with a group, it's... It's a lot harder to bring it off unless you're really good. And if you're really good and you know how to play on people's insecurities and promise them repair through sacrificing those goats, then you can do it in the group. Satan, uh, you know, uh, Satan always is good at using groups against other groups to help them deal with their shame about humiliation they suffered at the face of somebody else. See? I mean, one of the interesting things is about studying uh, the history of World War One and Two is the role of shame and the uh, vulnerability of the German people to the first person that came along and said, I'm going to help you get over the shame that those people made you suffer unnecessarily, which is, of course... Accurate. Um, yeah. There's also often an erotic point to it. Mm-hmm. Yes. Oh, yeah. Often an erotic thing, and it's a very interesting thing. See, this is the demon lover aspect. Mm-hmm. And, you know, The feminine kind of gets it in the ear in patriarchy in a lot of ways, but one of the places that it doesn't get it in the ear is there are not very many representations in patriarchy, contemporary patriarchy about Satan as feminine. Except if you understand about the demon lover thing. And you see that clearly in Dracula movies. Because you can see that the ones with the big teeth are men and they're women. And, uh, and, if you understand that it is infantile grandiosity that fuels it, and you in- understand that the archetypal lovers that we had down here at this level, they're really representations of divine reality. You have to understand that to understand the seductiveness of the grandiose lover. Why are so many men and women attracted to narcissistic personalities erotically? There's a reason for that. They are seeing something. What is it in the narcissistic lover that shines so brightly? It's their God claim. There is so much attractiveness in a human being that presents themselves as the goddess or the god. It's a, there, there is a numinous power to it. And of course, whenever a person is seduced, it is their experience of the god or the goddess that they're experiencing in the seduction. They're not experiencing the human. The human comes later. See? During the seduction, what is being experienced is the god claim of the narcissist in the person. That's why the erotic tone. But you see, you notice now, it's very interesting, you don't get the demonic in in only one form. You get the demonic in the power-hungry dictator form. You get the demonic in in the sadistic SS killer warrior. You get the demonic in the, uh, in the, uh, cold, cruel, uh, doctor, Nazi doctor. You get the demonic in the demon lover. But, and they manifest totally differently. And yet, 
they all share a bogus God claim, see, and promise to the human what they cannot deliver. They promise life and they deliver death, see. They promise order and they deliver chaos. Here they're promised order to the German people. He promised regeneration to them. And he delivered them Gotterdammerung, see. And this is, this is, you see this in every, in every culture and their representations the way this works, yes. And the bogus God claim always destroys them. Yes, it always destroys them. And, and they love that. They would, they would rather have the entire cosmos disappear than not be God. See? It's the uh, opposite of the covenant, it's the empty covenant. Yeah, say more. Oh, I don't know what else to say. They were just talking about empty promises. Uh, yeah, they promise though, they do well, promise. They promise uh, eternal life, they promise uh, uh, inherit the land, very much like what you would get that's in right. the covenant. Well, that's right, they promise you always more than they can deliver. See? Well, they can't deliver any of it because they don't have the power to deliver That's right. But the covenant does have inherent land. But see, notice the way the demon lover, the demon lover, male or female, always promises you more than this real person you're with. They always promise you more. And one is always into the fantasy that they are going to give me more. And then it's only later that you find out that they can't deliver more. It's about the sacrifice. How so? There's a sacrifice on the part of the human being that they have to give up something to to oh they, have they, there is an expected sacrifice. This is the sense in which uh, you you are to sacrifice to me. The demonic consciousness always believes in sacrifice. Yours. <laughs> <laughs> you're always you're always to to bring offerings. It's a real imitator of, of the divine. It's, a, it's an exact imitator, archetypally speaking. I mean, you, you get... Uh, that's why the Satanists have this understanding you know, of what is known as the Black Mass. I mean, there, there, there's a lot of very similar things. Um, but they're just subtly reversed. And that's all that mirror all that mirror stuff in the vampire movies. So it's not the blood of Christ, it's your blood. It's your blood. <laughs> and anytime you see sacrificial kinds of dynamics on the part of masochistic people, that's what's happening. And they've always got someone that's only too willing to receive the offering. See? Yeah. Uh, now, you can go on and on and on with these, I mean, but uh, one of the interesting things is that in terms of, of, of pre-modern experiences of this, it's something that we don't have expressed in contemporary religion, particularly Christian religion. You get a sense of the, of the nature of possession states and the, the extent to which the experience of evil is contagion, from without. See, there's where you get the mythic, the mythic understanding that it is contagion from without, is outside the ego, outside the I. And, uh, and, uh, you get the sense that this renders, and this is where we talk about the, what, what is contagion. It renders the consciousness incapable of fighting it. And it does this by convincing the I that it is the I. See, it, it is able to make the I, the, the personality, think that its fantasies are its own. Uh, it has, in other words, the individual has no sense of being possessed. Uh, and therefore, if you have no sense of being possessed, then you have no want, you have no desire for liberation. That's why you see this constantly in all the old zombie movies. You know, if you've seen Invasion of the Body Snatchers, it's wonderful. Get that get that 
uh, uh, Sutherland, Donald Sutherland remake of Invasion of the Body Snatchers. It, it treats this motif perfectly because once this thing gets you, it's got a replica. It, it makes a perfect replica of you that is not you. See? And the, and the, that's just a metaphorical way of saying, this is a different being here. And it has no sense of being under any spell. Here's where enchantment is key. We got to stop. What time is it? Is it nine? Enchantment is key in pre-modern understandings of evil. And it, the whole concept of the spell is something you need to work on. You can't understand fairy tales without that. It is a sense that that once this thing comes in, uh, the power to fight it is gone. And you have to get a sense for this, or you have no way of understanding traditional Christological understandings of the atonement and Christ's role in liberating, you know, the world from the power of Satan. Because if you don't understand enchantment, the power of the spell, you can't understand how it would work. See? If you don't know what the being under the spell would be, you can't imagine what it would be to break the spell. See? But, but in pre-modern, Cross-culturally, they have the sense of spells and, encha and enchantment. Yeah. So then, uh, a translation of that to a modern situation would be a child who grew up in an alcoholic family who was under a spell of a disease in that family, and until she or he changes his consciousness, and... Uh, yeah, that's right. They, they would... So that's it, a spell, that's an enchantment. That would... That enchantment yeah. of that... It, it, once you start having a psychology of consciousness and you think about dynamics of enchantment and you understand that every family has its spell mm -hmm. and that when you're looking at Cinderella and you're looking at Sleeping Beauty and all those things and the, the uh, Handless Maiden and all those things, those are talking about what happens to certain consciousness states and how the, the until that is broken and the person can break out of this and say, you know, in, in the individuate that I am not this. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was saying to somebody, I said, you know, it, how long does it take you to get crazy when you go home? Mm -hmm. yeah. I figure I give you a day. Okay. Maybe a day. If you're real strong. <laughs> if you're real strong. The second day, you'll be crazy. You'll be back into the family myth, see. And you'll be just as whoever you were when you were there. Mm -hmm. Uh and so it works in fam family. It's very important to, to look at families in terms of context for this. But in traditional, see, but the important thing, point I want you to leave you with is contrary to modern assumptions about consciousness and choice and free will and all that stuff, in the pre-modern world and the understanding of evil and this thing, the thing, the thing that attacks human beings, it gets you and it gets you when you're not looking when you least expect it and once it has gotten you you are not free to choose not to be under its influence that is the ubiquitous understanding of human evil cross-culturally see once and see that's totally alien to the modern mind uh, we we don't we don't like dealing with that, even though we have psychologists that don't believe in a self or a psyche. You know, we can be a behavioral therapist who has no concept whatsoever of free will, but we still operate out of a view of consciousness that people can choose. See? See? We've got this kind of naive understanding of free will in the modern world. And that means that it's very difficult for humans in the modern realm, what? To be compassionate. It's very difficult for moderns to have any compassion for people who are living very destructive or and or self-destructive lives. Because we think they're choosing it. Well, I always say that you really not choose. Well, I think, I think that the more sophisticated you get psychologically, the more you understand how little is chosen. That's it, but how, how can people, intelligent people, believe that you're choosing it? Because why would you choose to be destructive? 
I mean, you're a bad you? person. Yeah, exactly. You didn't go to the right school. You're among the damned. Yeah. No, they don't, we don't think that. We think, well, they didn't get the right education. Like education no. Or uh, they didn't have the right psychological course or something. But we really have this attitude, and that's the thing, the one thing that really differentiates is this naive attitude about free will. Now, primitive peoples don't have that. Say, somebody got my auntie, <laughs> and this being that's at the house looks like my auntie, but that's not my auntie. My auntie's soul is somewhere in a crocodile down on the stream, and I need to find the shaman who can locate that crocodile. See? We'll do Freudian stuff next week. Uh, enjoy it. Let me just say a little bit about what I'm going to do and how I would like you to look at it. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, Freud, Adler, uh, some object relation theorists, uh, and uh, Kohut's self-psychology. I teach all of these uh, theories, the comparative psychoanalytic theories, uh, in my doctoral uh, teaching at Chicago Theological Seminary. And um, I don't want you to, to view what I'm going to do tonight as a, as a uh, really very fair treatment of these theories to, uh, internally. What I want you to view it as more is a sort of a phenomenological reflection on these psychologies with regard to phenomena which they talk about. The uh, thing I want to focus on is a phenomenological reflection on certain psychological concepts and entities uh, that these theorists have talked about that if you're trying to, to think about uh, human destructiveness and the human experience of evil, uh, that they they are uh, they have some they have some reflections that while we want I won't try to present them as uh, as they would be presented by a theorist of that school. Uh, I want you to reflect on uh, these things. I want to be talking about uh, uh, Freud's concept of uh, super ego and id and the structural theory. I'm going to be talking about Adler's uh, conception of the superiority complex and the way that is experienced in the psyche. Uh, I'll be talking a little bit about uh, object relations theor theoretical con concepts of um, antilobitinal ego and what we might call toxic interjects or uh, toxic inner objects. And then I'll spend some time reflecting on a grandiosity and the grandiose self-organization in Kohut. Um, I'll get as far as I can before the break. Uh, if, uh, if you will remind me tonight, when somebody asks a question, ask me to repeat the question so we can get that on tape. And will you give me a signal or something when we get to uh, halfway through so we can take a break? Question of inner enemies or the the experience of uh, in of destructiveness within oneself or destructive realities in the human psyche that the human trying to live his or her life doesn't experience as a part of the I. Uh, it, it's a very important way to think about uh, this in the light of the history of human experience. Last week, you know, we we talked about the combat myth and the uh, cross-cultural uh, reflections on, on um, uh, evil. But I'd like to start now and think a little bit about uh, the experience of superego and id in uh, human experience according to an early classical Freudian position. Uh, one of the most important things that you have to get when you think about the history and psychology of evil and the demonic is that one of the common uh, experiences of human beings is uh, that of possession states. Possession states are states in which the, the individual does not know that 
he or she has been co-opted by a an organization, a psychological or spiritual organization that is not the I, the, the ordinary I of that personality. Uh, as I said to some of you that uh, that the friends know this is not the regular I. The family knows uh, this is not my aunt. But the individual doesn't have any sense of being different and can't understand different responses. Uh, this is a particularly important thing, for example, in the practice of therapy, because very uh, psychologically undifferentiated persons have very little sense when some non-ego structure in the psyche is speaking through their voice and and uh, feeling through their feelings and and uh, criticizing them through their thoughts. It is a very common experience to have people, and we'll get into this more when I talk about object relations theory, but just to jump ahead a bit, people who have extremely toxic introjects from childhood, we just speak with that parlance, when, when these introjects are constellated, and, and when you're watching this in therapy, it's just amazing. You'll be sitting with somebody, and they're not, in, they're not feeling the influence of this inner toxic introject. And they're, they're feeling pretty good. But something will happen, and this thing will come in and, and, and invade the ego's consciousness. And the individual will not have any sense of, of losing any eyeness. But there will be a physical change. Those of you that are interested in multiple personality will be interested in this. But there, there will be a physical change. There will be an enormous change in countenance. The body will change. And uh, the voice will change. And the memory will change. And the attitude toward the future will change. And the attitude and the transference will change. And all be, uh, you'll be able to observe this, and it will occur often very quickly, and it's so quick, when it's quick, it's striking. And, uh, and the individual that's sitting there with you will not have any sense of, ha of having been invaded by any kind of psychological structure. It's just like if somebody changed my contact lens without my being aware that they're slipping another lens in. But there's a lens that comes in there. And there's this big change. But in therapy, working with someone, uh, when this individual cannot even be aware that, that something is experiencing them then, that they have to learn to disidentify with, uh, that, they, that there's a toxic interject, uh, an organized system, which a Jungian would call what? what? A complex. <clears throat> A Jungian would call that organized system that has its own perceptual mode and memory mode and future mode and, and uh, emotionality would call that a complex, that, that that individual is going to have to start to learn to disidentify with that complex. Individual is going to have to learn to disidentify with that particular mode, that, that perceptual uh, entity. But it's striking early in therapy the individual cannot even begin to disidentify with that. Now, going back to the early days in Freudian analysis, part of Freud's genius was his awareness to note the impingements upon individuals of uh, what he deemed to be inner psychological structures, mechanisms, uh, realities, which pushed the individual in ways that the I might not be able to disidentify with, but which were clearly not uh, functions of what he would call the ego or the I, the ish. Uh, let's, look, uh, let's look first at the uh, phenomenon of, of being overwhelmed by the id. Uh, if an individual uh, is not psychologically sophisticated, when they are, when they begin to be overwhelmed by the presence and pressures of the id, the individual will not have any sense that uh, I am not doing this. See? But, for example, things will start getting very crazy and chaotic in my life, and what I will start doing is, in contemporary terms, we say we start, I start acting out. 
I start doing all sorts of things which which I do not know why I'm doing them, but I don't reflect on why I'm doing them. I just do them. Like in the movie Looking for Mr. Goodbar. I, I just start going out and I start getting myself in the underworld. And I start acting out in a very... Uh, aggressive way, or a very sexual way, or a very sexual and aggressive way, and I just am into doing it. And as long as I'm uh, very primitively organized, I don't even ask, why am I doing this? See, if you, get, if you can ask, why am I doing this, that's the beginning of some disidentification with this. But uh, in Freud, Freud's early reflection, he's looking at compulsive behaviors. People <clears throat> doing things and then trying to figure up a, rationaliz a rationalization about why I'm doing this. You know, it's like my body goes up and wants to do this, and then I think of why I'm doing it. So the, uh, the experience, the, Freud, the Freud's description of the, of the, the ego's experience of, of id to dominance is an experience, is a, is a discussion of an inner entity which clearly does what it wants to do if it can bring it off. And, uh, and this thing, it's very interesting when we get to reflecting about this, it's very interesting how uh, tonight and next week I'll sum it up, it's very interesting how uh, these inner entities all tend to be uh, what we might call infantile grandiose. They all have a certain infantile grandiosity. And this is true of the superego, it's true of the id, it's true of the superiority complex, it's true of the grandiose self-organization. There, there is an infantile grandiosity that uh, is expressed in it. Now, what is the infantile grandiosity that you can see in the early Freudian id? Where do you, what's grandiose about the id? Somebody just think about it a minute. Say, <coughs> how would you suggest that, that the id is grandiose? What's grandiose about it? In an infantile? No, the, in, in, in anyone, the id. What's grandiose about the id? Yeah. Doesn't have to have any rules. Yeah, I don't have any rules. The id knows no rules. What does the id know? What it wants. And what does it want? It wants everything. It wants everything. And it wants it now. <laughs> See, they never taught me back when they were trying, they were teaching and trying to, they called themselves teaching Freud uh, to me. And they never explained to me that, uh, yes, the little boy does want all of mom eat her up, every last little bit, but they didn't teach me what any good Freud analyst would have taught me, and that is that he also wants all of that, right down to the last drop, uh, that, that the hungry little fella is radically bisexual, and, uh, the only problem he has is, which one will I eat up first? <laughs> the conflict, you know? Do I start on her left uh, pinky or his? And, uh, and is my mouth big enough to get them both in at the same time? Uh, uh, but but you, when you begin to work your way into trying to understand the phenomenology of what Freud is seeing, I mean... Uh, that's one of the wonder, wondrous things about Freud that's not appreciated. I mean, he, he has the capacity to see this greediness in the human psyche and just present it the way it presents, clinically. And when you then start uh, looking at, at um, compulsions through the eyes of classical, you know, Psychology, uh, id psychology. We don't hear much about id psychology anymore. People got bored with that. Now they want to have ego psychology. But but id psychology is a lot more interesting. You know, I mean, you see this, you see this incredible uh, 
desire, this radical, radical, grandiose desire and on every modality, every bodily modality, a radical, grandiose desire. And, uh, and it wants to just gobble up reality. And you start working on these primal uh, uh, fantasies, incorporation fantasies, and the anxiety around primal incorporation fantasies. Remember, for Freudian, this is not coming out of the eye. <coughs> this is not coming out of the human eye. This is coming out of what? The it. Like the, the thing. It's coming out of the thing. Well, what is it? Well, it comes in there, and when you when you are not sufficiently defended against it, it uh, it wants everything now totally. And the primitive incorporation fantasies I have anxieties only about. Well, after I eat it all up, I want to eat it all up again, and there may not be any of it left to eat up. See, I mean, there, there there's. Uh, you don't, you don't at this point, you don't have an infantile guilt except in so far as that. I'm going to eat it up, but if I eat it up, there won't be anything left. But see, who is the I that wants to eat it up? See, it's not the I of the human ego. There is a, another, from classical Freudian theory, the, the, the it is not the I. <laughs> And it is totally voracious, without limit, unlimitedly voracious. And you can see, you know, a lot of the old discussions in various religions about what are the evils. Uh, it's very interesting. You get that Anthropology of Evil book, and you look at the way they describe it, they describe that cross-culturally, that, that sense of wanting to, totally to consume it all up without limit. But the interesting thing in this, uh, and the picture of the little ego trying to deal with that, and if you've ever either been an addict or you have known an addict intimately, uh, an addict of any kind, then you have a little sense about this dragon that the ego tries to live with, this real hungry Grendel in there, who when it wakes up, it's like the eyes come open, boom, and then it takes you off for a ride, and it goes and gets its thing, and the ego uh, is dragged along kicking and screaming. But what about the superego? Mm -hmm. Think about the superego, and think about the Freudian, the early Freudian understandings of a punitive superego, a, what, they, what they would call a primitive superego. Uh, and think about for a minute, what is grandiose about the primitive, archaic superego? Now, that's just, what do we associate the superego with in classical Freudian theory? Anybody? The conscience. What kind of a conscience? Repressed. What? Repressed. Very repressive. And uh, when we when we think about the kinds of things that, say, if you were a Freudian psychotherapist or a traditional classical Freudian analyst, what kind of superego phenomena would you be concerned to help the person get by or get over or, or to deal with? I mean, what kind of things would have, be happening to them that, that you would be trying to help them fight back against in the name of libido life? What sorts of things would... Criticism. Yes. Mm -hmm. And criticism like in italics, you know, like italicized criticism, because when your superego is very primitive, here again, look at this, you don't know it's not yeah. I speaking. When your superego is very primitive, you have not disidentified with it. And so when you're experiencing it, you're experiencing this incredibly powerful self-criticism and the demands of it are 
well, we say perfectionistic, but that word, you know, that's that doesn't get it. I mean, if you're trying to help somebody that has this, to say that they are perfectionistic doesn't quite get it. It's like they are they are staggering under an onslaught of incredibly poisonous attack by this super ego structure. Yes. Isn't this a, a little bit on the theme of uh, devouring, it's the devouring with the intent to <coughs> annihilate the individual. There's no way the individual is this were left to dominate. That uh, the statement is that in this a, a an attempt to um, to annihilate what we'd say they call the ego of the individual. And I think this that is the way the individual experiences the onslaught. They don't that but they think they're doing it. It's like if I'm a person experiencing this and I'm not very sophisticated psychologically and I haven't gained much self-insight yet and I haven't developed the capacity in my out of the I to stand to see that this is not I that's doing this, then I think I am saying this. I think I am saying that I should just kill myself. And so I get very su I get very suicidal. Except the interesting thing about it, once you get inside this, it's not the I that's suicidal. It it feels to the I like the I is suicidal. See, now that's the important thing to get. There is no d disidentification between the I and this above I here. And so the individual experiences the uber ish, the super ego as its own self-attack. And the attack is from an incredibly grandiose set of standards. Godlike. A godlike set of standards. What did they used to call this in spiritual tradition in Christianity? Hubris. That's certainly, it's certainly hubris. But it's not experienced by the eye as hubris. What else is this kind of... Uh, Death dealing self criticism called scrupulousness. scrupulousness. Classic thing, spiritual directors that had any sense for this type of thing. They watched this, and when they catch somebody that really uh, were, were, were terribly, terribly self critical, they would pick up the demonic nature of this. Uh, Freud's genius was to show, and it's very interesting, instead of putting the superego, it's like you can see the way in which the, in this, in this structural view of Freud's psychology, that the ego is trying to deal with this incredibly grandiose pressure from the id, and at the same time deal with incredibly grandiose attacks uh, and criticism from the superego, all at the same time. So, uh, uh, you know, some people used to say, well, now the, you could see that the id is the devil and, and the superego is probably religion or God, and you've got the ego trying to make, find its way between those. But see, that is really a very unsophisticated reading of that. Because if you look closer, you see that the infantile grandio grandiosity, which has always been associated with human evil, is coming from both sides. That the grandiosity is equally present in the superego and in the id. So, uh, so in effect, the ego experiences, the I experiences itself as having... Uh, when it really gets more sophisticated through the psychoanalytic process and Freudian analysis, it, it experiences itself as having two uh, forces, which are not the same, with which it must contend if it is to eke out some space for life. And, uh, and a classical analyst in the Freudian school is really trying to do that, is trying to help that I get some space to have a human life. And it is an enormous struggle to try to just clear out an area where the individual is not being uh, 
uh, dominated by the it or beaten to death by the superego. And so Freudian analysts, quite rightly, uh, for many, many years now, have sort of viewed themselves as advocates for life. And their libido theory is, from their point of view, an, uh, an advocate of life against death. And you ought to look, you know, if you want to get a little sense of the kind of Freudian mythology around this, read Norman Brown, the old Marcuse stuff, uh, Norman Brown loves body and all those things that came out in the 60s. And uh, uh, Marcuse, Eros and Civilization, which were meditations on the forces of life against the forces of death. Which gets us to the other thing, which in Freudian theory we should be aware of, early Freudian theory, when uh, he talked about the death instinct, Thanatos. And later on, his disciples talked him out of using this. Uh, but uh, in my view, that's kind of that's kind of sad because because he was picking up on a lot of things that. Uh, should have been highlighted more over the years. And they, they realized it's not going to be popular, Sigmund, for you to be putting out all this about a death instinct. That's not going to go over too well in the circles you're trying to convince. So he dropped it out. But it's very interesting to look at the way in which he conceived the, uh, the tension between Eros and Thanatos. <clears throat> What did he observe? Well, he was observing in the people he worked with something that seemed like it loved death more than life. Something in the personality that seemed to want to self-destruct. That was very masochistic. And it's very interesting to study uh, the, the early psychoanalytic movement because they had a lot more sense in those days than contemporary psychoanalysts have for uh, what is known today as necrophilia, uh, the love of death. Necrophilia is a very important concept. And uh, it's awfully hard to make any sense out of it out of, out of an ego psychology point of view. What's this, what's this about? I mean, you start looking at these people that get uh, into uh, very, very primitive, self-destructive behaviors. And if, the more you clean things up and you don't deal with the early Freud's perception of uh, these destructive, uh, innate destructive uh, drives, then you start having a hard time explaining some of the things you see. In people, you uh, you if you're an ego psychologist and you don't uh, have a very developed sense of human destructiveness, then when you get the reports about the cannibalism in Texas through satanic rituals, you change stations. <laughs> Well, I don't want to deal with that stuff. I mean, after all, I mean. Uh, or if you were with me last Saturday at this workshop on violence that was held in the loop and uh, going over the slides of what satanic practitioners in the Chicago metropolitan area, area are doing to young children and their rituals, the sexual abuse that is being perpetrated on young children. Uh, if you have an ego psychology point of view that doesn't uh, have any emphasis on any kind of uh, love of death or necrophiliac tendencies, then it's much easier just to change the subject. Uh, the early Freudians wouldn't have batted an eye because they were among the, the most honest at looking at uh, the unpleasant, seemingly primitive, instinctual uh, behaviors of human beings. The uh, uh, current 
reappropriation of the term necrophilia in the context of the arms race and the ecological crisis, I think is uh, is uh, appropriate. And uh, if you study this old tradition in Freudian analysis before we got revisionist, uh, uh, in effect, see, and here's a Jungian gloss on this, in effect, the, the early Freudian interest in primary process was very parallel to what Jungians call the study of the collective unconscious. And uh, as, they, as, as ego psychology developed, and there was much, much less attention paid to the way in which the primary process operates when it's running wild, uh, then the research interest of the Freudians in that kind of phenomena uh, uh, was eclipsed. And it's hard to find any literature on it now, unless you go back and look at the old literature. But for our purposes tonight, it's just very important to, to be aware that we ought to go back and we ought to look at that old literature again. We ought to go back into the clinical observations that, uh, that gave rise to it and, uh, and think about human destructiveness in that kind of context. Uh, certainly in the light of what we're going to talk about next week when I'm talking about uh, uh, the uh, Jungian uh, concept of an archetypal shadow or a dark side of the self, uh, that stuff deserves more attention because the, the dark side of the self is not the archetype of order at all. It's an archetype of chaos. It's not an archetype of serving life at all like the tree of life. It is, it is serving death. Uh, so uh, sort of a sort of a Shiva principle in terms of the principle of destruction. So, uh, in any case, so you, so you look at both Freud's early structural theory and you can see uh, uh, inner, uh, inner realities which are not at all friendly in any way to life, uh, certainly not to the life of the ego or the, the, uh, the human true self, we might say today. Uh, and if we look at this struggle between Thanatos and Eros, then you have right there Freud's apprehension that there is something in the human that in certain conditions seems to love death and want to have the reign of death more than the reign of life. Now, I don't have time to go into psychology of Adolf Hitler, but let me recommend to you this book called Hitler, Adolf Hitler, The Psychopathic God. And, uh, and if you get into that and read it, you get a, a major case study of an individual who uh, was radically into the mythology of death and uh, who, along with uh, Himmler and some others, created a mythology of death and uh, uh, you can see an entire mythic configuration which ranges from the formation of the death head SS to the death camps. Uh, and it makes a kind of an integrated uh, uh, <coughs> configuration when you, when you look at it from, uh, from this point of view. So it's very interesting that Early classical Freudian psychoanalysis had a very sophisticated sense of inner enemies uh, that were not at all friendly toward human life, uh, not friendly at all toward civilization, uh, and which had, in which one had enormous conflict and struggle toward trying to create a space of what we would say mythically today, cosmos. But the forces of chaos are so strong in the human psyche that the, the, uh, the moral resources required to form civilization or world are enormous. And Freud is probably unparalleled as a moral psychologist uh, because of his radical, unswerving honesty about the, how difficult it is uh, to do that. He maintained that to his death, and uh, 
And it's no accident that today among historians, he is still considered one of the preeminent moral psychologists uh, uh, of the modern era. Moral psychologist precisely because he, he emphasized that uh, human beings have a lot of enemies of life and civilization that are not merely socialization problems. See, I mean, are not educational, not simply uh, uh, financial. See, and I think that that's been a great loss to lose those emphases, and uh, we need to we need to go back. Those of us that are interested in uh, the psychology of human destructiveness need to go back and look at that stuff again. Now, any question about that before we go into Adler? If you haven't really spent time reading and studying Freud, you really should because it's a it's a, a banquet of riches. One of the greatest writers of modern psychology. And whatever else you think about the limitations of his theories, his, his capacity to look with dispassion at uh, the phenomena of the human psyche in its less pleasant forms is unparalleled. Now, what is an inner enemy in Adler? It's harder to get at that with Adlerians. Adlerians tend to be once born, as William James would put it, once born uh, healthy-minded types instead of twice born sick souls, you know, like Freudians and Jungians. Adlerians are interested in creating more social interest, cooperation, things like that. Uh, and they believe in education and helping educational processes. And, and uh, Adler himself was a socialist, married to a Marxist, so worked in there with a, worked with the uh, uh, lower classes and the working class and so forth. And, and uh, so if you don't look very close at Adler, you'll do what many Jungians do. You'll sort of uh, dismiss him. Well, he, what was that about Adler? Well, he had some idea of power you know, psychology of power, and that's it. And now we go on to something else. Uh, that's really sad. Because if you look beneath the surface at the power of Alfred Adler's understanding of human nature, uh, you see that actually he is more ruthless in some ways in his honesty about the, the human propensity toward antisocial behavior than uh, many others. And here's what we want to point out tonight about, about Adler with regard to an in, inner enemy. Uh, for Adler, behind every inferiority complex was a superiority complex, a hidden superiority complex, a claim to perfection. Now, Adler used the word complex, but he wasn't an intellectual. And he wasn't a meta-theoretician. He would have been bored to tears at the University of Chicago. And so he didn't really get into elaborating complex theory like Jung did, or like later Freudians did when they developed object relations theory. I mean, he just didn't get into that. But in terms of talking about what is the cause of human destructiveness, Adler was very clear. What causes human destructiveness? Superiority claims. What are the root of superiority claims? The root of superiority claims are in the superiority complex of the individual. Well, you might say, Alfred Adler, where is that? Well, the eye of the individual, he didn't even use a tripartite theory, so he didn't have an ego, but he had a sense of the conscious self, willing self, the individual's conscious willing self is not aware of its superiority complex. Where is it? Well, it's in the psyche. A good Adler would say it's in the lifestyle. What's the lifestyle? It's a cognitive set of assumptions. Well, where is the cognitive set of assumptions? Well, it's in the psychological apparatus of the human organism somewhere. Today, with cybernetics, we don't have any trouble figuring out that, well, there's an information system somewhere. But it's very interesting. You've got to think about this phenomenologically. 
Does the I of the Adlerian personality know that it has a superiority claim? Absolutely not. You do not know it. And according to Adler, the its purpose is not to know it. The whole idea is not to know it. The organism doesn't want to know it. Why does the organism not want to know it has a claim to superiority? Because then that would ruin it. See, Adler, Adler was very aware and very clear that human beings like to look better than they do. And uh, they do not like to have, this is a technical Adlerian phrase, uh, you know, the therapist tries to, this is a therapeutic technique, to spit in the individual soup. <laughs> yeah, that's the technical therapeutic technique for Adlerians, spitting in the soup. What does that mean? That means you expose the hidden superiority claim of the organism to the consciousness of the organism. We say, oh, by being a victim in your family, you seek to gain this advantage. Yeah. Oh, is that what I'm doing? Yeah. Uh, and so the Adlerians are always constantly, if you want a summary of Adlerian psychotherapy, it consists in that you're constantly exposing to the individual their hidden superiority claims and their behavioral results, behavioral expressions of their hidden superiority claims. And so what is the inner enemy? <clears throat> that the I of the person is struggling with uh, from an Adlerian point of view. What well, is very simple. The inner enemy is that superiority claim that you don't even know you've got that's destroying you and is destroying those around you because to the extent that you have this inner enemy, this hidden superiority complex in Adlerian thought, you are setting up your world vertically. You're acting out of a private logic which you are trying to force the entire world to cooperate with. Your whole goal is to be higher than other people. And your interest is in depreciating other people. So what does an Adlerian do? Well, they just they will they will spend a little bit of time with you, and they'll watch how much you depreciate yourself and others. And by the amount of depreciation you do, they will decide how crazy you are. It's very simple. They will look carefully at your capacity to cooperate as a fellow human being on common social pro-social task to the extent that the inner enemy, the hidden superiority complex and its claims, to the extent that that's got you without you knowing it, you will be acting out in antisocial ways, seeking to gain an advantage based on your private logic which makes possible your claim to superiority. That's the way it works. And everything Adlerians do can be explained by that. Every technique, every assumption about the self, every approach to changing it, all of their moral values. And so the moral psychology of Adlerian psychology is a psychology which seeks to expose the hidden infantile grandiosity just as you see it in Freud. Different structural approach. But there is an inner enemy, and the enemy is a childish grandiosity. Yes. Uh, it seems as though that requires their problems of putting that in context. Uh, uh, for example, how would an Adlerian deal with uh, a German who is cooperating with the Nazis? You see what I mean? Sure. They they would deal with it under the under the uh, under an elaboration of that rubric. They would interpret Nazism how? How would an Adlerian interpret Nazism? As a bogus claim to superiority. Right. And they would they would interpret the uh, uh, 
necessity for Nazis to depreciate, disparage, and destroy the Jews as uh, simply a result of their desire to do away with any other people that right. might be no, considered? That's, yeah. that's not what I mean. Okay. I mean, how would they evaluate an individual in that context? Yeah, well, they would just in, they would in, they would in, they would look at that, uh, and under the light that social groups can buy into private logics, and you they would consider a sort of the the Nazi Party, uh, and its ideology an affront to common uh, the common claims of consensual reality, uh, and they would uh, they would proceed uh, with the assumption that. Uh, that any ideology which which underlies sexism, racism, uh, anti-Semitism, etc., would have that as its engine. It would be uh, an attempt to maintain a bogus claim to superiority uh, in the face of the facts of uh, human fundamental human equality. That would be their view of that. Whether you agree with them or not, that, that that's a very interesting thing to study comparative psychopathology and look at the ways in which, indeed, the crazier you are, you can see that there are some claims to exemptions in there. You know, being exempt, being uh, uh, special, especially being special, Adlerians. Uh, uh, see this human quest for significance. It's almost like uh, we're all significance junkies from a, from an Adlerian point of view. And the, the, the desire to be more significant than thou fuels human pathology. And there again, uh, you, what can you say about the myth of Lucifer? Well, the myth of Lucifer... He wanted to be more significant than thou. Mm -hmm. See? It's a very uh, interesting kind of expression. How are we doing on time? What time is it? It's, it's okay. It's, uh, if we just take a look for just a moment at the necessity for the superiority complex to necessarily be accompanied by an attitude of depreciation of others. Yes. Why can't... It seems to me that it would be possible to disconnect those two and that the aspiration for superiority does not necessarily drive one to the denigration of the worth of others. Why do those, are those always connected? Or are they there, there is a difference in an Adlerian, I'm just articulating an Adlerian point of view. Uh, from an Adlerian point of view, it's one thing to seek to overcome one's obstacles uh, and one's limitations and one's... Uh, uh, for example, organ inferiorities, say you have a little bit bad hearing and so you want to become a concert pianist. Uh, so maybe you've had polio as a child and you want to become a track star, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the desire to overcome, you know, we shall overcome is sort of an Adlerian theme song. You know, that's, that captures their understanding of what humans are about. And so from an Adlerian point of view, there's nothing wrong with trying to overcome and to better oneself or to strive for, uh, for more beauty and truth, blah, 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 and so forth. But, see, there's a difference between a superiority complex and a desire to better oneself. And there's a difference between an inferiority complex and feelings of inferiority. Everyone has feelings of inferiority, according to Adlerian. But not everyone has an inferiority complex. See, you have a complex when you get into some claim to be inferior so that you can really secretly, like Nietzsche said, lord it over somebody in a manipulative, passive-aggressive way. See. Uh, so, so Adler is picking up on a lot of the stuff that Nietzsche saw long before Adler. That when people say, oh, gee, I'm just so stupid, you know, I can't do anything, so don't give me any more assignments. <laughs> Dude, I'll just screw it up. You don't believe me, just try. <laughs> Give it to her. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so the inferiority complex is basically manipulative. You know, you remember that book, Man the Manipulator, blah, blah, blah. Well, that's the sort of an Adlerian insight. 
And so the superiority complex is really always present with the inferiority complex. So you know you're oper you're an operator. You, you you're really you're really trying to put one over on someone. So when you're trying to put one something over on someone with a bogus claim to superiority, it's always a bogus claim. They're not talking about the fact that somebody may make a hundred and uh, uh, so points more on the GRE than you. That's not, you know, that's not the issue. Ac actual superiority on some measurable parameter is not what they're talking about. They're talking about a superiority, a bogus superiority claim that you will use any means to sustain. So it's not really a, a, an attack on people being superior. It's really an attack on uh, uh, bogus claims to uh, superiority to get out of social responsibility. I recommend Ansbacher and Ansbacher's book, Superiority and Social Interest, and their book, the uh, it's edited books of Adler's writing, and also the individual psychology of Alfred Adler, for a really excellent survey of Adler's thought. Uh, and remember, when I when I talk about the superiority complex as an inner enemy, uh, an Adlerian probably would not like my characterizing that that way. But if you think about the way an Adlerian talks about the struggle that I have as a person who's not had any therapy, and I haven't had any therapy, and I'm wondering why I cannot write any papers. I cannot write my papers. And you say to me, well, you know, you're not trying to write your paper. Well, I know I am trying. I am trying to write my papers. Something is keeping me from writing my papers. Because I, the only I that I can be responsible for is the I that I'm aware of. And so gradually what, what you would try to do is to help me see certain other things in me which I am not aware of, which are operating on me very powerfully. So I think it's fair just in terms of a phenomenology to say, well, there's something in me that's not helping me that I am not aware of. And it has a, it's very interesting, and it's very grandiose. It has a very grandiose claim. It is indeed very childish, not childlike. It is very childish, and it has to be exposed <clears throat> to the light of day before I'm going to get better from an Adlerian point of view. It has to be seen uh, before I'm going to let it go. Uh, any comments or questions about that before we take a break? Yes. It seems like this is pretty much where we left off last time when we were talking about denial. We yes. just touched on that just a little bit. The strength of denial. There's a common thread here of this the consciousness not being aware of uh, uh, or, or, and incapable of fighting this because you don't even realize. You don't know. See, that's the point I'm trying to get you to see. See, the, the I, see, this is all that we have is the I. I am not aware in the Freudian school, and I am not aware in the Adlerian, I am not aware of what's going on. And, you know, it's one thing to say, ah, well, this person, you know, they're just manipulative and blah, 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 blah. And, you know, a lot of people really get into being very punitive toward uh, uh, sick people. You notice this when you're in supervision groups. The snide way in which the students talk about the patient. It's almost like the patient sort of knows all this, and it's just kind of gold-breaking. When in fact, the patient doesn't know all this at all. The patient is trying to figure out what in the world is causing life to be so hard for them. You get inside their phenomenological life world, it is not at all uh, an experience of being manipulative. And even when you study Hitler's phenomenological life world. Inside Adolf Hitler's mind, he was not being antisocial. And until you understand that Hitler was trying to save the world from his in, in, from in there where he was, 
You can't understand the nature and dynamics of human evil. And it's precisely because of this capacity. Now, the ego just doesn't know. And that is a common thing in all of these things. Let's take about 10 minutes and we'll come back and deal with object relations theory. Let me say a little bit about object relations theorists. Uh, they, object relations theory really developed uh, in full flower in England. And it developed out of the work, particularly of the uh, influence of Melanie Klein and, uh, and that whole tradition of Kleinian work in England is very important and you should look into that sometime. It's, it's, it's almost, I mean, it's, Melanie Klein was a great genius in her sense of all this inner structure. She was, came out of the Freudian school. Anna Freud didn't like her too much. Uh, but uh, she was very much a member of the Freudian school and, and had creative ideas about inner psychological configurations and dispositions in the child that were not a result of simple socialization, parenting. And out of her work and a number of others, the this, this ob the sense of object relations came to be, and it was a study of the way in which inside the personality uh, organizations developed. Fancy that. Organizations developed within the psyche which had their own sort of autonomous functioning. And you could see this if you develop clinically that the eye to see what going what's going on with people, you would see these uh, little uh, systems and these structures uh, uh, bouncing around in there. Now you can see it and now you don't. Uh, uh, I often image this sometimes like a very large beach ball at the swimming pool. You know, uh, when it rolls up to the surface, uh, you can see it. And then it, you can, when it goes back under, you don't see it for a while. Uh, and that's the way these inner objects work. Now, and from a Freudian point of view, of course, they like to think about these as being based on early experiences of parental, <coughs> parental experience, experiences with the parent. But it's interesting that, uh, for example, you may have had a lot of toxic experiences with your mother or your father, but the interesting thing in object relations theory is that the toxic experiences tend to cluster together. And so, in other words, the inner m object of the bad mother begins to resemble that wicked woman in Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. And it takes on a negative power even far greater than any one experience with the mother or even the actual mother herself. So the toxic experience is organized and the positive experience is organized. And in the child psyche, you get these islands of experience. The islands of good me and good mommy or good me and good nurturing one, and bad me and bad nurturing one. And so you have this, you have these islands of experiencing developed in the psyche, and of course the task of the personality is gradually to bring those together. So you know that the bad mommy and the good mommy are really the same person. And they tell us that this child gets very depressed when they figure that out. Think about that. Because you kept thinking that maybe the queen would come, the good one would come back and rescue you from this bitch. <laughs> <laughs> but then you realize, oh no, it's really her too. <laughs> you know? So the kid is depressed for a long time, <laughs> needs a child psychoanalyst, that's the theory. Uh, needs to go play in the sand tray or something, you know. But anyway, so you get so you get a sense about uh, an increasing sense in this tradition of thought about these inner organizations that are that they that they're influenced by and grounded in experiences with actual people out there, but they take on a life of their own in the psyche. And remember, they are not the I. And in Winnicott's sense, they're not the true self. 
So increasingly, these people today, there are people like Kernberg and others that are very outstanding uh, students of this, you know, Masterson, Kernberg, others. But they have this wonderfully keen sense when they're working with someone, they can tell when the, these, these toxic inner objects are constellated, when they're organized, when they're dominating the person, when they're attacking the person. And uh, uh, the strategies of healing used for these people are strategies to help the eye of that person cope with those things inside. So, in effect, they don't talk about it this way, but, but if you can see, the more you study, you can see what they're trying to do is to help that person protect themselves, not from the outer parents. The outer parents may be bad, but they're not the really dangerous ones. The really dangerous ones are the ones that are set up on the inside that you never know when they're coming in the back door. You never know when these killer parents of the unconscious are going to come in the back door and move in on you and have you start feeling suicidal. You never know. You can't control it. And so the therapy uh, done by an object relations oriented psychoanalyst or psychoanalytic psychotherapist is, is to begin to help that individual build shielding for all practical purposes, shielding between the true I-ness of that human individual and these things that are trying to kill them from within. See? So you can see the relationship of this to that early Freudian understanding of the sadistic or really, really sadistic, primitive uh, superego. Very similar, except they're much more sophisticated. In a way, they're more Jungian. Why are they more Jungian? Because they've discovered complexes. Think of what an enormous leap it is when you discover complexes. Because once you discover complexes, and we'll get into this more next week, once you discover complexes, you realize that this poor individual that you're dealing with, that their biggest enemies aren't out there. And you can't go inside their head to stop the attacks. Somehow you have got to become a Merlin or a trainer and you've got to be able to teach the person how to know when this thing is coming. How do you know when this thing is coming is, is getting close to you and beginning to make you depressed? How can you fight back against it? And another way to think about it, and, and, and the Freudians are wonderful at this, much better than other schools, how can you use me to help you? How can you use our relationship to help you defend against the attacks of these things. Now, they don't talk that way, but if you look carefully at what they actually try to do in their therapy, they're trying to, they're trying to help the individual protect themselves against these toxic inner realities and to get stronger with life-giving relationships in the outer world so that the life-giving relationships in the outer world will help the individual be strong enough to resist these inner attack, inner attackers. See? Now, for those of you that have studied the union stuff and not, and, and not the object relations theory, you just need to understand that it's complex theory. And the difference is, again, the Freudians tend to see... You need, you need to have Freudian and Adlerian psychology to be a responsible union. Why? Because it was Freud and Adler that did the psychology of the shadow, of the really ugly stuff. And once you understand that, then you can translate the Freudian and Adlerian stuff into Jungian conceptuality, but keep the understanding of these destructive parts, destructive complexes within 
Now, we Jungians, remember, we talk about negative mother complex or negative father complex, or we clean it up and we say, well, this is the negative synax. Sounds kind of nice, negative synax. Doesn't really sound very bad, does it? <laughs> negative synax, you know. But if you understand that the negative synax is this killer father in your head that wants you dead, <clears throat> then that's a little different picture. Or as John, as John Giannini is fond of talking about in his lectures, if you understand, you talk about the pu'er, pu'er within and so forth, but if you're like John, you say you talk about the killer child, you know that there's an inner organization in there that's a killer child that would like to wreak some mayhem on you and others, then uh, then it's a little more realistic picture. So these object relations people, uh, in terms of that, that sense of the uh, interjection, is very important for understanding anything about an enemy within that's not the I. And what you have to do a lot with people in therapy, again, in all these schools, you have to help them understand that they are not really the author of all this self-hate that what they think is self-hate is coming from learnings that they had that are set up with an autonomy of their own, and they have to learn how to defend themselves against this stuff. Now, before leaving that, I wanted to say just a word about the so-called anti-libidinal ego, which I find to be a very interesting concept. And uh, it's in this tradition of Febron and Guntrip who are very interesting British object relations theorists. Now, in the theory of the anti-libidinal ego, it's, very, it's a very interesting little clinical concept. And, it's, and it was developed to deal with a clinical phenomenon that a therapist notices. What is it? Well, you're working with someone. <coughs> They're getting better. And in every area of their life, they're making progress. And then all of a sudden, when you make a significant change, a movement, a turn of corner, the person goes out and does something extremely self-destructive right after having made this significant progress in therapy. You know, I've gotten to the point now in my work with somebody that I'll say, look, uh, you're probably going to have a counterattack when you, when you make this turn. So do not be surprised if you have a fairly scary regression right after you make a big movement forward. I mean, maybe you won't, but don't be surprised and don't, don't assume. Don't assume <clears throat> this means that your progress is all a fraud just because you have a short, intense regression right after some progress. This is based on this understanding of the antilobidinal ego. That is, there, in the theory, there is a part of the, of the self that is split off from the waking eye that does not want to get any better. It wants to die. It wants the therapist to die. <laughs> it hates the therapist. If it can find a way to defeat the therapist, it will. And you see this particularly in people that have had problems in relationships. And what you will notice is they, they say they've had terrible series of relationships. And they suddenly, they get involved with somebody that really may be a, a relationship that may go somewhere. So it starts getting good, gets a little better, gets a little better, gets a little better, start thinking about getting married. Yeah, they're going to get married. And then... 
all hell breaks loose. <laughs> and some little something is allowed to be a justification for terminating the relationship. Now, that in itself is something you see a lot, so you wouldn't think much about it, except that these British object relations theorists noted something, that it was a repetition compulsion, that there was a pattern of this. They call it the in and out program. And they noticed that there was this sector in the self which when things got going too well and looked like there might be love in the world, this thing attacked it with a vicious attack and put an end to the relationship like this. And it comes so fast and so top in, in such a vicious manner that it, it's, it's experienced like it came out of left field. It's like the person didn't see it coming. And, and it's wonderful. You know, weddings are wonderful things for people that don't want to get married. <laughs> you know, think about that one. Think about that one. I mean, you know, weddings were invented by people that want to mess up people's relationships by, by bringing the family and friends into this. <laughs> <laughs> because it offers this antilibidinal ego all these wonderful opportunities, you know, because, uh, you know, you can get your feelings hurt because of the way that you treated my sister or the way you treated my mother or the way you treated my dad or the way you treated Judy, my friend, or the way you treated Jim. There's unlimited opportunity. And, of course, the, uh, the envious and hateful part in the friends and the family uh, don't want this relationship to work anyway. <laughs> it's just almost always the case. Just watch it. I mean. And so it's a wonderful opportunity for this little antilobidinal ego to figure out it sits back in a way and then it goes, Tump, and the thing goes to heaven. It's a fascinating thing, and these object relation theorists watch this, and they describe it in the literature. You can, you can read the literature on this sort of thing, and what they see in it is a, a, a part that is split off and hates relationship, doesn't want the individual to have any, any experiences of love, and they, they speculate on why this is. And the Freudians are always speculating on how this all got set up because of the bad mother. You know, <laughs> Ma, well, well, what she did is really caused this, you know. But, uh, but, but they're always trying to figure out exactly how this got set up, but that, that it's set up and that it's there and that it's real and that it has enormous firepower and it knows just when to shoot is, is fascinating. And so uh, when you, when you uh, fight dirty and do sort of street therapy like I do, uh, you warn people about this. You say, well, now, I don't want to be a naysayer, but uh, now, as closer we get to the wedding, I want you to uh, be real careful about letting people play spoiler, or you play spoiler, and uh, work on this sort of thing. Because this, this type of reality is amazing. And if you think about the people that didn't get married, uh, uh, you can read about Linda Leonard's thing on the way to the wedding. It talks a little bit about stuff like this. But so this antilobidinal ego uh, is described in a phenomenology by these Freudians uh, as, a, as an inner, split-off, active, very agentic aspect which is trying to destroy the therapy and all meaningful relationships and would really like the person to suicide. So uh, if you have some understanding of that, then when you're doing therapy with someone, particularly with someone that does have some suicidal uh, uh, motifs, uh, then you have a sense that uh, if you understand that, then you can be more compassionate with the eye of the person. If you don't have any sense of this, then you're going to get very irritated with your suicidal patients. See, there are so many people that don't, they may believe in an unconscious, but when it comes right down to relating to their patients, they act as if the unconscious did not exist. So they're going to get mad at the patient for coming in suicidal. Don't call me anymore, goddamn. <laughs> 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 kind of 
But if you understand, if you understand this object, you know, listen, you you got to sit around therapists and listen to them talk about their patients. And when you do, you you notice this naive pre-Freudian attitude toward patients that emerges as soon as they get together and tell each other how tired they are. Because immediately this in, this sense of the unconscious really being, the things in the unconscious really being out to get this patient of theirs. They, they lose touch with that, totally. And then they start to have this sort of, uh, uh, what theologians would call a uh, sort of a Pelagian uh, attitude toward the psyche. You know, well, this person, anything wrong with this person is their own fault. You know, this person really, well, it was a will. They willed it. Okay, so now let me finish up by talking a little bit about self-psychology and the way the grandiose self-organization uh, Yes. Why does somebody uh, interject that way, maybe the voice track, and another person is not? Is there a function of ego strength? So? Well, there's a lot of theories about that, and that gets us into Kohut, see, because uh, Kohut is uh, a person that... Uh, he would look at that same phenomenon, and he would he would not he he would he would see this as a result of of person having had self objects read that significant uh, others parents chiefly who were not appropriately empathic to them and so frustrating to them that the rage, the narcissistic rage, built up to such a degree that it was too radioactive to maintain awareness of, so it splits off. And so what you get is this radio, this radioactive place in the psyche that the eye, again, is not aware of. See, to the extent that we're narcissistically wounded in Kohut's theory, uh, somebody you really ought to know, <laughs> To the extent that you're narcissistically wounded, you're carrying in the unconscious of incredibly powerful narcissistic rage that most of the time you will not be aware of and that when other people slight you or you perceive them as slighting you, that you may feel in flashes. If you're fairly well organized, you will feel it in flashes. If you're not very well organized, you will beat the hell out of them. <laughs> <laughs> and then you will wonder, well, now, gee, what came over me? <laughs> sorry. <laughs> yeah, I'm really sorry, honey. <laughs> But uh, here again, according to Kohut, according to Kohut, when a child comes into the world, the child has this sense of primary narcissism, a sense, this sense of, you know, um, you know if, if they have a really good relationship with the mothering one, then they have this fusion with this great object, and they can participate in it. And uh, the mother-child field is wondrous. It's just numinous. You don't, they don't use that word, but that's the only way to describe it. I mean, the, the, the infant and... It's just a, an infant mother field, and it's all like, it's just, God, we are wonderful. You know. And if the developmental process goes optimally, then the child who is way up here on, uh, on this grandiosity is gradually let down to human size through optimum frustration, they call it. That's their technical word. Optimum frustration, that is, you let, let down just little bit. Every time the child realizes that when when I want you, you don't come immediately. See, if I, when, when I want you and you're there, I got the idea that I got you there. Magical thinking, see. 
But the whole developmental pattern is a gradual letting down off of little Lord Fauntleroy's enormous high chair. Now, what happens if the parent says, oops, excuse me. <laughs> well, if, you, if there are too many of these, oops, well, the grandiosity doesn't go away. And the greatness that was up here doesn't come down here and be human. What happens in self-psychology is, I mean, their, their understanding of this is, that the grandiosity that was up here goes over here. It splits off. And there's this very nice child that sits here. But the grandiosity is still up there. And it's still as raw and powerful as it ever was. And when I am 45 or 46 years old, my little Lord Fauntleroy is now a jolly green giant. <laughs> <laughs> and you better relate to the jolly green giant right. Uh -huh. Because if you do not rate, relate to the jolly green giant correctly, he will step on you. See? So there is this grandiose exhibitionistic self. And here again, if you're really narcissistically wounded, here again is the key. You don't know about it. If you're a narcissistic personality disorder and you have identified with this grandiose exhibitionistic self, fairly much in your ego, it's still you don't experience it as a grandiose self. It's your job to adore me. Just the way things are. I'm not grandiose. I'm just wonderful. And if you can't see that, it's proof of what a stupid student you are. This is called a graduate professor. <laughs> <laughs> if you can't see how brilliant I am and that you really should write your dissertation on what I'm doing, and let me publish it under my name. <laughs> then you are really very stupid and shouldn't be in this graduate program at all. Any of you who've been PhD students understand this one. But anyway, so the, the grandiose self-organization, if it is optimally frustrated, if the Cohutians are real optimistic, much more optimistic than Jungians, they think it can be transmuted and internalized. It means that slowly it comes down and it interjects and builds up into self-esteem and structure and it comes down and gradually I get more structure and it comes down and gradually and finally I just feel good about myself and I have these ambitions and all these things and I'm not, there's not this grandiosity in me anymore. I've been analyzed. I have had a good Freudian cohesion analysis. And now I am free of my grandiosity, right? Everybody that's ever met a Freudian analyst knows that. <laughs> you hear that, fellows? <laughs> no more grandiosity. They've been analyzed, and there's no more grandiose self or no, no more grandiose exhibitionistic self in the Freudians. They've been analyzed. Now, next week we'll find that Jungians. Uh, can't do away with that. They're not as good. <laughs> Can't do away with this archetypal self organization. See? But uh, from the from the cohesion point of view, it's possible to get that just built up right into your skeletal psychic structures. But since most people can't afford analysis at uh, you know the price it's going for now, then most people have this split off thing. Now, let me talk just a minute about what it does to you. It does the same thing to you as Freud's superego does to you, punitive superego. It, it also does to you uh, what Freud's id did to you. That is to say, the grandiose self-organization wants more sex. It wants more booze. It wants more dope. It wants more money. It wants more success. It wants more degrees. 
It wants more time. And et cetera, and just goes on. It wants more everything. And when you don't give it to it, you're shit. That's just the way it is. And of course, since it always is escalating its demands of you, you're always behind. <laughs> See? You're always behind. It always escalates the demands. It doesn't matter how many books you think because you write your next book that you're going to be satisfied with yourself. But see, the grandiose self-organization in you has a different idea. When you publish your next book, it's going to say to you, <clears throat> you know, that one was not as good as the first one. <laughs> the novelist problem. That one was not as good as the first one. And you're probably not going to be able to even write another one. <laughs> Besides that, they're laughing at me anyway. <laughs> Wait a little reviews come out. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's always saying, what do you know? And, uh, and this thing, the interesting thing about it, the more you learn about it, the way the, the self-psychologists think about it, it's inexorable pressure. It never stops. It's not like you push back against it and you stop it for today, tomorrow you get up and it's gone. Or it's still there where you left it. Uh, you push it back here, you take your hand away, it comes back. You go, you push it back, it comes back. It's like... Uh, uh, it always wants you to have more appointments. See? It always wants you to take on more jobs. It always wants you to look better. It always wants you to have sharper clothes. And then when you buy them, it criticizes the way you look in them. <laughs> <laughs> it always wants you to lose more weight. And gets you before the mirror. And it always wants you to notice the places where you still haven't done enough sit ups. And you're running 30 miles a week, but it wants you to run 35. And there are a lot of urban professional yuppies that are, that are, that are without knowing it, totally dominated by this thing, see? And, uh, and it, is, it is an inner organization, and it's constantly pressuring you. And the only way an individual can, can uh, uh, according to the self-psychologist, what you do is you gradually, every, if you have a therapist that can help you understand the way this thing is working in you, the way that the grandiose self-organization is really that it's not really you, it's really the grandiose self-organization that's driving you to be a workaholic, then you can, because the therapist has warned you about the presence of this inner enemy, forewarned is forearmed, and so at least when the pressure comes, you can say to yourself, well, yeah, there it is again. There's the grandiosity again. And, the, and a gradually an individual can say, well, I know the grandiosity wants me to say yes to this offer. But you see, I, there's beginning differentiation. I know that the grandiosity wants me to say yes, but I know that the human eye, you know, the, the eye that wants to have a life, needs to say, no, I'm going hiking this weekend. Or, no, I'm going to take my wife or my husband out. We're going to go out. We're going to play. See, the grandiose self-organization, when you play, what? <laughs> what does it want when you play? What does it want from you? Think about it. When you go on a vacation, what does it want? Bad time. Well, they want you to have a perfect time. Right? Orgasms at least 14 times a day, or your sex life is terrible. <laughs> See? And when you go out, when you go out to, the, to the music at the local joints, then, you know, 
the, the grandiose self-organization is comparing this group to the one that there was there last year. Anything to spoil your enjoyment. <laughs> you know, you know. And, uh, and so it wants you, it, all it wants is for you to have a perfect vacation. <coughs> of course, that ruins it totally. But uh, the, uh, the person who is forewarned about what's going on with this thing within can, can stand up against it. Now, standing up against it, according to the Freudians, I mean, according to the Cohutians, they don't call themselves Freudians, but they are, uh, what, they, what they see is over a long period of therapy, underlying long, you will gradually transmute and internalize this, and you will have an increasing structurization in your self-structure so that you will not need all this grandiosity. And you will feel self-esteem, and you will not need this godlike perfection of the people. And that's the goal, that you sort of assume your uh, goodness, and you go on and do your work and enjoy your life and have and live with some zest. And there's a lot to what they do, what they what they say and do. Yeah, okay, let's open it up now. I've got my wrap out and we can just discuss it. How many more minutes do we got? Five, ten. Okay, yeah. Uh, there seems to be something grandiose about about believing that you can overcome this this uh, this condition. <laughs> 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 I mean is, is there some danger in that that, that you know, oh I, I'm, I'm past that. Well, you know, that's... Thank you for throwing that over this way. Uh, well, see, from a Jungian point, we'll talk about this next week, the difference in a Jungian point of view and a self-psychology point of view. There are a lot of people today that want to make self-psychology and Jungian... Freudian self-psychology and Jungian psychology is sort of the same thing. That's, and I'm not one of those. I think there's a radical difference between them because of this very point. Uh, as we'll see next week, uh, Jungians don't think you ever get rid of this sort of God complex. And we do, in fact, feel like it's stupid to think you can. Because if you think you can, if you think you've succeeded, then you are the most blind. <laughs> Uh, and uh, so the so the in our view the analyst that thinks that they have transcended their grandiosity is the most dangerous analyst in the world <coughs> because that analyst will then act out in a grandiose way because all the grandiosity has gone in the shadow it's not out where you can see it the grandiosity is uh, you know, think about it like uh, like the New Testament thing about uh, Satan, except Jesus was uh, supposed to say, get thee behind me, Satan. Uh, from a Jungian point of view, you'd say, get out here in front of me so I can see you and uh, I can relate to my grandiosity consciously so as to try to protect myself and others from it. And so I think uh, that, 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 see, it really matters what you think theoretically on these things. Because if you really believe you can do away with that, uh, then you will have this fantasy that some human beings have now become benign. See? And uh, as we shall see next time when I'm talking about the Jungian concept of the archetypal self uh, and uh, the concomitant sense of the archetypal shadow, that humans never become benign. They never stop being dangerous. It seems like the danger would be that you would look on other, you would be, feel yourself superior to other human beings because you no longer have this. Yes. And that, in a sense, yes. would be your, your grandiosity and you would not be in touch with this and could not be compassionate. This would be, this would be humble people. All humble people are manifestations of that. The person who's not arrogant is an example of that. See? And uh, so uh, uh, it really raises a question in the psychology of religion about uh, humility as virtue. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because again, with Nietzsche, you say, show me somebody that's coming on humble. Look out. 
good. But isn't the definition of humility to know one's true self? Mm-hmm. It's neither up nor down. Well, that's a neat definition of humility, but it's not one that's been popular in uh, Western religious traditions or Eastern religious traditions because there's a lot of posturing around uh, being harmless uh, in a lot of those traditions. And so uh, if that is, I think that would be a nice definition of a contemporary a contemporary understanding informed by psychoanalytic theory of what humility would be. It would be more like, uh, I'd like to say that humility is knowing your limitations and getting the help that you need. And that's it. There isn't anything else. And if you know your limitations, uh, then you will try to get some help, probably. And it's the narcissism that thinks, I mean, the grandiosity doesn't need any help. I mean, you can almost tell how somebody, how, how well somebody's doing with regard to their narcissism by how much help they ask for. particularly if they ask for somebody that's really powerful enough to help them. You know, I know a lot of people who will always choose a therapist that they think they're smarter than or that they think they can defeat. Uh, and uh, then they can complain about the person to everybody and not get better. But, uh, but knowing your limitations and getting the help you need if you can do that, the grandiosity is in hand. You've got some handle on it. But in summary, I mean, you can look at all these theories, and they and they don't really talk about the enemy within. That's too mythic. But if you use that cool combat myth and talk about the, the enemy, what is the enemy, and you study these uh, anthropological traditions on evil, it's very interesting that the way they describe uh, evil is in a way that if you just use phenomena, if you just describe phenomenolo- phenomenologically what people are talking about, there are these things which are not of the eye and they attack the human individual, sometimes being able to convince the human individual that the eye is really the author of the faults or the feelings or the behavior. And I think it's very intriguing to look back at these other schools of thought and to look at the, these, uh, these uh, concepts in, in this frame that we're talking about. We've got a minute. Any other comments or questions before we stop? Yeah. I just wanted to ask, uh, what is the, uh, the opposite of grandiosity if you have a person who doesn't feel the pressure of being successful he's always going to the ball game or yeah. to the beach and stuff what is that called well they have they have this sense of attention between uh, between the grandiose self-organization and uh, and a depleted depressed self and uh, but they're always in tension in relationship to each other it's like if the grandiosity is strong enough, see it doesn't mean that you come on like a narcissistic personality disorder you can come on as a person that doesn't take yourself seriously at all. But that can equally well be the grandiosity because the grandiosity is so intimidating that you don't try anything. You just say, well, it's useless for me really to try anything, so I'll just play. Uh, I can never really amount to anything. I'll just play. My life is really never going to be very significant, so I will just uh, collect uh, bumper stickers. You know, there are a lot of people that live their lives. I'm not going to be significant, so I will just do something to pass my time. And you show me a person that thinks they're not going to be significant or thinks the in which the I feel that it's not significant, I'll show you an individual that's under attack by the grandiose self-organization. Because any time an individual does not feel their own importance and their own significance, they are responding to a potential attack, envy attack. You find all these people that try to keep a low profile. Who me? I'm not significant. Don't notice me. Nothing here. No one here. <laughs> Nobody in here. You don't have to be jealous of me. You don't have to envy me. 
I'm not going to ever be anything. You don't need to worry about me. I'm not going to speak up. And uh, you don't assume that there's no grandiosity there. What you assume is that this person has got a lot of grandiose self-organization, untransformed, that they project on other people and then fear them because they turn them into the gods and goddesses and they wait for the cursing comment, you know, the eye of the curse. If I, gain, if I get the attention of someone and then I've projected the goddess on them and, then they, and I make a comment and, and then they say, that was stupid, then it's not just another person, another human saying I'm stupid. I have projected the goddess on you and you say I'm stupid and forevermore it is etched in my flesh with divine tattoos, stupid. <laughs> so I quit school after you say that to me. Uh, so it's a very subtle business, and just because a person is not doesn't come off as arrogant does not mean they're not afflicted by the grandiose self-organization. It may mean that they've had enormous struggles with it, and they're trying to keep from waking it up. They don't want to run into it. Mr. Dalcomoni was in prison. Particularly bad when the parents' grandiose self organization are very, very raw and primitive. And any time the child tries to manifest a true self, they get attacked. So the parents still carry all the God projections, and the little true self of the person tries to keep hidden. Like, you know, in these horror films. It's the little child that's scurrying around mm -hmm. in the air ducts. An alien. Yeah, mm -hmm. scurrying around in the air ducts, trying not to be noticed by the grandiose thing that lurks. <laughs> See? No. Okay, now review your union stuff for next week, particularly the concepts of the archetypal self, and I'm going to try to confuse matters as much as possible. See you next week. Last week we talked about uh, different different ways that you could use uh, that you would look at psychoanalytic theories, non-Jungian psychoanalytic theories, to think about the enemy within. Uh, since these other theories don't have any sense, so don't have any theory of our, the archetypal, that issue doesn't raise. That, that issue doesn't come up about whether is this personal or is this archetypal. Uh, <clears throat> You just get some sense, as we looked last week, that all is not friendly within the psyche. Uh, that it's pretty much agreed uh, in a lot of these theories that uh, there are a lot of uh, toxic entities uh, inside the psyche that are not the I or not the so-called true self. The individual, and that the that the ego or the I or the true self with a little s of an individual is under attack a lot. And as you been thinking about your own experience uh, this week, this last two weeks, trying to disidentify with the voice in you that really thinks you ought to die, then uh, you can get a sense for that. There is, uh, there's always this accuser, this attacking voice within that, uh, is impatient with you and perfectionistic, above all perfectionist, uh, and is constantly criticizing you and attacking you for your shortcomings. Uh, with Jungian thought, you have a different kind of, you get an expansion of discussion. It's not just a question of are there uh, aspects in the psyche that are not particularly friendly, but you might say it this way. Are these, as the Freudians would put it, all in projects? Are they... You can see in that word the, 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 the Freudian assumption. In, what is an in project? Something that comes from the outside in. Yeah. You, the assumption, if you use the word introject, toxic introject, means, well, you know, I've got this inner negative mother complex for you, might say. And how did I get it? 
Well, I had this toxic mother. And she abused me and abused me and abused me and abused me and I internalized that and I internalized that and I internalized that and I set this thing up inside as a as an interject as the object relates to this I have a, a negative internal object a toxic internal object now. So the Freud assumption is that's an interject I took it in from the outside. Well According to Kleinians and Jungians, that may not necessarily be the case. It may not necessarily be so that it was taken in from the outside. It may be that some aspect of it may have already been inside. And that, you can look at it this way, it may be that there was a image, an image, or a structure, or a configuration, an archetypal pattern, which organized the experience. Mm-hmm. Put it this way, it might even have turned up the toxicity, amplified the toxicity. Um, that's the question. Now, that would be the question if we were going to differentiate from Freud. It's also the question. See, because we could also say this would also be related to the Jungian concept of the personal chef. Because Jungians also are interested in doing a uh, reductive analysis of the developmental pattern. But uh, it is not a non-Jungian idea to look at the actual childhood of the person, their actual developmental experiences, to see what happened to them, see what kind of relationship with the historical mother and father they had, to get some sense about the patterns of development that they had, and to get some sense about what, therefore, might be split off from the conscious ego. And as you know, in any given family, there will be different things that will be split off because the parents can stand, some parents can stand more of this and others can stand more of that, but there's no set of parents that can stand everything. (laughs) So, uh, So as you compare notes with your friends, uh, different things in the context of the family crucible get split off into the personal shadow because of those particular parents. And we usually think of those things as having a lot to do with the personal shadow. Now, the question always comes up in Jungian circles, is the shadow evil? And, of course, the quick response that people often have on that is, who have not studied this stuff very much, will say, well, yes, you know, it's, it's, the, it's the dark side of the personality. It's the, uh, it is the part that leads you to act out and do this and do that. But, of course, once you study the basic Jungian rap on this, it becomes evident, very clear, that you cannot in any way whatsoever equate the personal shadow with evil cannot be done. Now, why is that? Somebody tell me. Why uh, Why do unions not assume that the personal shadow is evil? I mean, there's some pretty clear reasons. For well, that. whatever is split off is not necessarily <clears throat> evil in the you know, sociological way, right? It, it, it may be just because of the parents' particular set of values. Right. Now, give me some example of something that might be split off that might not be at all evil. That might be in the shadow, personal shadow, that might be at all, but not, not at all be evil. 
Enthusiasm. Enthusiasm. It's a mo- one of the most common things hmm. that is in the personal shadow that is clearly not evil is enthusiasm. You know, this sort of joyful exuberance that comes when you've really adequately dealt with your Oedipal complex. Joyful feeling of your own striving for fulfillment. It's like I like to think, you know, if you don't have a sense of your own joyful exuberance, then there's because of the edible business, a lot of that is in the shadow. It's in the personal shadow. And it needs to come out. It needs to be integrated into the ego so that you can feel really good about yourself. To the contrary, if it's repressed, it would be evil because of enthusiasm and death for life. That's right. That's a very good point. Now, let me repeat that so you get... She's saying that it would be precisely evil for that part of you to be repressed and split off. That would be the evil part. Now, I want you to hold on to that because that's an important point that ought to help us differentiate, I think, between archetypal shadow and personal shadow. Because in my own formulation of this, and I don't want you to think that my formulation of this is in any sense uh, a... uh, accepted Jungian formulation. I'm just trying to think about this stuff. So what you're getting is my current thinking on it. Uh, but I think it, that you would would be helped to think about the archetypal shadow as that part in your personality which would like to keep that repressed. So hang on to that and bring that up a little bit when we get into talking more about the archetypal shadow because it's an important distinction that I seldom ever hear anybody make. Talking about the evil of the splitting off of this part of the psyche. And you can just elaborate that. Think about a lot of the other things that people split off that are, for most part, very good. Yes. Could you give a quick example of how uh, enthusiasm is in one personal shadow? How it could, how it could, okay. how it could get there? Right. Oh, it's very simple. Every time when you're a little boy, you show it, <clears throat> you get a very caustic response from your parents. You're getting too big for your britches. <laughs> Why don't you keep your feet on the ground? Uh, if a parent has dealt enough with these issues, then when the child is showing that exuberant, joyful uh, enthusiasm, the parent doesn't have to kill it. But all too many parents, I think it's far more than the majority, when they see that, it really makes them uncomfortable. And they hate the child. Well, the child is really good. It's fine as long as it does not take too much attention away from me. When it starts taking too much attention away from me and make demand for mirroring on me, then I have to sit on it. Yeah. Could you give an example of the edible stuff that you have to overcome that would help you to feel pleasant? <clears throat> That'd be a whole lot well, I think I can give it a sense. No, it's a simple. It's very simple. I think I know, it's I really know. very simple. I mean, this ethical <laughs> stuff is the Freudian Freud was genius, and he was right about this. It's not the Oedipal complex, both Electra and uh, the masculine version, is not the only complex, by me, but it is so widespread that you're that we do ill to, to ignore it. And it's really quite simple. It's like if the parent of your same sex is comfortable enough with their sexuality and their mm-hmm. ex- exhibitionism and their aggression, 
so that when the child of the same sex shows theirs, mm -hmm. they kind of proud. <laughs> if the parent is kind of, yeah, there's my daughter. She's a chip off the old block. Or that's my son. He's a chip off the old block. It's that version in the New Testament. You know, thou art my beloved daughter or son in whom I am well pleased. You little original thing. <laughs> 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 look out, girls! Look out, boys! You know, or something. <laughs> and some parents, some parents are able to do that, you know, and to, to not get too stimulated by it. So, you know, to not, to, to not, you know, overstimulate the child, but by keeping him kind, of, kind of feeling good about it himself. But if the parent really never got enough parenting. From their own, they never got enough mirroring from their own parents. Then they got this enormous longing for this kind of celebration from the parent. And if they had this enormous longing for for a celebration for the parents that they did not get, then when the child comes out with something that should be celebrated, then the immediate threat is that I'm going to become aware of my longing. And I'm going to become aware of my grief over the fact of, about the way my parents responded to me. The fact that they cursed me rather than blessing me. And rather than become conscious of that, that is, rather than become conscious of my identification with this exuberant child, I'm going to squelch that child out there just like I'm squelching the exuberant child in here. So that then, I by by squelching my my edible child out there, I don't have to deal with my own pain about the way my own zest for life was met among my parents. And so you see, this is insidious. This is really demonic. You know, you can see that how demonic this business is because it just it just puts this uh, pain away. And where it becomes more and more toxic in the adult. So how does he get rid of it? Well, you know, most a lot of people don't ever get rid of it. <laughs> but uh, but uh, the 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 working through of learning to feel comfortable with one's power, one's eros. Is is a big order. It takes a lot of work to get comfortable with that, so that it's joyful. And uh, so that that's a big issue. But let's let's stay with this issue about personal archetypes. See, the, so the personal shadow contains that part of the healthy human self which has had to be denied because of. The, the felt threats of the parents. The parents' own feeling threatened and the child's uh, quite rightly thinking it's not safe to appear. It's not safe for me to appear fully. And uh, Kohut and the self-psychologist just like to point out that people don't have as much trouble with the Oedipal stage and Oedipal conflicts if their parents have pretty healthy self structures. Because the healthier the parents' self structures are, the less upset they will be at this shining of the child. And the less they will need to be a vampire and uh, suck the life out of the child's uh, life force. And they will also not be so overstimulated by it that they will have to uh, use the child's sexuality for their own gratification. They can, they can sort of parent the child. The child needs containment because, they, you know, the exuberance, you can't just let it run, run amok. You have to kind of contain it and channel it. And, uh, 
do all sorts of parenting things with it. But uh, but that is personal shadow materials. Now the question is, what about this archetypal shadow business? Well, let's start with a concept that is not talked about very much. Almost never. You almost never hear anybody talk about this, but it's a concept in Jung. And it's called the spirit of power. The spirit. The spirit complex. Now, a spirit complex, according to Jung, and this is my own definition of this, is a complex which is not personal, never was personal, will never be personal, and should never be treated as if it were personal. That is to say, you should never try to integrate it when you run into it. When you run into it in your dreams, when you run into it in any kind of psychic experience, or when you run into it in any kind of religious experience, or I would add, when you run into it in any kind of ritual experience, or or uh, experience in uh, in the uh, public sector. Uh, I'll talk about Satanism in a, in a minute in this context. But what would the spirit complex be? Well, there are a lot of them. But you might think about Christ in this context. You might think about Satan in this context. Or you could think about angelic presences, or you could think about uh, any number of numinous images or imagos in the psyche. Uh, if you study the history and phenomenology of religion, you deal with what are known as hierophanies manifestations of the sacred, which are kratophanies, which are manifestations of power. Now, in the ancient world, all these kratophanies and hierophanies were considered sacred and therefore taboo. And you did not touch them. Uh, as in the Ark of the Covenant, in the... Uh, Hebrew scriptures, you, you touch these things at risk of your life. The numinous in its stark power is not to be touched. Remember the story of Moses on Mount Sinai. All that stuff about you are not to see the face of God. All of that business. All that business. Put off your shoes. Place you stand as holy ground. All of the traditional uh, tribal cultures understanding the complete understanding of taboo. Read uh, Mary Douglas's book Purity and Danger. All of this anthropology around taboo is related to spirit complexes. It's related to those contents in the ancient world. They were experienced as being out here. But they're really psychic contents. They're psychological contents. They're really contents of the unconscious, but they're experienced in projection, projected form. But the idea is that the ego cannot stand contact with this. That if the ego comes into contact, let us say, with the numinosum, if it comes into direct contact with it, it will be destroyed. Now, you've got to be careful about this because, you see, when you listen to Jung talk, sometimes he will make statements like, it is always the numinosum which heals. 
Well, it would. It, the, she says, "Are you saying that the ego would suffer inflation?" Well, that's what it would. Have, that's what it would suffer first, and then it would suffer a rapid deflation, <laughs> like pop. Is that that phrase? Things fall apart at the center cannot hold. It. Yes, I think so. Uh, except uh, the the dynamics underlying that are not made very clear in that. I mean, I think that Eliot had this, you know, uh, really deep sense of things having already fragmented in modern in modernity. He didn't lay out why, but it's very interesting. See, in modern culture, Jung thought that modern culture was inherently unstable. Because what had happened was that the world of the sacred had collapsed into the human world. In effect, what has happened is that spirit complexes have started, have collapsed into the human interactional realm. Uh, in other words, the secularization process is not as benign as modernists think it is. There's a direct relationship between secularization and virulent pathological narcissism. Direct one-to-one -one relationship between. And, uh, but we're getting ahead of ourselves a little bit. So if you stay with this, a spirit complex, and it doesn't, it can't, it's not just Christ and Satan in terms of these traditional imagos, although you can see it very clearly here. Because in, uh, in, in severe psychopathology, prior to antipsychotic medications, you used to see a lot of people who were uh, possessed by one or the other of these spirit complexes. Individuals who... Uh, clearly, the eye is no longer present, and there is an entity there that talks like it thinks it's Christ. Just recently, uh, one of my students was telling me about going on this retreat with a group of people, and uh, and uh, by the end of the retreat, this one fellow student uh, was confiding to the group that he was Christ, and that he was really glad to be able to be there for them, to offer them spiritual direction, and he was going to continue his ministry of spiritual direction, uh, uh, and he is he was there again, and he would be able to to help them as Christ. Uh, this is a little bit like you may have heard of Elizabeth Kubler Ross, uh, uh, very famous person in Death and Dying, who. When she got in touch with some of these spirit complexes, she decided that she was the person who initiated Christ. She was the entity who had been Christ's teacher among the Essenes uh, in the desert prior to his beginning of his ministry. Uh, but there are many, many of these complexes, and they are... They share this quality. They are radically numinous. Now, if you've never had any really numinous experiences, it's very hard to talk about this. But let me try to give you a little sense about what they're like. William James, you need to read Varieties of Religious Experience. If you haven't read that, he describes these things. <laughs> you can read R. M. Buck's Cosmic Consciousness and a few other books, but but you can get a sense about this. When you have an, a close past close encounter of this kind <laughs> with the numinous. In fact, that's what that movie's about. If you want to see a, a dramatization of an encounter with the numinous, you see close encounters of the third kind. The best it's ever been. <laughs> but when you have a past of the numinous, it overwhelms your capacity to disbelieve it. You cannot disbelieve it once you've had it. Or root. So if you can disbelieve something, it wasn't the numinous that you ran into. 
That's one of the well, one of the telltale marks. It overwhelms your the ego's capacity to disbelieve it or resist it. Now, if you have an idea about that, then you've got a little idea about why the natives were concerned about taboos. Think about that. It's like, you know, you see, you remember in one of those Star Wars episodes, you're flying along in the, uh, whatever it is, Falcon, and you're approaching this planet, and you get to a certain, the, the Death Star, of course, right? But you get to a certain point, and guess what? What? You can't stop. You turn around, you you gun it, and you try to turn it around, and it won't go. It keeps going toward the death star. Now that is an experience of the numinos. See that? It's like once you get into its force field, it has got you, and your little shielding and your little engines and all that stuff are of totally no avail. It has got you. This is why in primitive cultures. They were so concerned about taboos around the numinosum. Because they knew. You get close to it, you're gone. I'm sorry. You've had it. And it doesn't matter how much you or have a good will. You know, I'm going to resist this, you know. Couldn't you say no? Yeah. Well, possibly. <laughs> the only thing about it is is that the wisdom of human history is, and a lot of Jungians forget this, the wisdom of human history is, you don't go messing around with a numinous without a ritual elder who can, a Yoda. See? You got it right there in Star Wars. You need somebody who knows how to tell you how to relate to this force. Because if you don't have somebody that knows how to relate to it, you will end up on the dark side of it. And so the, you study you study this cross-culturally and you'll find out, see, that's why a lot of people, it's amazing to me that you study the history of the psychology of religion and they never have put any emphasis in the entire history of the psychology of religion. They never put any emphasis on the importance of the ritual leaders. It's amazing. But William James doesn't talk about it at all. All these people talk about mysticism, this, that, and the other, but they don't talk about the ritual elder. That's a terrible mistake. Because if you if you look at sacred space that's transformative and doesn't destroy you, it's always got some sort of ritual elder who brings you in and brings you out. What about shaman? Shaman is a ritual elder. And of course, the question is always, who initiates the shaman? And there are a lot of people today, I'm not one of them, that think that every time you have an experience of the numinosum, if you all of a sudden you're a shaman. I have all these people come up to me telling me they're shamans. <laughs> <laughs> well, I believe they had an experience with the numinosum. But it remains to be seen whether they're a shaman. See, I mean, it doesn't take much to get psychotic. Any two-bit psychotic can claim to be a shaman. See, I mean, in fact, the, 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 the main wisdom of history is the more of an initiate you are, the less you talk about it. See. So I'm very suspicious of a lot of this shaman talk. It sounds like gross inflation to me enormous mega inflation and you know you can look at a lot of the personal lives of a lot of the so-called shamans and gurus uh, like the recent tantric buddhist high-ranking guru who was in, who was infecting his entire crowd with aids without telling them uh, and so that's one of the things you see this numinosum when you connect with it in the psyche, and it's in there, it always inflates you. Inevitably inflates you. Then the question is whether or not you can sacrifice the inflation or not. 
And that is, of course, a whole topic in itself, the role of sacrifice in this whole business. See, if you're really inflated, you'll sacrifice somebody else. <laughs> That's what the Satanists are doing. Uh, in the uh, in the New Testament, you see the grandiosity sacrificed in the Christian concept of kenosis. That is nothing other than the sacrifice of the grandiosity. What is kenosis? Emptying. It's, it's, it's the Christian dogma about what God did in Christ. In effect, the king of the universe emptied himself of the godness in order to be Emmanuel. You see? I mean, the, the Christian myth is amazing if you, if you see it as a statement about the mature sacrifice of archaic grandiosity. It's an amazing thing if you think about it in a lot of self-psychology and all these things. But, uh, but let's stay with this now. See, so spirit complexes, you can't take them in. You start trying to take them in, they make you psychotic or at least sociopathic. That is, you start being somebody, somebody was describing personality today and said, this person, this person has absolutely no sense of God. This person has absolutely no moral standards. This person has absolutely no, no limits on their behavior. I was describing a classic uh, antisocial personality, a very virile form. And say, so, so where's their God consciousness? Very simple. They're it. But the spirit, see, the question is, is that a spirit? When you get an antisocial personality, is that a spirit complex or not? That's an interesting question. See, I think it is. Freudians would not think it was. They don't have any concepts like this. But the interesting thing to me was, we might as well get to now. The interesting thing to me is how similar sadistic personalities are. If you study sadistic personalities, the study the uh, multiple killers. There's a lot of similarity in their personalities. Study the personality of torturers. And uh, there's a lot of similarity there. Very interesting. Uh, not, not little neurotic types that, you know, decide they're going to embezzle a few bucks from their bank. And they're an accountant. They embezzle, embezzle a few bucks from the bank. But, uh, but people who seem to have no structure called superego, people that have no superego tend to be very similar in their behavior and their thought patterns and their relationships. Very interesting thing. And see, the, the meta-theoretical question is very simple. Were all these people's parents really that much alike? Maybe they were. Statistically, that would be an awfully strange, unique, you know, kind of uh, conflation. That's true. I don't believe it. Personally, I think that uh, when you get down to people who are, you know, uh, very, very malignant antisocial personalities. I think it's very, very much the same configuration. You uh, read Scott Peck's book. He has a little sense of this. I don't agree with his theory. Uh, and people are the lie. But some of his conclusions, I think, are accurate. That is, he, he, he knows that they're a sort of ordinary crazy people 
And then there's a kind of crazy person that he terms a really, really pathological narcissistic personality, which is uh, in, incredibly toxic, so toxic that when you're in the presence of it, your skin crawls. Mm-hmm. And uh, you feel like a snake transfixed in the stare. I mean, a, a bird transfixed in the, in the stare of a snake. And I think that there's an experience. If any of you have worked with... Uh, with really, really um, uh, dangerous individuals who are multiple murderers or uh, multiple, multiple child abusers or that sort of thing. You will, you will see something the same type of thing. But, that, but there's your question. Now, is this, is there, is there any kind of way to recognize patterns in these Spirit complex. Well, of course, people that think they're Christ are very similar. All right? So we can't, with antipsychotic medication, you can't really trace much on this now. Somebody starts being Jesus, then they get a zap. <laughs> and uh, they're less interesting, but uh, <laughs> they're less trouble. <laughs> But if you've talked to one person that's Christ, you've talked to a hundred. I mean, they're not a lot different. Uh, and uh, uh, it's very, it's a very interesting kind of question as to, uh, see, there's no question. Once you, when you get a person that's, that's in this Christ inflation, you can't miss that. It's so obvious. I mean, they talk this way, they dress up this way, um, and it's it's just it's, you laugh at it, but the fact is, what you're seeing is is an archetypal entity. But people don't really think much about the other the other side of this kind of thing. That is, we don't tend to think: uh, is there any kind of transpersonal pattern to destructive personalities. Now, see, that's what I think you ought to think about. I mean, just think about it. Reflect on it. Because uh, in Jung's own understanding of the archetypal self, and this is where you get to all this stuff which we got to talk about tonight, you know, this talk about the dark side of the self. And then some Jungians just say, well, now that means that God has a dark side. And then you get that answer to Job thing. Well, now, are human beings helping God deal with his, how would you say it, in answer to Job? You're helping God to deal with what? With his shadow. Sort of the therapist of God. <laughs> I'm gonna let some of my other colleagues do that, but that's the kind of thought, you know. Well, we're going, we humans are gonna help God work with God's shadow. But now this is the sector in which all that comes up, because Jung believed that the self, the archetype of the self, had this kind of this kind of dynamic. You know, you've got this unknown aspect, you've got the ego, and then you've got Christ and Satan, and that kind of structure. Now, there's an interesting, if you have any questions before I go, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shift this now into looking at this way of thinking about the dark side of the self. And what that, what can that possibly mean? I don't have this all figured out. I just want to share with you my reflections and have you think about it. Because this is an area that they always, Jungians brush up against this, you know, going somewhere else. You know, you're going somewhere else and you brush up and you, it's the dark side of the self. And they go on to something else. <laughs> and these people kind of wondering, what does, what does this mean, the dark side? I thought you said the self was the archetype of order. Well, yeah, but is it also the archetype of chaos? Hmm. See, that's the question. 
Because if you've got a Satan in the archetype of the self, then you've got the prince of disorder as well as the prince of order. Now, ha have any of you done anything about the archetypal stuff around twins? Do you familiar with anything about that? The archetypal stuff? Well, but I want you to think. Now, there was this, we've got to translate a lot of this stuff in German to get it published in English, mm -hmm. but back in the 19th century, they used to do a lot of stuff on these mythic motifs that cropped up cross-culturally. And there are a lot of interesting things that used to be done, but haven't been translated into English now because mythologists today don't like Joseph Campbell, see? They don't like, they didn't like Joseph Campbell. Why? Do you know? They didn't like Joseph Campbell because he thought there was a monomyth. And they didn't like Joseph Campbell because he thought that myths came out of deep structures in the psyche. And if you could talk about human mythology, you didn't just talk about, well, so-and-so had this myth, and then they went by boat over here, and then these people learned it, and then they, went, then they went by boat over here, and then they learned it, and and they used to be the diffusionist theories. Well, in anthropology and, and scholarship and mythology, that kind of stuff is popular. It's It's okay to be a diffusionist. It is not okay to have any idea that there's any kind of psychological unity <laughs> underlying the human race that would give rise to similar mythic structures. See, it's not accepted in the university. There's this anthropologist that I'm going to try to get translated uh, that was influential on Campbell and influential on Jung, but nobody's translated into English. His name is Adolf Bastian, B-A-S-T-I-A-N. He, his whole thing was the psychic unity of the human race based on his study of myths. He was the guy that the chair in anthropology at the University of Berlin was named after in 1860. Okay, so in that same group of people were these people that had studied twins in the history of anthropology. And this guy wrote a book didn't bring, the, bring his name with me, but he wrote this book about how twins are the key to world mythology. That if you understand about twins mm. and you know the role of it, you would see that it is underlying almost so much of the myth. Well, now look at this. In the Gnostic traditions, mm. huh? Nothing. In the Gnostic tradition, Christ and Satan were brothers. And then you think back about Jacob and Esau, Cain and Abel, mm -hmm. so forth and so on, Romulus and Remus, and uh, so forth. But anyway, this, you say, well, this is dualism. Well, we're not talking about philosophy here, or theology. We're talking about psychological structures. That in the, according to Jung, in the deep structure of the archetypal self, there is this kind of tension. And you know, in Jung, psychology, opposites are a big deal. And trying to deal with these opposites in the personality, or just this is a fundamental aspect of the psyche. Now, let's, now stay with me now. I'm going to mess this up before the break. <laughs> Kind of give you a mental Charlie horse here, because now we we toss this off. Okay, now what is the self? Well, it's the archetype of order. Well, I say, yeah, yeah, God complex. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Christ may be seen as an archetype of order in some way, trying to, uh, if I be lifted up, what? I'll draw all men. Didn't say women. That was a patriarchy, right? <laughs> but lift it up. Everything orders around Golgotha. Christ comes. What do we get? Pentecost. What is Pentecost? Come on, you theologians, help me out here. <laughs> yeah, but what happened at Pentecost? That's right, the birth of the church. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The spirit is there. 
They spoke in tongues, but everybody could understand what everybody was saying, although they were speaking from different cultures and different contexts, different languages, see. So there's this image of when this, when Christ is there, you get, remember, last of the first session, cosmos. You don't have chaos. You have cosmos. Okay. But Satan, according to the mythologies, is not the Lord of cosmos in any positive sense of life-giving organization in any way like that. Satan, in terms of the mythologies, in the mythologies, as, is seen as the one who claims the king, the throne, but whose claim results in fragmentation. It's, it's the same thing behind the breakup of the round table. The archetypal thing between the breakup of the round table. There is a, there is a tear at the heart of cosmos. When Satan does his thing. See, and you read C.S. Lewis, you get all the elaboration and, and literature on this kind of thing. You know, the, the idea that there's a rip at the heart of the universe. And uh, so you get this image of Satan as prince of <laughs> chaos. It's like we talked about the first time. So it's a real interesting question. What do you do with all this? See? I don't pretend that uh, um, this hasn't been talked about enough to really to really get much of a sense of it. But now let's think about individuation in this context before we take a break. You want to talk about individuation. Well, what's the first thing you want to be sure you do? Individuate. Well, you sure want to individuate from the from this archetypal level. You want to, you want to individuate from the uh, from the uh, from the self. You want to know the ego needs to know that it is not the self. And if you study uh, Edinger's book, get Edinger's little book called Ego and Archetype, and look at those diagrams of development in there. Because when a child is, is starts out, there's no sense of differentiation between ego and archetypal self. And as the child develops, there is a disidentification between the ego of the child and the archetypal self. And then according to Ed Edinger, what you want to do is gradually you want to have this if there's a connection here between the self and the ego, which he calls the ego self axis. Now, so there's a differentiation from this archetypal self. That's clear in individuation. And this would fit the idea that you do not want to identify with any spirit complexes. Because all these spirit complexes would be related, would be numinous, magic in their power, just as the archetypal self is. So you want to disidentify, the ego needs to disidentify with anything numinous in the psyche. You want to, you want to maintain a connection, but you don't want to be identified with it. So, so that's one way to think about it. But it doesn't really solve the, the problem completely. Because then you got to say, well, Jung and a lot of these Jungians talk about, and in fact, a lot of them will just say, well, what you got to do in individuation is you got to get the Christ side and the Satan side and kind of bring them together. <laughs> yeah. and then what do you have? 
No, yeah, that's what that's what I think. That's what I think. I think when you get the Christ stuff and the Satan stuff and you mix them all up and, and kind of identify with this business, you're really crazy. <laughs> but there are a lot of these symmetrical unions that you know they're going to get the Christ stuff and the Satan stuff and they're going to mix it all up here in individuate and then they're going to be whole. Oh. <laughs> Our goal is to be whole. How do we get to be whole? Well, we mix the satanic and we mix the Christic, and then we've got wholeness. Well, it sounds good. Oil and water, they don't need. Well, that's the question. See, now there is the question that you need to struggle with. Now, does that work? Uh, there are people that, that's a very popular point of view among some yogis. Now, if you identify, now look at this now. We we'll, we will have to struggle with this thing the rest of the evening. But if you identify Satan as a lot of people do with sexuality and life and exhibitionism and pride in a positive sense and the bringer of life, you know they say, well, this first bringer of life, you know, in the in the garden they had the Gnostic tales in which the 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 Selfish God had hidden the truth from Adam and Eve, and they didn't really know who they were and their potentials. And so here comes Satan, snake in there, and he says, hey, you guys can make it too. <laughs> and so they know good and evil, and then they can get out. this trap. That's a knockout. Miss that. And there are a lot of people that say, oh, Lucifer, hey, he's a good guy, you know. And this is where you get a lot of the popularity of Satanism. And it's growing in popularity by leaps and bounds right here in River City. And the only way you would know that is by talking to the cops that patrol the forest preserves. Uh, uh, recently, uh, some policemen down on the southern forest preserves uh, went in on a weekend and pulled up, and, uh, and uh, there were a lot of cars moving around. They just thought it was their beer bus. So they pulled on up and kind of turned their light on. Everybody took off. And there were these two kids about, you know, something like eight, nine years mm -hmm. old, totally naked, running. And the cops stopped them and got them in the car and asked them their name. And they couldn't tell them their name. Tell them their name. And they took them to a. Uh, they they went on in, and there were all sorts of um, uh, ritual paraphernalia around this place. And they took these kids in, and they had them examined. And the guy, uh, I just was at a conference on violence just a uh, week, two weeks ago. And the guy had slides of the examination of these children. And these children had been repeatedly, repeatedly sexually abused. Um, and uh, it was horribly evident from the slides of their genitals and their body and the tissue chain. They had been hard, obviously, they'd been used ritually, sexually, ritually, many, many times. And the kids, uh, um, didn't even have any idea whatsoever who they were. Mm. And that was true after quite some time in the hospital. They could, they, you know, they could tell a little bit about what, they, what was going on, but they didn't know anything about who they were. And they, it's clear that they had been procured for this purpose. And that sort of thing is, is, is growing. Uh, and... Uh, um, <coughs> And see, the thing that you begin to look at is, is this consciousness that gets constellated under this pole when you start worshiping this entity, uh, is this consciousness just a, a, a liberate, a liberation, liberationist, you know, political liberationist? Well, not according to what the cops are buying. And now, of course, you probably heard about the uh, cannibalism down in Texas recently, last few weeks. 
drug dealers using the satanic practices to ensure the success of drug dealing. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but the thing that you need to reflect on, and you've got to understand, see, I'm not one of these cult leaders. I've been one of the leading people in the United States defending the civil rights of minority religions. And one of my books is on that topic. Uh, but there is something very different with Satan than there is with witchcraft. And one of the things that I want to do tonight is to make sure you understand the difference between Satanism and witchcraft. Because they have nothing to do with it whatsoever. I went to a lecture last weekend in which a senior Jungian analyst of some stature in the United States was lecturing, conflating the witch and Satan archetypally, equating the witch and Satan as archetypes that mean the same thing in the psyche. It's totally wrong, totally ridiculous and can be enormously dangerous in terms of persecution of feminist, religions, uh, and a repeat of the Inquisition. Uh, and uh, tonight we all make sure you understand the difference. The witch is nothing other than the female side magician archetype. It has nothing to do with worshipping evil or chaos or unbridled assertiveness. Creativity. There are aspects that go to evil things to which are positive things. They're legitimate. Say more. Oh, you have to see one people that don't invite them outright when they suffer from them. Well, surely. There is always, as in, in the, remember the archetypal structure, you've got the king and the queen and the shadow king and the queen. You've got the magician and the shadow magician, both female and male. There's always the possibility that any magus goes over and uses their knowledge on the dark side. So there's not, there's not an evil expression, but they are not in any way related to the archetype of Satan. Um, the archetypal structure is remember, You've got, in the archetype of the self, you've got four couples. King and queen, two magicians, two warriors, two lovers. The witch is a priestess. And an archetype always has a dark side and a light side. In other words, a negative use and a positive use in terms of the continuum. So a witch is simply one way of talking about Wicca, a, a ritual priestess in Wicca who leads rituals. And some people can use rituals for evil purposes, but so do Christian clergy. <laughs> See, there's a great deal of hate has been, has been perpetrated by Christian clergy, and it's exactly the same thing. You know, you don't have to be uh, into uh, witchcraft to use black magic. Anytime uh, anybody prays <clears throat> against somebody they deem to be their enemy, it's black magic. <laughs> so in any case, uh, that is one of the things that you've got to get some sense for, the, the archetypal structure. This thing, see, this is where you get, this is the combat myth. Satanism is grounded in the combat myth. And it's grounded in allegiance to the king of disorder. And, uh, for example, uh, this one guy interviewed was then working at St. Elizabeth's Hospital in Washington, D.C., working with adolescents who were, who were drug abusers and who, uh, who, uh, uh, were Satanists. About satanic practices. And he asked them what, why they were doing this. And it's an, an apocalyptic vision, these people have. You know, as you come on close to 2000, and you start thinking that the end of the world is coming, Armageddon is coming, 
They agree with the Christian fundamentalist. The only thing, one little thing, one little difference. They want to go with the winner. And they told his doctor that uh, Armageddon was in fact coming. And Christ and Satan were going to be in a war. And they wanted to be on the winning side. So they had chose, chosen to worship Satan as their god. Now, see, that's a, a very interesting scenario because what do you have? Think back to the first session. They would think back to the first session in terms of the archetypal structure of the combat myth. Combat myth is this is the plane of Armageddon or the plane of Jihad if you're Muslim. Or this is King Arthur defending the round table. Okay. It's right here on this plane. And the, the kids that are getting into Satanism today are into the combat myth. And they are declaring allegiance to the one that they believe will win. And if you just look at the planet Earth, well, you see why they think that way. Because it's quite clear that chaos is doing a lot better than order. And, uh, and you can really get a sense if you were a 15 year old and Washington, D.C. or New York City or Chicago, and you were living, uh, watching what's happening on the streets, uh, and you were kind of into this, this mythological things, this type of thing would be very attractive. The question is, is this, is it any more dangerous? This is the question that I would put to you. I have to come down on this for you think. Is it any more safe, is it any more dangerous to identify, uh, to, to form a connection with this kind of myth than any other kind? That's what you need to think about. See? This, this is what they used to call in theology and spiritual direction, discernment question. And you don't get out of it in terms of psychology of religion or psychology of ritual. Is it more dangerous to someone's mental health to be involved in ritual? See, I think rituals are necessary. I think ritual process is necessary for healthy human life. So I'm not one of these, this doctor that I went to hear his presentation, he thinks everybody that does any ritual is a potential Satanist. So, you know, wow, God, you know, he would think I'm a Satanist, you know. Mm. Because I think rituals are important. Uh, but uh, but he thinks that anybody that does is into this kind of satanic business. Just to mark his lack of uh, lack of education on this stuff. But you see, that is a question. A question does, does being religious and worshiping any mythic figure Pray to any mythic figure. Does it matter what mythic configuration you connect with? Now, there's your question. Now, now, granted, remember, we don't want to we don't want to identify with any spirit complex. Think you're it. Now, that's one level of individuality. We know that. But is there anything in the archetypal dynamics of the psyche which means that there are certain Images that are more toxic than others. See, that's a question to raise. In other words, can images and stories and uh, invocations of chaos make you more chaotic? I want you to think about that while we take our break. We'll come back in about 10 minutes and continue. You get that? Can image different images? Do all mythic images have a salutary effect, or do some mythic images function in ways more toxic than other mythic images? Think about that. There's a lot of different ways you can try to interpret all this stuff, but I want us to confuse matters as much as possible. <laughs> Not. Because uh 
You see, if you identify, as in some histories of interpretation of this, if you identify uh, Satan and Prometheus, for example, the uh, the rebel who rebels against oppression and who tries to bring light, feel light, and uh, that that one tradition, then then this whole Satan side is a is a is seen as a rebellion against tyranny. Now you don't kind of like that kind of uh, perspective. If you look at answer to Job, you really see that elaborated. And uh, so that is one history of, of interpretation. You see, sort of the the son or the uh, young one who is the rebel. This is the way they talk about the archetype of the rebel. They see this is the archetype of the rebel uh, in which order is seen as an oppressive order. And so you get the rebel against the oppressive order. And so then you would have this antinomy as being a sort of a balancing between order and structure. Okay. Structure and dynamic see. And this is a platonic kind of vision. That's one way that that kind of thing has been seen. <clears throat> Another tradition has been seeing uh, sort of the uh, Christ stuff as being identified with spirit and the Satan side as being identified with body and sexuality. Mm -hmm. And so the, the tension is between sort of uh, life in the body and uh, Spirit in the other world. So you've got all these different ways of reflecting on that. Yes. Anybody else want to come in? Yeah. I mean, there are different seasons. In that book, The Old Enemy, that I suggested to you, uh, they have a lot of, they delineate a lot of these different Gnostic tales, and they are not the same. The Gnostics didn't all think the same thing. Uh, and in that book, it lays out the different ways this is seen, you know, and some uh, Christ and Satan are seen as brothers. And if you take that twinship motif that the Gnostics had, then uh, then there, then you look at the New Testament stories and some really interesting things. And they think, well, now, who was the prodigal son? And who was the older brother? <coughs> See? Uh, and then in Christian theology, there is this fight that goes on. We don't believe people actually fight about this, but there are actually people that fight about this. Mm -hmm. Now, at the end of time, mm -hmm. will Satan and all of his angels be saved or not? And there was a group of Gnostics that believed that at the end of time, that indeed would happen, that, that the love of God would triumph and all Satan and all of his hosts would be redeemed and would return en masse to heaven. And their reason only one you could argue for the power and love of God. Very interesting. You've heard of the great theologian Karl Barth, who some say is the greatest theologian of the 20th century. He's rejected by a lot of Christians, conservative Christians, because he believes in universal salvation. He believes that God's grace is so powerful that every one will eventually be saved. There's a book called The Triumph of Grace and the Theology of Karl Barth. Now, you see how that, see, see how this works? Because it goes right back to the way of thinking about that combat myth. You remember that? When, remember when I put up about Zoroastrianism and the question about whether the Ahiramon, the evil god, is a part of, of the good god, just a split off part of the good god? or whether it's a totally eternally different entity. So you get this argument by all types of different people. Will these things be brought back together or not? 
So you've got one group, uh, and, and a lot of different uh, times this has been argued, one group thinks, well, this will be integrated. And one group that thinks it won't ever be integrated, you know, Satan and the angels will be always cast down into hell, you know, that's where they belong. Then you've got the question, I'll throw out a couple more and we can discuss this. Then you've got the question, okay, well, let's say that, um, let's say that there is some sense in which the archetype of Christ and the archetype of Satan do have to find some, uh, rapprochement. Then another question comes up, though, uh, that Jung addressed, and whether you may you have to ask the question whether you agree with him or not. That is, is this rapprochement between the archetypal Christ and the archetypal Satan something you need to have anything to do with? Is this your job to get Christ and Satan together? Say, hey, Esau, here comes Jacob. Mm -hmm. We have a little couple or a little relationship counseling here between Jacob and Esau. Or is this something that's none of the ego's business? Is this something that you shouldn't worry about? Is 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 uh, what we should worry about is what we should worry about disidentifying from the whole business. See, and if there is something that Christ is going to do with Satan, that's his business. Or so forth. See, that's that's that. that, that. Really, it's really a question to think about because, uh, at the psychological level, it has some, it has some relevance. Uh, because, uh, uh, if, if you can work with this Satan complex, and if you should work with it, that, then, I mean, think about active imagination. So you can do active imagination with Christ. So what about what about somebody somebody says to you, Well, I'm gonna do active imagination with Satan? Well, what are you gonna say to that? Well, let me show you how you'd argue it. Argue it different ways. You would argue, well, uh Satan represents the rebel, the sexual person. Carrying all these things, if I do all this active imagination with him, maybe that'll help me constellate these things in me. This is what Satanists do. They think that you know, the Dark Lord is the Lord of sexuality, power, aggressiveness, and success. <laughs> so if I worship Satan, or if you were psychologically going to psychologize, you say, well, if I do active imagination with this, this will help me with this. Well, Somebody asks you, how about active visualization experiences with this thing, with this image? And you would have to say something. You would have to say, well, I'm not going to comment on that. <laughs> you know? Or, I definitely don't think you should. Or, or something like that. Well, it's an interesting thought. Uh, and depending on what you think this is for, it would matter. Say, say, what if you think that the Satan thing that's the thing. He always has seen his pride or pride, full of power, pride, you know. And you think of a person that, say, say this is a person that's really got a lot of untransmuted and internalized grandiose self organizations. <laughs> well, Satan, he's the prototype of the person that didn't get mirrored enough. <laughs> you, think, you think, well, now, maybe God the Father didn't mirror Satan. <laughs> 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 or what if he had mirrored Satan more? Maybe, maybe, maybe then then Lucifer could have transmuted and internalized this, and and and, and maybe be able to stand it that he's not God, at least not yet. King is dead long as the king. I mean, it's an interesting question. So, uh, so. Uh, <laughs> You can see how complicated and confusing all this business is. Now, Jung didn't mind. He just waited in where angels fear to tread. You know, well, I'm just going to write this book. Answer the joke. So, what what issues do you see here? I see another issue in the Christ uh, side of the, the 
It's just your chaos, it's fun chaos here. Uh, <laughs> I'll go ahead for having fun. But Christ himself was a rebel. Okay. Against uh, the established order. He believes he's dying. Yeah, in, in the yeah. Christian myth, you see, in fact, you see the Slot Gnostic myths, that the world is ruled, in Gnostic myths, the world is ruled by this evil what? Evil demiurge. In a lot of the Gnostic myths, the world was not created but through God. In a lot of the Gnostic myths, the world was created by this evil demiurge that has all these people in, in prison down here. And so Christ comes in as the rebel against the evil demiurge and in effect springs everybody from the captivity of the evil God who's not the real God in the first place. And so in that myth, Satan is the ruler of the underworld, this underworld which was created by either mistake or whatever. It's all in the old enemy book. If you get the old enemy book, all this is laid out. But it's, it's, you're right. So Christ is a rebel in that in that myth. But now look, let's, re let's remember now, what is it that, that is identified with evil in so many of these human traditions? Well, it is infantile grandiosity. Worldwide. <laughs> so, if it is an image of infantile grandiosity, and you know in that Anthropology of Evil book I mentioned, they always make it clear that there is something in humans that, that, that they, they know that if you get real creative, it's very dangerous. And that there's something about grandiosity, the relationship of grandiosity to creativity that's very close. And uh, and so you can really see this confusion. You can see because in a lot of these tribal cultures, they they know that being creative is dangerous, and they know that there's something very very close to chaos when you get creative. And all of these images of the monster and the titan and the giant and all these you know. All these huge things that, that come out in, uh, in evil expressions, uh, they're related to this creative force that goes bad. So it's an interesting reflection here. What is this loose, what, what is this satanic thing where you can wonder, well, you know, here's another way you could do it. You could say, now maybe, if you took the Christian seriously and you thought one out, the archetypal self, now that's the Imago Dei. That's the image of God. So you say, well, now maybe it's not really these things. Maybe it's just the Imago Dei. And maybe when you, when the Imago Dei is seen as being uh, offered to the true God. If this is offered as in the Eucharist to the true God, then it is experienced as the Christ self. If, however, you do not make any offering to the true God, then the God within possesses the self and is experienced by other people. As Satan. That's an interesting thought. It's like this. It's like a Jungian could argue this. Now, I don't know what any of these are right. But a Jungian could argue this. Okay. In the psyche, you've got this numinous structure. It's what the Kogushans call the grandiose self -order. Same thing. What do they have there in called the spirit artist? This thing isn't two, it's one. But, if I form a distinction between my ego and these things, and I do not identify with it, 
I can make it a kind of a center, a trans-ego center, and I can be less grandiose in my life because I disidentify with this God-like thing within me. And I can do all sorts of things. If I'm a union, I can say, well, that's the self. And I'm religious about it, and I think, well, that's, I'm going to have this connection to the self. I don't have to say, well, it's God or not. If you're a Christian union, you'd say, that's really the Christ within. But, if I don't develop an ego self-axis, I identify with this thing, I become enormously pathologically inflated. And I act as if I'm God. And I am very compulsive, and I can't get no satisfaction, and I do all the things a narcissistic personality disorder in a very malignant form does. Which sounds a lot like the mythology of Satan. Satan is never satisfied. He's always empty. Always in pain. Never has any sense of peace. Always full of hate and envy. All these things that you identify with pathological narcissism. You know, that would be one way to go with it. You could say it's the same. It's the Imago day. And it only matters how you relate to it. If you relate to it and don't identify with it, then it, it can function like the Christ. It's been identified with A transpersonal, trans ego, etc. You can say if you identify with it, you develop a satanic consciousness. You could argue it that way. It's an interesting way, yeah. So if there's a dream, at the center of, of the dream is, is an image of, say, the Sacred Heart or an image of Christ, Let's say it's a painting on a wall and mm -hmm. signing and mm -hmm. all that, or you know, like a center mm -hmm. of a home or whatever. <clears throat> is that what you mean? Or is that the thing that you have to be careful of? You know, you can't integrate that into it. You can't analyze that and try. Well, you can analyze it, but now the question of integration is a very subtle thing. You wouldn't want to try to be the sacred yeah. heart. What was the thing? There are a lot of people in families that try to be the sacred heart for the family. Mm -hmm. And they get eaten alive. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so the, the thing is, look in the dysfunctional family. You will find somebody in the dysfunctional family that's the ghost. Mm -hmm. Sacrificial victim. The family. Call them the identified patients, or you can see the victim someplace or the savior, the one that gives up all their whole life. They don't they don't have any life, they just take care of the rest of the family. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is infantile grandiosity seen as conscious or unconscious, or is, is that the wrong way of talking about it? Well, it depends on what kind of personality uh diagnosis you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And uh you can you can raise the question about even with a very pathological narcissist whether they're aware of being not whether they're aware of being grandiose. Uh, and with different people, you know this, you know, some of them say, some of them have some sense of their grandiosity and uh, they will joke about it. Uh, others, you know, some of them will say, rules were made for other people. And they're clear. And so there is a sense of being sort of the God, King of the Mountain, at least King Kong, not God, you know. And so there's certain consciousness there. But say you've got a dependent personality disorder. The dependent personality disorder doesn't have any awareness at all of their infantile grandia. And they're eaten up there. It's just not in the ego. They project it on you, and then you can take care of me. And if you don't take care of me just right, I'm going to be very angry with you. This is what happens in the transparency. So, so depending on the personality, it, it can be relatively conscious, or it can be totally split off. There was no discussion that I read about, but that wasn't using exactly these terms, but it was talking about decisions made at the very highest levels of government, it doesn't matter which one, mm -hmm. and, and that some of the ease with which these decisions are made sometimes had to do with, you know, a total 
lack of uh, contact with the results of this decision making, and then the tie-in was, was with the notion of the grandiosity being there but not being recognized as such, you know, being masked in, uh, you know, necessity or uh, efficiency or whatever, whatever the topic is. Yeah, you know, there are a lot of studies that are coming out now on deception. Yeah. And deception process and the processes of not knowing. Mm -hmm. And it relates to what you're talking about. Uh, but it's but but I personally in my own work on this, I really I really think that that pathological infantile grandiosity is a useful way of thinking about this. <laughs> this uh, uh safe in reality. And you can see it in the shadow expressions, and it's always related to power. It's always a power contact. And if you look at the, these four archetypal couples that we talked about, you know, whether it's the king or the warrior or the magician or the lover, use the shadow side of each of those always is, is into a power contact. An abuse of power. And so uh, uh, that whole issue, you see, you have to deal with that if you're trying to sort this stuff out. You would have to say, well, now, who was it abusing the power? Now, in answer to Job, who is, in answer to Job, who abuses the power? God abuses the power. See, so if you follow that route, then then the uh, the Luciferian side is the Good-hearted, freedom love, freedom fire, <laughs> trying to fight for justice. Uh, and there are a lot of people that, that think that really. But I think it's very interesting to to reflect on this. This is a mess. All this stuff is a mess. But you have to kind of get some sense about the different ways you can, the ways you can turn it and look at it. Clearly, in the psyche. Throughout history, when you get down to the deep structures, there is this kind of antinomy, this kind of combat myth. And the question is, you know, the question is, and you'll be thinking about it this next this coming week, you know, uh, just be reflecting on this. So what? You know, so what are the ramifications of this for... Uh, for individuation, and it, it's a meta-theoretically laden issue. It's, it's how you interpret what this is about, and at the archetypal level, would have something to do with how you're going to treat it. Okay. Some Jungians think, well, what we want to do is we want to bring this together. You know, there's some Jungians that think that the way to deal with evil, if you want to read, uh, there's a you know the book I edited on. Christian, young and Christian spirituality. Uh, there's some good articles in there, but they're wrong. Which he does a critique of young and a lot of youngians understanding of evil. See, a lot of youngians think that you take good and you take evil and you mix them up and you get holiness. What do you think? I think that's a crock. Well, what do you know how you get holiness? Because, see, because I think that is such an incredibly shallow understanding of evil. See, if you study, if you study evil and philosophy and theology, you know that uh, that evil, for example, evil is like you said earlier. This is where we get back to your comment that you made earlier. Evil would not be seen as the the part of your sexuality or exhibitionism shut off in the shadow, personal shadow. Evil from a theological point of view, would be seen as that which caused that good thing to be alienated from you in the first place. Mm -hmm. So in other words, uh, that which is evil is that which causes you to lose contact with life. Mm -hmm. So evil, in, you know, theologically and philosophically, would be that which is anti-life. That which is uh, necrophiliac, that which loves death more than life. Now, this is an interesting point that I did not get into, which 
may have another clue that you can think about this week. But I don't have this figured out. I just want to share with you some reflections. Another thing, the sheep, what I call a Shiva principle. You know, in Hindu mythology, Shiva and Kali have an important function as being God and goddess of death and destruction. And the Hindus have this understanding that there are times when you need a destroyer. Mm-hmm. You've got Brahma, the creator. You've got Vishnu, the preserver. And you've got Shiva, the destroyer. <laughs> and if you think about this, this makes some sense. There are times in life when you need a destroyer. Shiva principle. When? Well, it's when you're an adolescent and you need to grow up. So there needs to be a Shiva principle that comes in there and destroys these outmoded structures so that mature ones can replace them. Same thing happens in midlife. You get the midlife, you've lived your life a certain way, and if you keep living it that way, you're going to die. Your, your whole person is going to die. So if you don't discover a Shiva principle that can come in there and zap these outmoded structures so that you can go into a transformation process and then regrow some fresh, new, life-giving structures for, for the next take on life, if you don't do that, you will probably die. There are a lot of men, particularly men, that die of heart attacks in midlife because they can't get the Shiva principle going. So they just act it out. So you can say, well, now, is this, is this, you've got an order here. There's another way you can argue it to you. And think about this in the context of liminality. Transformative space. You've got order. You can do this on Victor Turner's thing. You can put structure here. And anti-structure here. Say there are times in life when you need anti-structure to destroy things so that then you can reorder. So that would be another way you can go with what that combat myth is about. Tension between order or between structure and anti-structure. So it's another way you can go, yeah. But you need access to the anti-structure. You don't need to become... Now, see, that's, the, the entire that's interesting, see. In other words, if you think about transformation, the process of transformation that you're going through in your therapy or in your life changes, is that supposed to be ruled by a chaotic principle? Or is that chaotic principle not really chaotic at all? Is there an is there a higher order that governs process of transformation. Now this matters what you think about this. Freudians and Jungians disagree on it. Freudians have a this have this theory of transformation. Chaos. Order. Mm-hmm. Chaos. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so this is why ego psychology tells to be so important. Freud. <laughs> you got, if you don't have structure in the ego, friend, the Freudian, Freudian, Freudian point of view, you don't have it. The Jungian point of view has more of an order, chaos, yeah. order. But it's not simply a matter of ego. There is a, there is, the ego is what is dissolved. Mm-hmm. And there is a higher principle of order which is associated with itself. This is a transcendent function that you wouldn't put for the union. They wouldn't put the ego here as a function of this created order. They would put the self here overlooking the whole transformative process. So, now, here, see, here's this is related to people that identify the trickster in Satan. 
There are a lot of people that think that the trickster archetype and Satan is the same thing. And when you get this move, this summer we're going to get to see the new Batman. Nobody's <laughs> excited about this, but I am. <laughs> but in that, Jack Nicholson is going to play the job. Uh -huh. <laughs> Okay. So anyway, see there you get it completed. Clearly, the Joker is supposed to be safe in this in this story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you got you got Batman. You got you got Joker. But it's very interesting. He's played as a trick. The Joker, trick. Sometimes dressed up like a clown. Mm -hmm. And you get a lot of people that think that, that you know, Hermes, Trickster, Satan. So that's one take on it. Uh, and you can really see that this, the viewing, the, the Hermes is always anti-order. They call Hermes the god of the threshold. Look at Murray Stein's book on in mid life there. So, so you got this god of disorder who does it when you need it. You need to, you need it when you need to have some disorder so you can change. Mm -hmm. So you see all these different types you can do on this. Mm -hmm. Now, my sense is I would go more uh, uh, with a view of uh, of there being some. Ah. Primary dominant sense of the self is that which oversees, oversees the total life-giving individuation process. And I think that's what Jungians tend to emphasize, the archetypal self and the way in which it leads through individuation. Uh, question that you need to take home with is if that's the case then what are we to make of that ion volume where uh, where the self has this Satan image in it see I don't think I don't think Jung was clear what he thought about this I think he he leaned towards seeing the doing this thing about good and evil and getting them together. I think that was the way that he kind of viewed it. Um, I think, I think though, that that's really a very naive way of thinking about evil. Evil is not something you want to mix up to the anti-life. And we'll, let's have some more comments. We've got a minute or two. Yes. Yes, um, I have one thing I want to throw out, and that is children being taken on two different levels. But it kills. Children with cancer often draw to, this is just very pictures, of antibodies in the system, fighting the cancer. Yeah. And to me, that is a creative, um, the, the combat zone, or whatever. Yeah. To think about this, there are a lot of people that, that in fighting cancer do visualizations and they use the mm -hmm. combat men. Mm -hmm. It's very clear that they identify the malignant cells with, with uh, evil and they get their forces together and they go after the, uh, the evil cells. And they but, but, the, but the um, visualization mm -hmm. does have yeah. yeah. right. Well, there's some sense of a of a superordinate entity to which you're trying to which you're trying to serve, which is the integrity of the body and the life. Mm -hmm. 
so you can see that they're, they've got their little forces that are serving life, and there are these forces that are trying to get the body to die. One of the doctors that uh, I talked to, an AIDS doctor, was telling me about some of the mechanisms they're looking at in, uh, in trying to understand some of these, uh, some of the processes of dying. He's talking about, about noticing that a lot of the time when you die, it's, it's really kind of strange that, that, that if you work with people that are dying, a lot of the time, uh, they, their disease is really not serious enough to kill them. But then there's a process that starts which has an increasing momentum and it shuts the systems down. And as one doctor was telling me about, uh, uh, the, uh, the processes that they're studying about this, this sort of, uh, shutdown program mm-hmm. that's, uh, that's in the body. It's almost, it's almost like there's a, a number of, of, uh, biological things, biological factors that, that get together, uh, and then when you're in this di- process of dying, and even though you could conceivably live a good bit longer, things shut down. And, uh, and they're trying to figure out what causes that thing to constellate or what causes it to start so that they can figure out how to stop it so that you don't just push the wrong button and die, everybody dies. So anyway, well think about these things and think about, uh, and think about, uh, the issue of, uh, of, uh, dealing with this business of these archetypal images of, of good and evil, et cetera, et cetera, in your individuation. Because depending on your meta-theoretical perspective on this, both, you know, psychological and religious, they will have an impact on what you would want to do with all this. Yes? A quick question for thinking about these things for the next time. Mm-hmm. Uh, I haven't gotten a clear distinction between these personal archetypes and these larger ones that uh, might uh, or might not eat us or go on over our heads. Can you tell me? Uh, well, see, uh, personal, the personal complexes always have some archetypal components. But uh, but when I when I'm speaking of an archetypal shadow, I'm speaking about the the organizations in the psyche which come up that are not so personal, but that are in each psyche, such as the, you see it most clearly in the combat myth. So we're talking about the, the tendency in your mind to have in all of our minds, to have the archetypal enemy come up, you know, in our imagery. And if you study dreams, you will see it in your, if you're in a particular chaotic state, it's very common for people to have dreams of vampires, of werewolves, uh, et cetera, et cetera, and sometimes even of Satan himself. And, these, and, these, and so what you want to think about is how might you interpret that. And if you were working with someone in therapy and they keep having dreams of Satan or a werewolf or a vampire that's very threatening, what would you do with that? How would you handle that? Would you want to invite the the figure in and sit down for tea, <laughs> or not? Right. See, that's the kind of thing that you should think about. Because if you're doing counseling, you will run into people mm-hmm. who have precisely that experience, and then you will have to make a management decision what you're going to say if that person comes in and says, "Well, you know, uh, the last three nights." I have had this dream of being chased through the woods by this eight-foot-tall werewolf. What should I do? Well, there are people that would argue it different ways. So next week, you come tell me the different ways it could be argued. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'll see you next week. I want you to, before we reconvene after the break, to uh, think about those voices that you hear in your psyche that if Robert Moore was right, and they weren't really your voices, you just think they're your voices, if you, if, but that if I was right, and that it really wasn't your ego's voice, I would like you to think of what those sentences or phrases are, statements are, that you hear, 
and try to become conscious of them, maybe write them down. And uh, the brave souls can come back to the second half. <laughs> and we're going to have a little interview with the archetypal shadow. Uh-oh. <laughs> and uh, you've all heard, give the devil his due. Well, he's going to have an opportunity to talk. So figure out if you can get some sense of what these sentences are that may not be yours. We'll write them down, and then we are just going to give him a chance to have a say for a while, and then we're going to let you have an opportunity to speak back. You know, you've heard get thee behind me, Satan. We're changing that tonight. It's going to be get out in front of me, Satan. And we're going to have an opportunity to listen, and you're going to have an opportunity to speak back. So you can think what you'd like to say back to these sentences, if they're not really you. So uh, the, those of you that think you may be hospitalized this evening, if you do that, <laughs> you should not come back after the break. <laughs> but those of you that kind of want to do a little... And psychological anthropological research here. Come back after the break, and we will we will experiment. We will do a little uh, Jungian empirical scientific research with regard to the archetypal shadow. So, uh, all these poor people that came in late didn't hear what I just said. <laughs> okay, this is not therapy. I'm just a poor professor. So I'm not responsible for anything that happens after the break. You can sue the union Okay, well, so so what I'm going to do is uh, now I'm going to give a little review, a little overview. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about ritual process and uh, the importance of imagery in psyche particularly at times of transformation and crisis. And I'll talk a little bit about Satanism more. And uh, and uh, hopefully we'll get all that done uh, before the break, and that'll be all I'm requiring of you. And then those of you that have an experimental bent can stay. Okay, a little review. Remember, we started out with my laying out for you the locus of this archetype, archetypal shadow, the the uh, image of, of Satan or Rahwana or whatever the ancient enemy is, the old enemy. And in my understanding of the structure of the archetypal self, the place you see this most clearly is in the warrior archetype sector of the psyche. You know, in my understanding of the, the, the archetypal structure of the self, there are four couples of the conjunctio. There's the king and the queen. There's the warrior couple. There's the magician couple, the priest priestess, and there is the lover couple. And the space created by the king and queen is cosmos, right order. The space between the or the, that's generated by the warrior couple is the plane of struggle, it's the plane of jihad, Armageddon. The space of the priest and priestess is sacred, transformative space a la the space of the sanctuary, liturgical space, the space of analysis, the timonos, the uh, alchemical vessel. The space of the lovers is the garden. That's the, plus the space of passions, Gethsemane Eden. It's the place where love and sadness live. Well, the place where you locate the Satan image in the psyche is in the second space. It is the combat myth. 
because in the in the archetypal shape of the psyche, the combat myth, you get the you get the the warrior couple who face uh, uh, on the uh, one side facing off a warrior couple on the other side. Different myths, it's one or the other, and some it's a female carries all the negative energy, some male carries the negative energy, and some you see it where it's clearly that there is a there is a male and female uh or female and male partners who are fighting the uh, evil forces, etc. Uh, but in any case, where you get this satanic business, the enemy is on that plane of struggle. Okay, you got that? So you got order. See, there's the king and queen are tr trying to create the space of order and world and, and city and all this place that thrives. That is the Oxus Mundi. And there are always forces against it. So the forces against it have to be fought by the loyal Joan of Arc and, uh, and uh, the loyal Knights of the Round Table, Knights of the Cosmos, Knights of Order, of Just Order. So the satanic image is that which is coming from without this order. So there's the combat myth. You see that combat myth. Now, and I pointed out that that uh, there are many ways that this can be looked at. And uh, one of you was arguing very persuasively uh, before we started tonight, uh, very persuasively the popular Jungian view that what you do is you get good and you get evil and you want to integrate them because they're parallel opposites and we want to integrate them and come up with real human being. And that's a persuasive Jungian argument that many have taken, and later on tonight when we experiment with this business and what it says and the voice of this type of thing, we can try to figure out empirically something about that. Uh, but anyway, that's one way to argue it. The other way that it can be argued, as I pointed out to you before, is that, uh, is that the order being talked about as cosmos that the king and queen of light are trying to defend is not the order of the ego, but is the order of the self, which does everything it can to include everything that is rightfully human within an ego. So in other words, there are some that would say, now stay with me on this, some that would say, well, Satan is merely the image of your libidinal urges and your aggression. And so it is an image of those uh, aspects of the rightfully human that has been split off by Christian culture. Ah, oh, that makes sense, doesn't it? The church doesn't want us to have our sex and our aggression, and Nietzsche figured it out. And so Nietzsche speaks for, in this view, in this, and on to this argument, Nietzsche speaks for the satanic voice. Or in this view, you cheer for Prometheus, right? Prometheus is the bringer of light. So not only is he the bringer of light, he's the bringer of sex. He's the bringer of aggression. Three cheers for aggression. So, so, uh, you know, I'm, I look at this stuff and I hear people argue this stuff and I say, well, gee, if uh, if if Satan is the liberator of sexuality and, uh, and aggression, three cheers for Satan. I can understand that argument. But you can also look at that other way and you can say, well, but what if the order being talked about here is the order of the archetypal self with a capital S? which would integrate aggression and sexuality against the wishes of this pious ego. What if the pious ego, see, remember the archetypal self is higher. It's a higher order, not the order of the ego. The pious ego is spiritual. Look at the chapter in, uh, in Murray Stein's book on uh, Jungian analysis where he talks about the split anima and the split animus in there, the Sander and Beebe article. Where he, where he diagrams the split anima and the split animus. 
and he points out how the self, if you're really getting an order that's in the self, the, the split in the anima and the animus will close, and you'll get an integration of sexuality and aggression into the human ego. So, so if, if the order being talked about in the combat myth, now stay with me, now. remember the, the combat myth, if the order being talked about in the combat myth is not the order of the ego, but is that order which would include everything which is rightfully human in a life-affirming way, then you get a different picture. What then would the archetypal shadow be? Well, it would be that part of the human psyche which hates life and which would use sex to destroy life and would use warrior energies to, just to create chaos, and would, would use king and queen energies to create tyranny. You follow? And would use the magician, the priest and the priestess energy to, to exploit knowledge, to exploit people through exploiting knowledge, the medical establishment today. Now, that's a pretty interesting argument, too. In other words, necrophilia is an expression of the archetypal shadow in that argument. Now, I didn't come to this course to tell you which one of those is right. I can tell you which one I think is right. I think the latter is right. And I think those Jungians that think you're going to mix up evil and good and get some a nice omelet. <laughs> I just misguided. <laughs> but some of you argue that well, and I give you great credit for for this. And uh, and if the devil has got all the uh, joyous sex and the joyous aggression, then I may come over into your camp. But uh, but anyway, the, the important thing is for you to just see these now. Then I talked about the anthropology of evil. And how in that particular study, the book, that, that English book by that name, they talk, they, they talk about the many ways in which tribal peoples have understood that there is some kind of tie between creativity and chaos. And that this whatever this it is, it has got something to do with how easy it is to get to overreaching when you get creative. When you really, if you're not creative, you don't tend to overreach too much. But if you start getting creative, and what Jungians would say, you start being in touch with the archetypal energies. And then you start to glow. <laughs> yeah, you know, glow on. And then you start to lift off. <laughs> And if you don't have a good depression to get you back down, <laughs> then you may get very psychotic. So, I mean, there is there has been this primordial intuition that you can see by studying these myths that the as the, the old Christian tradition said, pride goes before fall. Hubris leads to nemesis. And you get it in the psychoanalytic tradition. What is there in Freud about the id? Well, it has a grandiose claim of desire. It's got to be bisexual because it wants them all. So many men and women in so little time. <laughs> <laughs> and what about the superego? Well, the superego is grandiose in its criticisms. It never likes what you do. Whatever you do. I was sitting in a meeting one time at the American Academy of Religion. I was sitting there drinking one of my favorite whiskeys, <laughs> listening. And I was listening to this conversation. This, this, they were dismissing Nathan Scott's work. Nathan Scott is this great scholar who had written something like 20 different volumes on religion and literature. And... Uh, they were dismissing his work. You know, his career simply hasn't really been significant. <laughs> really wasn't significant. Well, you hear this a lot in academic circles. 
about everybody else's work. <laughs> Maybe that's not the voice that we're talking about here, but you know the one that really would be? It's if we heard Nathan Scott thinking to himself, mm. you know, just 20 books. <laughs> All of my work has just been shit. <laughs> <laughs> and the research on creative people shows that Poets and artists and writers, the greatest of them all, once you study their biography, you find that they're very tormented individuals who do not feel good about what they've created. It's very interesting. Very interesting thing. So, that critical part of the superego, the punitive, sadistic superego, and we talked about the Adlerian idea of the superiority complex, which is always behind an inferiority complex. It always leads you to have to do what? To depreciate self and others. Adlerians will diagnose how crazy you are by how much depreciation you have to do of yourself and others. If you criticize other people a lot, you're probably very crazy, according to Adlerian point of view. <laughs> And then the cohesion thing about the grandiose self-organization and the way in which the grandiosity is relentless. You never ever finally really get rid of it. Although you can, if you have a really good analyst, maybe all that grandiosity will be transmuted and internalized into healthy self-esteem and, and uh, uh, ideals. And you'll have a real zest for life. But for most of us unfinished folk, we still have got this relentless grandiosity that presses in, comes in under the door, you know, comes in through the windows. And it says, you need to do a little bit more. <laughs> We're only working four nights a week. I really ought to be out to, you know, I was speaking to a dentist the other day. How many hours a week are you working? Sixties. Easy, you know, usual thing. Go forth. But I'll be working a little bit more, making a little bit more money, so you can have a little bit bigger house, and drive a little bit nicer car, go on a little bit longer vacations, to a little bit nicer places, <laughs> <laughs> with a little bit better sex, with a little bit, a, little, a lot more people. <laughs> so anyway, the granny has to just seeps in, and sure as you think you've got it under control, it catches you. The left leg, see, and um, and uh, so this whole thing uh, gets us around to this question about whether the archetypal self is all positive. Well, or are there two poles in it, or only one? Is it the archetype of order, or does it also have an aspect which may be the archetype of disorder and chaos? Is, as some have said, the archetypal self? The imago day is it only one thing, and is there some sense in which if the if the great numinous luminous self within is sacrificed to a higher ideal, a lot of sacrifice and dismemberment motif in, mytho in mythology, the dismemberment of the grandiosity. What do you have to do to have a world where you gotta chop up the dragon? Build a world by chopping up the dragon. In a million myths. Or you build a world by chopping down a beanstalk, getting that jolly green giant down to size. There's always some titan, Goliath, that has to be brought down before you can really have a world. So, the question is then, is that Imago Dei, is that, is that numinous, luminous thing within the psyche, is that thing something which can have enormously positive Christ-like influences if, it's, if it is used one way and can be satanic, if it is used another way? So you got to... You can take it a lot of different ways if you look at the issues. And you can argue it convincingly more than one way. But 
if you're going to get assessed for this stuff, you got to you think about it, uh, you know, at least get an idea of the options in thinking about it. If, uh, if you view it that what you have to do with this grandiose self-organization or this archetype or this great numinous thing within, if what you have to do to that is sacrifice that or offer it to something to keep it from being death dealing that might be an interesting thing you offer it to whom well one myth you say well you would offer it to the grail king or what happens if you identify with it well you become god or you become a narcissistic personality disorder, which in a very virulent pathological form is sort of a God sign. Now, you know, I don't propose to resolve all this for you, but you need to, to look at that. See? What is there, we didn't really get into this much, but what is there in that luminous thing within that is so tempting. Well, let's talk about that now for a minute. If, there, if the unions are right and there is this luminous, shining thing within, then what is so tempting about it? And why do people vary between religiously staying away from it and others mainlining it. What would you say? There's a temptation to possess it and control it. Mm -hmm. I think that's probably it. Would be mine then, right? Would be mine. Did you see that? Did you see that little triptych of, of uh, short pieces that they put together in that movie New York Story? Yeah, you remember the that. Nolte piece? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wasn't that a fun piece? Just, uh, I mean, I like the novelty, but, uh, but there was a nice thing in there about creativity. Notice, there's always sacrifice related to creativity. Usually it's other people. <laughs> and in that, in that, in that movie, the women were being eaten up to create pain. And Nolte did a wonderful job of this. I mean, you could tell that he almost knew it. If you asked him if he was eating these women in order to paint, he would have probably, this character in this movie would probably have thought about it a minute and said, hmm, maybe I'll paint that. You know, he would have thought about it. He wouldn't have probably been able to say it. But if you see that movie, you'll get a sense for that. Another movie that really treats this stuff well that I just saw this week is Manhunter. Have you seen Manhunter? Any of you seen it? It's kind of luminous, isn't it? Makes you want to be the Red Dragon. It's a story of this man that had a slight birth defect. This is a good thing to talk about in this context. You need to see that this week. Slight birth defect made him a little bit ugly, he thought. And uh, so he, his mother apparently, if you think about this developmentally, his mother apparently thought he was kind of ugly as an infant. And so found him a little bit revulsive. <laughs> and so he was preoccupied with acceptance. And... Uh, <clears throat> was a, probably a good union. He read William Blake. Mm -hmm. and he came to that image of the red dragon, the great red dragon. And he would get into wanting to be the red dragon and have power over people so that they would have to love him. And so he began to kill families. Mm -hmm. And he would break mirrors put mirrors in their eyes mm -hmm. and set them up. Oh, mm -hmm. 
so that they could watch him being accepted. And he was the red dragon, an archetypal shadow, when he was doing that. It's an uncanny movie to get at these issues. There's this relationship between shame and shining that uh, self-psychology gets at a lot. But it's an interesting thing to think about in this whole context, the relationship between shame and shining. And Robert Bly's going around telling everybody, don't let anybody see your gold. I think that's an interesting thought. It's about shining, it's about creativity. And it has to do with this all this creativity grandiosity, archetypal self, what happens if you claim it, what happens if you show it to people. <clears throat> what happens if you show it to people? Think about your life, or think about some friend's life. <laughs> <laughs> you tell me about some friend's life. What happens when they show their goal? <laughs> Come on, you know. You know. Like they hate your guts. They hate hate you. Here's the one of the hard things. I try not to tell anybody about this for the third year of analysis. <laughs> and that is, the better they get, the more people are going to hate them. <laughs> See, the better you get, the more comfortable you will be with your exhibitionism. The more comfortable you will be with your joyful assertiveness, joyful sexuality. And all these passive aggressive people are going to hate you more. You'll just care less. <laughs> Eat your heart out. <laughs> you, you can't take a joke. That sort of thing. I mean, but but you see that that is related to this and this whole thing in there. Now, if you if you look at that, people a lot of people identify the satanic stuff, and here we get to Satanists. A lot of these people that are attracted to Satanism are people who really believe that the shining is under that aegis. Mm. That the only one that really wants them to shine is the Dark Lord. And that the High Lord, you know, like the Sky Father, come on, the Sky Father wouldn't want you to shine. Sky Father's going to look and wait until you stick your head up and then he's going to zap you. And so these people that have that kind of experience in families have gotten the idea that the only sponsor for their shining is the Dark Lord. And so they become partisans of the Dark Lord because they want to shine. And they want to have power, and they want to feel good about it, and they want to have sexuality, and they want to feel good about it. And so uh, they get into ritual practices around that, trying to get their shining up and out. Okay? In fact, there are a lot of people that's Aunt LaVey in the Church of Satan say, what are we up to? Oh, we're up to assertiveness training. Aunt LaVey will tell you that. What do, you, what do we do in our satanic rituals? What is assertiveness training? <laughs> And I think there probably are a lot of Satanists that think they're into a service train. And you can see how that might be, can't you? You think about it? Mm -hmm. Well, if this Christian God is, is the kind of God that Nietzsche thought he was, he sure wouldn't want you to be assertive. He wants you to be nice. <laughs> So if you want to get your shining and your assertiveness, if you want to be healthily prideful, then you have to be allegiance, cast your allegiance to the dark Vader. Okay. Now, let me just open it up and have you ask questions or comment and see if you followed the uh, drift the last a few weeks, and then we'll turn into looking at some issues about uh, the use of symbols in crisis experiences. But let me give you a chance to ask anything or comment before we go to ritual and dealing with these images and 
crisis times. Got about 30 minutes. Yeah. <clears throat> Uh, if I understand you correctly, are you saying then that uh, this archetypal evil or whatever it is is outside humanity? It's not human. Well, not when I'm speaking psychologically, I'm not talking metaphysics. I mean, you can argue this thing metaphysically. You can, you know, if I was doing metaphysics, I could do Thomistic metaphysics, and they clearly think they're Satan and the legions of angels that are outside your psyche that are attacking you. Or if I was doing neoclassical metaphysics on a whitehead, I could come up with a justifiable, rational, metaphysical reason to think there might be some opposition to the, to the God and the divine initiative of God. I wouldn't have any trouble doing that. But when I'm talking about psycholog psychologically, which is what I'm talking about here, that is, I'm saying that, that the thing is that there may be something in the psyche that is archetypal, not personal shadow, that cannot be integrated, that is a spirit complex, like the Christ complex, you know, that is a spirit complex, should not be integrated, and may be, and we'll get to this in a moment, may be so invoking of chaotic patterns, if you invoke those images, that they may further destabilize an already destabilized personality. That is to say, there may be archetypal images related to archetypal energies that are that do not belong in the human ego, that, as Jung would say, deserve to be in the deep unconscious, not in the human ego. According to Jung, spirit complexes are not to be integrated. They're to be kept a distance from, a la taboo, yes. Does that connect with what you had said before of, of, uh, about contact with the numinous was, was destructive? Well, contact with the numinous is essential. Getting too close to the numinous will destroy you. And that would be to say to try to integrate the numinous will kill you. It will kill you. It will kill you that your friend and the rest of us know. There will still be a body there. And, he, and it will talk. The body will talk. But it won't be the you that your family and friends know. And the, the, the way to think about it, so you need to study Rudolf Otto, that's Heiliger, the idea of the holy. You've got to study the, the, the old masters in the history of phenomenology of religion to get a sense about the power of the numinous. That's where Jung and these people got it. You have to understand that the numinous when you encounter it, overwhelms your capacity to disbelieve it. And it's like in the Star Wars series, I must have mentioned this to you before a million times, but in there where Han Solo and the uh, Millennium Falcon are flying in toward the Death Star, and they realize it isn't safe, and then he tries to gun it and peel off, and he can't, because it is on a tractor beam. And it, it is pulled into the Death Star. The numinous, the numinosity in the archetypal self has that kind of power. And when your ego is weak, if it gets too close to that, it will be like on a tractor beam. Yes. Uh, I think France addresses that same issue when she talks about just because there's this archetypal complex, say, of suicide that happens to through its ugly head, it doesn't mean that people have to identify it with and say, yeah, I'll go along with it. They can say no to it. Yes. Okay. Well, friends, she understands this stuff very well, and it's precise. There's, not, there's no one reason she does. She knows mythology, folklore. And, and if you go through her book, Shadow and Evil and Fairy Tales, she's got a handle on it. There is, there is something in these, in these things that, that want the ego to give over to them. And von Franz and Jung and a lot of these class groups say, don't give in to this being. The ego, the only proper stance of the ego toward the archetypal self is tension. Mm -hmm. yes. You don't ever just say, take me, I'm yours. <laughs> yeah. uh, so the uh, spirit complex and these numinous experiences don't uh, require any sort of religious belief. Not at all. Hey, you, you can be, in fact, it might help to be a nose atheist. 
You know, take a militant atheist, get him super fatigued and, and give him a little dope. <laughs> Better be give him a lot of dope. You know, and he's likely to have an encounter with a messianic king. And not only will he not be able to disbelieve the messianic king, he will be the messianic king. <laughs> and it has nothing whatsoever to do with belief. Belief, in fact, according to Jung, and he's right, belief in religion is a defense against it. If you believe in God, it will help you stay away from the members. <laughs> Isn't that what happened with, uh, with fundamentalist religions when people are overwhelmed by it and they, and they, they can't disbelieve it? They, they are totally sucked in by it and they're open there. It, it, it overwhelms them. Yeah, I see fundamentalist religion as a defense against the member because the system gets, gets some of the energy on it. The Bible gets this magical power and the five spiritual laws, you know, get this numinous power. And it is, you know, the Bible to a fundamentalist is not really, it, it, it carries enough of a, a numinous cast that they tell you they believe it's sacred. They believe this is sacred. And you better believe it's sacred. And, but notice the inflation here. It's defense against the kind of humility that comes when you really run up against this thing. Mm -hmm. If you run up against the numinous and you haven't been sucked into it, it makes you want to kneel and say, like uh, Thomas Aquinas did at the end of his life, toward the end of his life, you know. He had written all this stuff on theology and how many angels, and so forth and so on, the great angelic doctor. And then he had an experience of the numinous toward the end of his life. And he just stopped writing. He said, all that I've written is that straw. So he had an experience of the numinous that made him a lot less certain about the truth of his summa theologica. Mm -hmm. Talk about grandiosity, right? Right. Summa theologica. Right. Well, modern myth developing, of course, is the Kennedy family. Oh, and I just yes. listened to Joseph Kennedy's story, which fits that. He was uh, flying World War II, had finished all his missions, could come home. His parents were begging him to come home. But he had this feeling like he'd always done, he had done godlike activities and had been very routine in his missions. And, you know, nothing presented. But he stayed with it, and they gave him his last mission, which was to blow up a B-2 bunker. And he had to take, this, it's like he's being drawn in, he had to take his plane into the bunker filled with uh, explosives and parachute out because they couldn't get enough explosives in and, and make an escape. And he was just drawn into this. His plane exploded with him, but nothing was ever found of him again. And uh, he just had to fulfill the myth. Interesting. Well, Jack Kennedy, you see, was warned not to go riding around in a convertible with the top down in Dallas. Mm -hmm. And it was the Messianic king that had to do that. And, of course, one thing we know about the true Messianic king, always and everywhere, he's always sacrificed. Mm -hmm. You study kingship throughout all history, king is to be sacrificed. The true king sacrifices himself so that from his greatness there comes a world out of chaos. So you see that thing there? Well, you see, archetypally speaking, you can really see that. Actually, I've come to believe that the messianic king and the sacrifice of the messianic king is a wonderful image of... Uh, of what has to be in the human psyche for maturity to occur. You have to sacrifice the grandiosity. It has to be sacrificed. Because if the grandiosity is not sacrificed, there cannot be a world. And so the mature man and woman are people who have been able to sacrifice 
They're grandiosity. And that's easier said than done. I mean, you can try to sacrifice your grandiosity. And the problem is it keeps coming back. You know, you sacrifice two or three pieces of it today and you find five more tomorrow. Mm -hmm. But uh, that's, that's a really fruitful tack to take. And you see, you notice all this self-destructiveness in Messianic King type. They're always saying, like Gary Hart, uh, just put somebody on me and tell me. <laughs> <laughs> just, have them, just have them, you know, put a tail on me and see if I'm not straight. Yeah. Somebody else had their hand, yes. Yeah, in these four sessions we've been talking about evil manifesting itself as like acting out or manifesting itself with action. Is there any place in any of these uh, psychological schemes or even in mythology for the evil in action? Oh, certainly. Oh, yes. See, anything, see, in my view, it would be anything uh, which would serve death. And, of course, uh, there are many situations in which not acting enables uh, death to occur. It enables you. Think of the number of people that you probably know who have just sat and, and passive aggress their entire lives away. Just, just squandered their lives. For fear of shining, there we are back to the for fear of shining. What's going to happen if I shine? Well, I'm going to be attacked. Because the powers that be in the universe do not want me to appear. And if Lucifer felt that way to, toward the great king of the universe, no wonder he took off. <laughs> for all we know, you know, there may be something in those old myths about the tyrant the patriarch who wouldn't let the light bearer express himself or herself. I don't know. Yeah, Jen. I'm wondering about um, the fuel for uh, when we descend into archetypal patterns when we're taking over. Is it, uh, is it fair to say that uh, um, some form of grandiosity is always kind of our uh, our ego means of plunging into it. Is that uh, uh... let's put it this way? Uh, Get Edinger's book, Ego and Archetype, mm -hmm. and he lays this out, particularly in the first few chapters. When you're a child, you are one with this self, archetypal self. And then you have to get to where you can disidentify with it. But the problem is that in the course of disidentifying with it in the context of your family where they hate you so much for being wonderful, <laughs> you lose touch with it. You forget that you got it. Uh, except for those people that can see your golden shadow and think you're wonderful and you can't understand why they think you're wonderful. Damn, misguided people. Think I'm wonderful. Well, what do they see? I mean, they're really stupid. I mean, my best friends are really, thank God my best friends are stupid. <laughs> Can't see what I'm really like. But, uh, but, but then Edinger says the idea that, that as you develop, you try to reconnect with that sense of luminousness, luminosity. Yes. Did we hear you correctly to say that evil with anything passive or aggressive that will serve death? I say that, that, that in my personal view, a good way to talk about evil is necrophilia. There's sometimes when death is not a negative thing. That's I mean, right. Death is part of life, and death That's is, right. this is not always negative. That's right. But and there are many cases in which death would serve life. Mm -hmm. That is, if you are on machines, you're hooked up to machines, and you're in pain, and, and uh, the only reason that you're kept on the machines is to make somebody more money. Well, even so, death happens. Sure. Yes. Right. <laughs> sure. No matter what happens in life, you're going to die. So why is that evil? Yes, but you would never call that necrophilia. That's not done because of a love of death. Evil is a love of death. One would turn off the machines in those cases because one loves life, not because one loves death. At least that's the way it looks to me. Maybe wrong. Well. Necrophilia is that which hates 
happiness, highest beauty. Um, and you have to ask yourself, what is there in the psyche that hates beauty? Because there are a lot, if you look, if you just look at the attacks on beauty that occur, <clears throat> and ask them, what is it that hates it? Got any clues? What could there be in the psyche that hates beauty? Envy. Again, we keep coming back to envy, don't we? Uh, the hatred thing is very key. And you need, we don't study hate enough. We split off into love. We split off into wanting to talk about love. We don't study envy enough. And not enough people read Yulanov's book on Cinderella and her sisters. It's, it's, it's Anne Yulanov's Cinderella and her sisters. You all ought to read that because it's a, it's a wonderful study of envy and the ubiquity of it. We're all eaten up with it. And, uh, you know, as in the influence of Melanie Klein, I mean, Melanie Klein wondered if envy wasn't really in, innate, <clears throat> built in to the way that a child has to experience life. It's, it's you being a child, the dynamics of infancy are such that you're going to experience envy. And uh, so uh, they used to call Klein, a, the, the Freudians really didn't like her because she was so much of a union, they thought. Mm -hmm. so that's a woman's a union. She believes this stuff's innate. Um, so, you know, you really study this envy and hate. Study the dynamics of envy and hate. And this, this compulsive desire to destroy beauty. And uh, I think a lot of, uh, I think a lot of, uh, uh, of the phenomenon of rape needs to be looked at in this light. The, the uh, evil is always an abuse of power. In my view, always an abuse of power. It always uh, hates beautiful things, hates relationships, and um, uh, cannot stand other people's genius. You know, because if you get to where you can appreciate and feel gratitude, you're moving away from this thing. If you can feel gratitude and appreciate other people's creativity, you're moving away from this pole thing. <coughs> yeah. I wonder if we could, you know, a problem with using the word life because we're so used to breathing yeah, our yeah, lives. Yeah, yeah. If we could go to the concept of um, harmony, uh, ecology, organization, integration, yeah. in the sense of life being that smooth, Evolve the integration ecology of a, a systems rather than whether you're alive or dead. The Tao. See, the Tao is that which is, again, the emperor's order. The Tao is the emperor's right order. And it rules the emperor. And if there is a time to die, <clears throat> then that would be good. But it wouldn't be a uh, death by torture by people that were loving it. See. Uh, let me move now before I break to to uh, talk a little bit about just the, the, the union emphasis on image. Images are psychotropic. The reason mandalas are such a big thing is that Images influence the psyche. Human beings, prior to modernization, were very, very clear about how much the psyche is influenced by objects and shapes and various kinds of uh, designs. And so the thing that I think that I want to close with on this type of thing is is a suggestion that you think about the importance of images in states of crisis or transition states. It is in states, if you're not in a crisis and everything is fine and your ego is functioning well, you won't be all that sensitive to images. 
you lead more into words and you know ego orders the order of the ego if you start getting into a regression or a period of liminality you will become hypersensitive to imagery you become hypersensitive to music you become hypersensitive to all forms of imagery. Would that include increased dream activity too? Yes. She says, would that include increased dream activity? Probably if you're really regressed. If you if your dream activity stops, it probably means you're under a lot of stress. Mm -hmm. I mean if your if your consciousness of your dream activity stops, it probably means you're under a great deal of stress, but not enough for your defenses to fail. When you start having a series of nightmares, it means that uh, that uh, the image that the 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 unconscious is overwhelming what little defenses you've got left. You're being stressed by your unconscious then. Or but if you get good mares, what? If you get good mares, then the unconscious is trying to help you contain the chaos. And a lot of people, when they're in a chaotic place, if this is working, if they've got this kind of relationship with the unconscious, which is a very positive one, they'll get up, they'll get mandolin, or they'll get an image of being at the tree of life, which is by the fountain of life. And standing by the tree of life and the fountain of life will be the great king, or the great queen, who is welcoming you. All these images of the archetypal self. And that's a wonderful thing to if you have that kind of connection with the unconscious, I mean that's that's really positive. And you'll notice that you'll get these kinds of things, these images of wholeness, order and so forth, in a bad time. And if that if that is what happens to you, then you've got a pretty good ego self access going probably. Because it's compensating for you. It's helping you organize. But what I want to alert you to is what all ritual magicians understand. That is, whether you like it or not, images influence your psyche. I don't care, you know, whether you have the slightest understanding of ritual magic. If you get around images uh, that in your culture connote uh, order, there will be an influence on your psyche against chaotic patterns. <clears throat> if you get around images which in your culture connote chaos, then you will be ten there will be a tendency for that to invoke chaotic patterns in your in your experiencing. If you are regressed. If you're not regressed, it won't matter too much what images are around. But it's a very interesting thing. If you are regressed and your life is really going to hell, you want to be real alert to what images are around you. You want to be alert to what kind of music you listen to. You want to be alert to what kind of clothes you're wearing. Because it's a very interesting thing. Archetypal configurations tend to operate like magnets. They tend to draw into the pattern things which fit the pattern. So uh, it's just something that you need to start thinking about. That is, if you're in a particularly chaotic time, I think it's useful for you to do what a lot of people do, and that is, for example, draw mandalas. Paint them. Take them with you to the office. Mm -hmm. You know, or if you have some image images that that represent the self to you, archetypal self to you, then you uh, you take them and you place them where you can see them during the day. Now, why would you do that? Think. What were you going to say? Oh, this reminds me of this uh, car. Many people have probably seen it in Evanston, the station wagon with all the. Uh, Christ statues up in the front on the dashboard, just from one end to the other. Christ statues? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. and, and whatever. Mm -hmm. 
You can barely see over the edge. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Try me. Very short. Well, you know, it's one of the interesting things. Right before people decompensate into really, really uh, psychotic patterns, one of the things they'll often do is make attempts to get closer to images of order and redemption. Uh, for example, the man uh, uh, that uh, went over to the West Side School and tried to kill those children was trying to be baptized. He was making every possible effort to be baptized the day before he got the gun and started to kill the people, started, started out to kill them. Just look at that. He was trying to take refuge in some archetypal imagery of uh, sacrificing, you know, the kind that could sublimate this stuff. But it's very interesting. Unfortunately, the pastor that he was trying, this is this guy's name, remember Clemmy? The pastor that he, he was wanting to get to baptize him wasn't able to do it. And uh, uh, the issue is, very, it's a very simple one. Whatever you think about all these things, archetypal images of uh, evil and so forth are psychotropic. This is what worries me about the practice of Satanism. Would you please explain psychotropic? It means that if you look at them enough and meditate on them enough, they will have an impact on your psychological experience. Oh, that's the techniques of gurus and stuff. Oh, yes, yeah, it's, it's very widespread. If you know anything about meditation or practice of magic, witchcraft, that sort of thing, it, that is what magic is. Magic is, is active visualization techniques with imagery of various sorts and invocations around certain psychological contents and energies with regard to certain images. This is where advertising is such a master at this sort of thing. Advertising, the, the people in advertising are spending more money on archetypal uh, studies than the universities. <laughs> it's true. They have hired the most outstanding experts in uh, archetypal imagery and brought them to Wall Street. I mean, up to Madison Avenue. <clears throat> and I mean, there's a big article about this recently, but they're actually paying them very good salaries. They just tell them, okay, okay, help us use these images. But the point is, I mean, they can manipulate your uh, your uh, desires and so forth that way. But but the, the think about Satanism. If you if you're in a culture in which uh, 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 satanic images uh, are against established order, and if you're a borderline personality, anyway and having enormous trouble with your impulse control, uh, having an enormous battle with your rage and your aggression and your impulsivity, then, of course, you as a borderline are going to be enormously interested in archetypal imagery anyway because your repression barrier is not there. You do not have a repression barrier. And that means you live right close to the archetypal realm all the time. And if you have a lot of feelings of impotence, as all borderlines do, then, of course, you will want some kind of connection with power. And if you do not have any mature superego development whatsoever, and no borderline personality does, then you will have a desire for unlimited power and power over. And therefore, images which represent power without limits will be enormously attractive to you. And these images, if you play with them enough and use them enough and surround yourself with them enough, will overwhelm what little capacity to control impulses that you do, in fact, have. See what I mean? Sort of 
Let's think of a certain situation. Would this be like a, a young or teenage boy in Dungeons and Dragons and super yes, involvement? Very much. Like mm -hmm. Except Dungeons and Dragons is not satanic in its imagery. A lot of the imagery in Dungeons and Dragons is not satanic yeah. at all. But in Satanism, it's very explicit. The imagery is very explicit, and the goal is very explicit. It is power without limits. Uh, and there are so many borderlines in our culture today, we're mass producing them. And they already have a compulsive interest in archetypal images. And given the thing they have a difficulty with, which is any kind of impulse control at all, then they would have enormous interest in satanic images and satanic practices. And the, the, the problem with Satanism, and I've been trying to, we've got to help the police understand this stuff. I mean, the police are spooked around the country now about Satanism. <clears throat> they need to have some consultation on this. These people that they're dealing with are not, you know, horrible people. They're very damaged people who feel very impotent and who are not capable of resisting the attractiveness of this kind of business. And uh, uh, even, you know, the, the, the most healthy person, if you get in a bad space and you start regressing, you're going to be less capable of resisting the power of any kind of imagery on your psyche. I mean, that, that's just a fact. If you do not have much structure in your psyche, then you're going to be more susceptible to the archetypal self trying to get you, trying to get all of you. And if you, if that is the case, then you will be more susceptible both to the Christ complex and to any kind of the darker complexes. You see that? That's why if you're borderline, you're very likely to turn out to be Christ. See? But the, but the particular danger in the Satanism business is that all that stuff is supportive it's imagery, <clears throat> psychoactive imagery, which supports the unlimited acting out of the borderline. You follow me? In other words, there's nothing in satanic in images which could help the person try to consolidate their own superego. See, because the superego, by definition, in Satanism, is the work of the Bad, good God, who wants me not to have anything. See that? Yeah. Is there a, a counterpart to, to the interest in Satanism and an interest in, in Christ? And oh, yes, Christ? absolutely. What, what, what absolutely. The only, the only thing is, the, the, the imagery of Christ it's very, it is still dangerous to borderline. Is there this is why you have, see, with, with, with a borderline personality or somebody that's really regressed, They've got to really help them realize they're not Christ. I work with a lot of people a lot of the time who have very powerful religious experiences, and I try to, you know, look, let's remember, you're not Christ. You're not the true lamb. You do not have to sacrifice yourself. Uh, so it's really, the Christ stuff is dangerous. But think about the Christ. I mean, look at the Jung, Jung's thing. It, it has some, at least some sense of, of being something around which uh, organization can occur. You get organization around Christ. You get the disciple around Christ. You get the you get all these 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 people come around, gather around Pentecost. You know, you get this image of organization and there's organization around Christ. So at least there's some push towards some sort of order and some sort of love ethic in that. But on the other pole, there's no love ethic. There's no sacrifice ethic except other people. Well, what I meant by my question was... Um, is that dangerous? We have evidence. We yes. can see evidence of the interest in Satanism. Yes. What evidence is there of a similar parallel rise uh, in this kind of... Well, the thing, that, the thing that Foster was talking about, the, the, the rise of fundamentalisms around the world are... Look... Fundamentalisms are, are, are just on the move around the world. What used to be called mainline religion is no longer mainline. It's French. 
It is the militant fundamentalist types that are getting more into the main line now. Fuller Theological Seminary is educating a lot more mainline clergy now than the seminaries of their own areas. I mean, those mainline seminaries. And uh, there's a move more toward uh, sort of uncritical religion among the Muslims, among the uh, uh, Jews, among the Christians. It's just militant, see, but it's very similar. The only thing about it is, see, I mean, you, you, uh, and I would, I would argue that that kind of true believer zealot, zealotry is a sort of a satanic thing and that it's mega inflated. But at least there's some sort of order and principle built into it. A Shia Muslim may be dangerous to some people, but, you know, they're not dangerous to all people. Uh, whereas, uh, you know, you get somebody who is into uh, ritual sacrifice of human beings so that they can have a better drug deal. Uh, that's uh, that's very different, and so all I'm going to suggest to you now, we're going to take a break now and come back in about ten minutes. But uh, but the thing that you need to be thinking about, if the Jungians are right, that images and symbols are psychotropic or psychoactive and really do influence the psyche in directions related to the image, the association, cultural associations then there is a particular need to realize that in our culture today that very disorganized people will be very attracted to satanic imagery and satanic rock music. And it is not neutral that you've got a lot of kids listening to a lot of this satanic uh, heavy metal rock. Because if you've got a kid that is barely, barely holding themselves together and they're listening to a lot of uh, uh, lyrics that say "sacrifice your sister," you know, you know, uh, et cetera, et cetera, then that stuff has influence on kids, and it's directly related to the crack culture, which is, if you know what crack is, crack mainlines the grandiose self. It puts you, it puts you into the to the fullness of the grandiose self like that. How long does it take you to be addicted to crack? That's how long it takes to be addicted to crack. Bam! And you're addicted to crack. Why? Because once you've experienced being God, it's awfully hard to stop. Until die. Mm-hmm. Well, you'd rather die. See, anybody that has really been high in a real manicky phase, it's real depressing to come back. If you've ever really felt good, it's awfully hard to live when you come back. So, uh, so that's the thing I want to, you know, those of you that want to stick around for a little empirical work, stick around. But that's what I want to leave you with tonight, that what we need to work on is a very clear understanding that all imagery is not the same. All imagery does not order make in the psyche. And if you... If you just need a little excitement and want to do your little Ouija board Satanism and you're doing great in your life, well, I'm not worried about it. But if you're, if you're really having a problem getting your life together, it pays to stay away from images of chaos. And because the psyche is having to fight hard enough against chaos anyway, it needs to be surrounded with images of, of archetypal order. So, and uh, you can do a lot more with that. And uh, we can talk a little bit more later about some of these other things. Anything that enables you to form that ego self-axis denying the grandiosity is a forceful order. See, Satanism doesn't deny the grandiosity. It says, let's shoot it up. He is a very into mask, and it's not just for fun, although it is kind of fun. Um, this is Rawana from the Ramayana, who is the archetypal shadow in the Indonesian epic, handsome fellow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. yeah.
I know of an individual who got drugs and they make pornography with her, but they also paint a mask on her face mm -hmm. and doing it. And when you brought mm -hmm. that out, I started thinking of that. Oh, yeah, that's right. Well, you see, a mask in primitive cultures, what you do, you see, when we lost the mask, you lost the understanding of the archetypal psyche. Mm -hmm. You lost the sense that there's more to the human being than the little I, I, Robert. <clears throat> so what let's do, let's, uh, now don't drop him, he might retaliate. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Got that? <laughs> So we we'll let this start over here. Oh, I want you to hold this up to your face and look around at us. I want you to look around carefully at all of us. And I want you to say, yes, you can see that. I want you to say to us, the sentences, that you hear in your mind, that you hear in your mind, that you think might not really be your voice, but but might be coming from an archetypal chat. You know that too sure. Just just <laughs> things things that you say to yourself. You're not feeling good about yourself. Oh. Well if you're Freudian you can say anything that's a puny super ego in you said. You don't have to even be young. Just Give us your first one. Give us I want you to tell you to just take and look at all of us and look around and say to us those things which you hear from yourself. Just say, look at look around at us, turn around and look at all of us, and just say what you hear from your inside. <laughs> Concentrate, pay attention, make more of an effort, focus. I don't focus in that. Okay, next. Oh. <laughs> you look down now, you gotta let this man speak. Now look around at everybody. Rahwana is the name. Say what say what you hear from within. I'm a bad person. I want to shine. That's no while. I mustn't shine. Okay, now put that into you instead of I. Look around at us and say the same thing to change the I to you. Mm -hmm. I don't want to oh, you. Oh. you want to shine. And that's very evil. You mustn't shout. feel like I'm not doing something right or I'm not doing something that I should be doing to take care of situations that I have. Put it in you. Say you. You? You are not doing things that need to be done because you're too passive and you can sit around and let things take over and you don't do them or take care of them yourself. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> You're all dummies. <laughs> do them first before they do you. <laughs> all right. <laughs> you just never do enough. No matter how much you're doing, it is not enough. <laughs> do you think you're working? Ha ha. I see you, Loki. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Intoxicating when you can say what you do. Remember, this is something that you hear for you. Just change it and put it to us. You're a big weirdo going off to all those young courses. <laughs> Why can't you just be normal like other people? Why do you have to always look into things? That's great. You're the one. That damn novel you are writing is no darn good. <laughs> a waste of time. Why don't you do something more respectable and professional? <laughs> 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 You really shouldn't be looking into all that stuff. You'd be a lot better off just ignoring it and not knowing about it. <laughs> you really want to run away from it all. <coughs> and do your own thing. You really don't want to be responsible. Mm. Look at all them. They can't do it. <laughs> Go do it yourself. You know what you can do. Right? You know that. What are you doing? Get out there. You're afraid. You don't know how you're going to react. Your mom, kids, dad. You've always had a good family. Right? Go on. Go on, sir. Want to shake everything up? in the world again. We've been spending too much time at home. Time to get up. Get busy. What do you mean you're on inner journey? You are never allowed to anything. <laughs> to be able to look at the dark side of things. It's very frightening, but there's so much that you can see when you can look straight. monkey business about going to all these lectures and fooling around like this. Why don't you get your feet back on the ground? Be responsible. You should be paying more attention to your business. So there's this stuff where you go off into this uh, into this uh, psychology crap and all this. And on top of that, you're fat. 
Damn, what you doing? You're never gonna be thin enough. <laughs> never. So you might as well give up. <laughs> Have another Hershey bar. <laughs> You're so fucking lazy. <laughs> You're never gonna be good at your artwork, so why keep going at it? Do it or don't do it, it really doesn't make any difference. This is synchronicity, but I was going to say, you're all lazy. <laughs> <laughs> Money is the root of all evil. So why do you all like it so much? Why do you all spend so much time trying to get it and hold on to it? It's quite all right to be perfectly indifferent because in the long run, nothing matters anyway. <laughs> think you are that you have to know so much and learn so much. If people really found out, they find out you didn't know that much anyway. <laughs> That's about the biggest statement of all. <laughs> I felt Why is it in your life you're flying off into a million directions? You don't have any, you seem to have, seem to have no convictions about anything. There are too many things that are happening in your life that you can't explain. You've gone from Buddhism to Jung and think about any, any results. <laughs> <laughs> this is Now that you know about the dark side, <clears throat> which way are you going to go? And what are you going to do with it? You must blow the whistle on your boss. He's constantly manipulating everyone else in the office and criticizing them, even you. <laughs> Reminds me of Mayor Daly. <laughs> oh, you're afraid. Oh, you're afraid. You look at it, and it makes you afraid. <clears throat> no matter how many books you read, and no matter how many courses you go to, you're never really going to understand, and you're always going to be at best mediocre, and it's never going to seem magic enough. Mm -hmm. Might as well. <laughs> Evil's not a game. We've opened the door a little bit. Do you want to leave it open or close it? So when are you going to feel okay about yourself? <laughs> <laughs> Just keep trying. Just keep trying all the time. There's always some point in the future when you're going to get it together. Never know. You're really too busy. 
what you need to do is sit down in an armchair and just think. And sit and think. <laughs> You're trying to find out about shadow? I thought you were afraid of your shadow. Aren't you afraid of everything? <laughs> <clears throat> I want to develop more of my potential, but that would be egotistical. a quarter of a century old. Why don't you go to grad school so you can make some real money instead of working at the union? Maybe I should look at everybody. <laughs> oh, who do you think you are with all these ideas and things that you write about and that you read about? How about you? Yeah, about me. Yes, I'm not. <laughs> well, why don't you take on one more lecture? <laughs> <laughs> why don't you take on one more another then? You know the work is very important. <laughs> <laughs> See, you always say to you <clears throat> whatever you're most vulnerable about. I once went up, I, I, I got this thing out because when you do it just without a mask, it's really very terrifying. I started, I did this with a group of people, except I started speaking for this part, speaking what I'd heard, and it freaks the hell out of people when you don't have a mask. Mm -hmm. See, the mask enables a differentiation. So if I start saying, if I start talking to you about, why don't you commit suicide? <laughs> <laughs> if I do that, it's very scary to people. Okay because there's something to do with eyes and there's such a thing as hypnosis and scary you know it's very frightening but now if i do this there's something i'm going to talk a little bit for the great print okay. Okay. <laughs> you've got this you see humans have always known see if you got this then then you're forewarned right mm -hmm. that's awesome You know, you really ought to be thinking about committing suicide. It's really useless. You've really had long enough now to try to find the answers. Nobody really loves you. <laughs> you know, you had that relationship. And then you had that other relationship. <laughs> No, we're all just bitches. <laughs> and you know, I, you know, you can tell that you go around and you, you think about, see if you are a therapist or something. You, you, you listen to these things. You hear these things long enough, and you can. You put on this thing, and then you start you start coming on, and you you can take the toxic things, mm -hmm. and you can speak them with a mask, and uh, you can hear the toxicity so clearly, but you're protected against it because of the mask. This is what they used to do. You know, if you if you don't have a mask, this in which to, these things are talking to you, to then you really think it's you talking. See. 
But you ought to get you a mask. And when you're really feeling like shit, get your mask. <laughs> go into the mirror. Put the mask on. <laughs> and say those things which you're telling yourself. Yeah. You know, like, I love the one about that. Oh, I love that one. <laughs> but, yeah, well, they want her. Don't go to the gym today. <laughs> you know, you don't need to run today. <laughs> Exercise. What the hell is that? <laughs> you know that uh, it's just vanity. All this concern about your body, it's just vanity. You know, you're not so young anymore. I'll forget all this. Shit. <laughs> That's really true. Oh, yeah. Because I hear all these people say, you know, well, you know, going to the health club, that's really kind of narcissistic. <laughs> so I say, well, you know, going to the health club, that's really narcissistic. God, <laughs> uh, you know. <laughs> and you go on and on, we're out of time, but, but, uh, but uh, you ought to work with that a little bit, see. It's quite a sense of uh, black humor here. Well, the thing about it is, the, I mean, the, the, in the primitive world, they used to work this way all the time. This got to speak all the time in the context of ritual. It would be able to speak. It would be out here. And then, of course, <clears throat> we would be able to speak back. Mm -hmm. And you'd be able to answer. Mm -hmm. And you would be forewarned that there's something speaking very discouraging words to you and you would speak back to it you would say yeah right right uh, I really don't need to worry about the fact that I'm 15 pounds overweight <laughs> right you know that sort of thing are you right I know that all those all those goddamn therapists are just out to take your money <laughs> right right on Right, see, see, that's too much money. Or uh -huh. all, see, all of these religious communities, they're just full of hypocrites. They're really full of hypocrites, and they can't really help you. See, it's better for you to be alone. Mm -hmm. see, spend a lot more time alone. See, mm -hmm. and. Uh, if we had more time, I'll do a lot more of this. But uh, but you need to work on the mask thing because the mask will speak for that part of you that is speaking anyway. Mm -hmm. And then you can raise the question like the peoples of the world always have. Well, maybe that's not really me. Maybe that's Rawana talking. See. Can you use the picture of your mother in law? <laughs> Actually, you already are. <laughs> Thanks a lot. I hope That's that you fine. sleep well. <laughs> no, 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 you don't. That's fine. Okay. If you, if you want to stick around. <laughs> All right. Is it over now? Uh, I'm done. Oh, you're done. <laughs> but if you want, if you want to stick around and chat, I'll stick around. Uh -huh.